Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to see you all here and to see, to, 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 to know that a lot of people are attending uh, online this uh, uh, open session of the UFMD mm, through our, our platform or through the, the social, uh, social media. We have prepared a little opening today with uh, three uh, guests speakers who will open uh, this, uh, this session and which I uh, invite on the, on the stage. We have uh, Lajos Bognar, uh, the CEO of uh, Hungary and chairperson of the uh, commission, the president of the UFMD. We have uh, Jean-Luc Angot, representative of France and head of the French board of uh, inspector of veterinary public, and Stefan Zientara, who is the, the chair of the Standing Technical Committee of the uh, UFND. So, Laios, if you want to say a few words. Thank you, Fabrizio. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, uh, it's uh, my privilege and uh, great pleasure on behalf of the Executive Committee of the UFMD Commission, commission to welcome you here today. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us uh, to participate and share uh, with us on the occasion of uh, the open session on digitalization and uh, uh, innovation applied to the prevention and control of FMD and other fast diseases. That many of you uh, have willingly traveled long 
uh, distances and uh, uh, lots of us uh, online register to, the, uh, to this uh, event uh, serves as a reminder to all of us uh, just how important our work is. The FMD, UFMD Commission is committed to uh, actively support the preparedness and control of uh, foot and mouth disease and uh, fast diseases, emerging uh, diseases. Uh, we are committed to disseminate uh, uh, the recent uh, information, knowledge on these uh, <coughs> diseases to support, to help uh, uh, our work veterinarians uh, to fulfill our duties, responsibilities. Uh, this year our theme is the digitalization and innovation. Uh, we are honored to have numerous uh, specialists on this uh, field, on these topics. Uh, we must be sure that uh, these uh, new technologies not are not only uh, challenges, but uh, also significantly can raise our quality of our work, uh, of our uh, uh, work in relation with these uh, uh, diseases. Uh, prefer you prepare yourself to be challenged, excited, and inspired. And uh, before I hand over to uh, Jean-Luc, uh, I would like to thank uh, to all the AUFMD uh, team and the host country to for organizing uh, this event uh, uh, for us. Uh, on behalf of the UFMD Commission, I wish you all a very fruitful and successful uh, conference here. Thank you. Dear La Rose, dear Fabrizio, this, uh, dear uh, Stéphane, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, and uh, dear Hall, I would like uh, to start my uh, intervention by asking you to excuse the French uh, chief veterinary officer, uh, Emmanuel Souberan, who is detained by the sanitary crisis, uh, the avian flu. She finally could not join us, and I have the great honor to represent her. I know how she regrets this, especially because France is hosting this EUFMD open session in this beautiful city of uh, Marseille. I would like to acknowledge the activities of the EUFMD Commission, which provides by technical assistance to its members and the neighboring countries with a rich, diversified and continuously expanding offer. The expertise of EUFMD is recognized worldwide and the EUFMD is now also requested by veterinary authority in Asia, Oceania and America. France is proud to be a member of the EUFMD Executive Commission since 2009. It has held the presidency and the vice presidency until 2021. The evolution of the EUFMD is remarkable, especially in the field of training and the constitution of an efficient and dynamic networks in several languages, including French. Every year, France contributes to the EUFMD and strives to mobilize the best of its expertise, notably within the specific research and development committee. In this context, I would like to thank both the EUFMD and the STC, chaired by Stéphane Ziantara, for the involvement and determination. The topic of the open session innovation is crucial to fight against transboundary animal diseases. Is, uh, I also salute the commitment and expertise on the French National Sanitary Agency, ANSES. I, ANSES is one of the major players in international research in relation to public decision making in all the issues that concern us. I confirm in response uh, to, to the current worldwide sanitary crisis, that the EUFMD is an indispensable structure. Further, I want to highlight the foot and mouth disease is far from being a disease of the past. In addition to the emerging diseases that continue to capture our attention, especially since COVID-19 episode, and lead us to promote the one health approach, we observe the emergence and reemergence of diseases. To face sanitary danger, the principle according with prevention is better than cure is essential but requires a good coordination between all actors, public actors and private actors, as well as the implementation of effective prevention mechanisms based on training, surveillance, biosecurity and of course good governance. 
the AUFMD is contributing to the achievement of clear results on these areas. This is why the European Commission and also other donors have confidence in the UFMD in the fight against of the other transbordary animal diseases. France will continue to actively support the EUFMD and stress once again uh, the major importance of networks to react and interact rapidly in at all levels. To conclude, I wish you a good work and the topic of this open session is very promising and will provide answers to the challenges we are all facing. A lot of thanks to the OEFMD team managed by Fabrizio and, uh, and Nadia and a good week to all in Marseille and best wishes of fruit, fruit, fruitful work. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman of the Executive Committee of the UFMD, Mr. Representative of France uh, and the former President of the Executive Committee, um, dear colleagues of the Standing Technical Committee, dear colleagues of the Special Committees on Bar Risk Management and colleagues of the Special Committee for Surveillance and Applied Research, uh, dear colleagues, dear Fabrizio, Hilos, Jean-Luc, dear friends, uh, as you know, or probably you don't know, <laughs> I don't know if you know, the role of the Standing Technical Committee is to identify issues affecting foot and mouth and fast diseases management that need to be brought to the agenda of the Commission session and to the member nations to contribute to identify the scientific topics and select studies and tools useful for risk managers uh, and to oversight the plans and activities of the two special committees. Foot and mouth disease, which is the major focus of the EU FMD, and this is important for us, remains, as you know, a serious threat for Europe and is on the doorstep of the European Union. So the open session is a major event in the work program of the EU FMD. This event is really original because it is one of the only events to bring together health authorities, policymakers, and scientists. And we really think this is very important to have such event. Uh, today, we have more than uh, 740 people, in fact, 140, 150 present in the room, and more than 600 people online uh, to this event, which is really a great success. The UFMD has always emphasized the importance of global surveillance of FMD and fast disease virus intelligence to inform risk monitoring and preparedness. So I would like to take this opportunity this morning to warmly congratulate the entire EU FMD team. I will not name everybody because it will be too long and Fabrizio will me be very short, which has done a remarkable job in recent years, particularly during the COVID period. And I would like also to give a special thank to Dr. Fabrizio Rossio and Nadia also, uh, whose competence uh, and uh, availability are very uh, precious. So now I have the honor and pleasure on behalf of the Standing Technical Committee to wish you a very pleasant event and stay in uh, this uh, beautiful town of Marseille. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lajos, uh, Jean-Luc and, and Stefan for your, your kind words. And if I can also say a few words to, to, to this opening, as it was said, and as you all know, the theme of this uh, open session is digitalization and innovation applied to prevention and control of foot and mouth disease and similar transboundary animal diseases. And if, if I can mention one area where I think digitalization and, and innovation can support uh, us, this is bringing together uh, research, uh, researchers and, and, and policy makers uh, to provide evidence, good evidence of the good results of the applied research, discuss it and make it, and make it available uh, to the uh, decision makers and, 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 and risk managers. The first open session at the time was, was held in 1970 in Turkey, in, uh, in Ankara, and it was quite, quite a big meeting with, all, with a lot of laboratories and institutes around the globe uh, gathered uh, there in, uh, in Ankara. It was called the meeting of the research group of the Standing Technical Committee. And the 
topics, uh, the, the item discussed at that time were the evaluation of potency of, of vaccines, the duration of immunity in a sheep after vaccination, and the correlation of virus strains detected in Europe and, and Near East. So some of the topics related to eff effectiveness of, of vaccines and, and risks for, for, for different regions were, were really already uh, at the top priority of the, um, uh, of the discussion. So I really hope that in these three days we, we, have, we can reflect on what cultural shift, new technologies, innovative solution can uh, help us in understanding uh, and better uh, understanding how the, the best way to uh, control uh, fast diseases. Before opening, uh, officially opening and launching this, uh, this session, I would like uh, uh, to, uh, to, to acknowledge and to thank two, group of two, two groups of uh, people and um, two individuals. The first group is the UFMD team, the, the team of the Secretariat, uh, who has technically and logistically assisted in, in organizing this uh, um, open session, but you will have time to meet all of them during the session. The second group is the Standing Technical Committee, here represented by uh, Stefan, for the uh, great technical and scientific input provided uh, to the uh, Secretariat and to the, to the Commission along the, the, the past years. And the two individuals, uh, one is Keith Sumption, because I think that he really managed to change the work of the Secretariat and the Commission, with now a big team working in, in activities in Europe, in European neighborhood and at a global level su sustaining the FMD global control strategy. At last but not least, and this is what I really would like to emphasize today and to acknowledge uh, the, the work done, support received, technical and human support received by Martin Blake, the former chair of the, uh, of the commission who has assisted very much us in the, in the past years and, and particularly during, during COVID where all the activities uh, had to be re reshaped and, and reorganized. So for, uh, for, for Martin, who is following uh, us uh, uh, online because he couldn't, couldn't come, uh, we have uh, prepared a little uh, gift and uh, which says, uh, thank you Martin for keeping UFMD on the fast track. And I think that there is a, a Irish delegation who can, who can uh, uh, collect the, the, the little uh, acknowledgement and it is really to, to, to remind good memories that we had together. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the uh, opening words and I think that now we can open the, uh, the session, open the open session actually. <laughs> and uh, we... Um, Sorry, I'll just go with this a bit more room. We have uh, uh, decided to open each day of this uh, open session with a presentation on uh, fast diseases and a global uh, and regional situations of uh, fast diseases. And of course, the first day is dedicated to uh, foot and mouth disease. And uh, we have as a keynote speakers uh, Donald King, head of the vesicular disease reference laboratory uh, group and uh, who and leads uh, he leads the, the, the FAO World Reference Laboratory for Foot and Mouth Disease. Don has a background in uh, veterinary epi virology and uh, immunology and uh, research interest in understanding the processes that drive the evolution of uh, positive standard genome viruses such as foot and mouth disease. He will provide a presentation on the recent events from the global FMD surveillance activities. Don, the stage is yours. Thank you, Fabrizio. So I guess the microphone's working. So um, good morning, everyone, and, and good day to everyone who's joining online. Very pleased to be here um, in this three-dimensional space after two two-dimensional activities for the last two years. I think we have a lot of opportunities for some dis discussions over the next couple of days and some opportunities to catch up. So as Fabrizio says, I have a relatively short spot on the agenda here to provide an update 
regarding FMD, and I'm going to focus on some of the headline events that have occurred in the last two years. And I suppose just to perhaps touch on the comment made by Jean-Luc about uh, FMD being a disease of the past, I'm perhaps going to provide a little bit more flesh to that comment to provide some substance that, that FMD is, is indeed not disappeared and actually in the European neighborhood and countries that are intimately trading with European partners, there's a lot of FMD circulating. So just to, to start the presentation is to, of course, acknowledge colleagues within the WOA FAO Reference Laboratory Network for FMD. This is a network which has now been established since 2004, which brings together all of the key uh, FMD reference laboratories in, in the world. And you can see the locations of those laboratories here. And these are the laboratories that, of course, uh, are working on behalf of the FAO and, and WOA. And we also work in FMD endemic settings with a number of affiliate laboratories, particularly in East and West Africa, as well as in, in Asia, as well as to bring together this really important information regarding the circulation of the disease and, and ongoing risks and, and where the, uh, the disease is, is present. So I'm not going to say too much more about the network. I think I've presented the network to you previously. But just to say, of course, the network has also <coughs> maintained um, some form of communication after the last few years with, with the COVID restrictions in place. I'm very much hoping um, in the next month or so that we will bring together a, a, a meeting which will be held at Lelystad, which is uh, one of the new network partners. And that will be opportunity for us also to, to catch up in a face-to-face in a -face, as well as this sort of uh, virtual format as well. So thinking about the work of the network, um, this slide just tries to summarize uh, the samples that are received to network reference laboratories and where uh, testing is done in different parts of the world. And again, I just use this slide perhaps to remind you about the, the pool concept for FMD. And this is this idea that for FMD, you have certain viral ecosystems which maintain certain specific viral strains um, and in general, viruses stay quite um, geographically, within quite geographically constrained um, locations over long periods of time. I'll say something further on, later on in the talk, as you might expect about some of these longer distance movements of FMD. But I think we need to also remember that those are perhaps the, the headline bulletins when viruses move long distances. But, but of course, the, the maintenance of these resident strains is also very key and comprises probably the majority of the disease where it's circulating in endemic settings. So of course, use this slide just to say, um, of course, surveillance activities were curtailed and reduced during um, COVID-19. And, and you can see for yourself a dip in the samples that were tested, but not completely. Uh, so there were still some activities that were undertaken by uh, the reference laboratories during that period of time. You can see here the, the breakup of, of the, the surveillance activities for the different pools. And that helps us understand, uh, that information helps us understand which are the dominant lineages that are present in each of the, the viral pools. But of course, the, this sampling is inherently biased. And it's only sampling a very small proportion of, of uh, the entirety of the disease circulation. And we always need to be conscious that these biases may influence our interpretation of these responses or, or, or of these um, disease circulation. The other point to make, and I think this is a, an important point that has been raised previously, but I just again use this slide to highlight it. If you look at the pie charts at the bottom, this shows the distribution of the FMD serotypes that are detected from viruses recovered by the network. You can see from this analysis that serotype O, of course, is the most frequently detected virus serotype anywhere in the world. But I, I uh, sort of show you, show you also from these pie charts that almost a half of the samples received to the reference laboratory networks are samples of relatively poor quality that, from which we're unable either to recover any information at all regarding FMD or 
we're very much limited just to using the samples to detect the virus itself, and serotyping data is also not um, easily recoverable from those samples. And I think that also should be a big driving force for the research community that's represented here in the room, is to think about new approaches that could be used to increase the amount of serotypic data that's generated from these samples. And I'm very pleased that later on in the next few days we're going to hear further presentations about new advances that perhaps will contribute to that. So I'm going to um, initially just focus on this, this disease circulation and, and a strain that we know quite a lot about and has, has been circulating in Pool 3. And this is the ANT10 sublineage of serotype O within the Pan-Asia 2 lineage. And this is a viral lineage that has been circulating for, for many years um, and has, has, has in the past been spread quite widely across the Pool 3 countries. But what has happened in the, in the last 12 months or so is we've seen an increasing dominance of this lineage in comparison to the other serotype O uh, Pan-Asia 2 viral lineages that, that are, were previously present. And one of these lineages was the the COM15 lineage, which was previously found across a lot of countries in the Eastern Mediterranean, such as Israel. And that's been largely supplanted in the last 12 months by uh, a new variant within this ANT10 clade. And you can see that the genetic relationship of these new viruses here, they share a close relationship to viruses that have also been recovered from, from Pakistan, as well as countries in, in the UAE. And these events also, they seem to be a little bit different in that there's a lot of clinical cases of FMD and there's perhaps some concern that the vaccines that have been deployed into the countries previously are not providing um, the expected levels of protection. And here, of course, again, remind you that the work of the reference laboratories, particularly the work of the, the World Reference Laboratory, is undertaking vaccine matching data and you can see the vaccine matching data for, the, for this strain. And, and in response to this, there's, there's now ongoing studies in the field which are, are investigating whether or not um, vaccines uh, that might be used are actually providing the expected protection. And these studies are undertaken in, in Jordan and Israel. So that's a sort of a situation regarding viruses within an endemic pool. But, but as I said earlier, the, the events that raise perhaps the, the biggest headline events are these long-distance movements of FMD, which we've seen and been monitoring now uh, for many years. And I use this slide just to show you the endemic pools here, which are shown in the ovals, and the, the, the frequently um, uh, detected long-distance movements of, of FMD that have been detected over the last few years. And we have viruses particularly moving out of Pool 2 countries, such as India, uh, Nepal, and Bangladesh, going both in an east and a westerly direction of, of uh, at least two, two different serotypes in, in recent years, causing lots of outbreaks in, in new locations. We also see viruses moving in a northerly direction from, uh, uh, from Central Africa, from, from Western East Africa into, into North Africa, and again, that raises risks for, for, for Europe. And also quite recently, and I'll touch on this later on in the presentation, see viruses moving in a southerly direction into, into southern Africa. And the new events that I may briefly touch on today are these virus movements in, from Mongolia into Kazakhstan and Russia. Um, we also see, and again, many people will have seen this, the reports of FMD in Indonesia in the last few months. Um, and then I uh, just have a slide just to give you some information about the, the situation in Egypt, which is very unexpected, where new outbreaks seem to be, have been reported and published um, associated with viruses that have a South American origin. So let's say, talk about one of these viral lineages, which is, and perhaps thinking globally, this viral lineage, which we call the India 2001E lineage, is, is probably the most widely spread of the FMD lineages. And this is the situation in Southeast Asia. Just to highlight the, the extent to which this has now become a very dominant lineage over the last few years. And right across the region, you can see um, uh, that this is now of the serotype O viruses that are detected, India 2001E is by far the most frequently detected virus in Southeast Asia. And this is the viral lineage that has now caused further outbreaks, onward movements, due to onward movements in, in Indonesia. And some of the information regarding the Indonesian outbreaks is, is highlighted here on the slide. Uh, these are outbreaks that occurred in, in May this year. 
and reminding you, of course, that FMD was previously free without vaccination and maintained that status since 1990. So this is really a step back in, in our sort of global initiatives to try and control the disease. So the initial cases were located on, on two islands, on Sumatra and Java, but the virus has spread very quickly now to in, infect a, a number of the, the islands in the archipelago. And again, the World Reference Laboratory continues to provide support uh, to demonstrate that uh, a range of candidate vaccines that might be used to control do generate heterologous responses. Another viral lineage that we need to be aware of is, is this um, SA2018 lineage, which we talked about previously, and I think two years ago we'd started to see some early indications that this might become a, a problem lineage. And this is a viral lineage that and, uh, probably originated from, from India. Um, we had seen it cases due to it in, in, in Sri Lanka. And in the last uh, year or so, it it's appears to have spread into the UAE. And we actually have, with, with partnership with, with colleagues at ONSES, evidence that this has now also spread to uh, Oman, also in, in the Gulf states. And this is a viral lineage that is very different to India 2001E and also very different to Pan-Asia. So it's a completely different uh, flavor of, of serotype O within, of course, within this MASA topotype, but it's an emergence of a new lineage. We've also been looking at the vaccine matching data, which is at the moment reasonably encouraging. And I suppose the way that this viral lineage is spreading and also some of the other viral lineages have spread recently raises some questions about uh, why, why certain viral lineages are more successful than others. Just very briefly to say something about North Africa. Again, I've talked about this previously. Uh, virus is moving from, from uh, West Africa into countries into the Maghreb. And again, in the last 12 months, we've seen uh, the re-emergence of O East Africa 3 in Tunisia, as well as Algeria. And this, this appears to be a new introduction of the virus um, into North Africa. And also raises, of course, questions about increased connectivity into North African countries and the increased potential threat to countries, particularly those in, in Southern Europe. So it's um, also in Africa, the other viral lineage that we've been looking at very closely is this O East Africa 2 topotype. And this is a viral lineage that's moving now in a southerly direction. And just to remind you, countries in southern Africa uh, typically only have the SAT serotypes as their major circulating lineages. And this serotype O lineage has now been detected in central and southern Zambia, also detected in Namibia, in Malawi and Mozambique. So it's a viral lineage that seems to be moving its way relatively quickly into southern Africa and will raise some questions about whether or not the vaccines that are currently deployed in southern Africa, if this is a new serotype, uh, will be uh, protective. And as I said, um, I, th I think probably uh, in the last few months, the, the, the one event that's perhaps raised the biggest concern is, is the, uh, the new risks that are posed by these viruses that see appear to be introduced into Egypt from uh, South America. And these relate to two published reports, which are <coughs> excuse me, um, highlighted at the pot bottom of this slide, uh, which, which describe uh, viral sequences that have been recovered from FMD outbreaks in, in Egypt. And, and these, we've looked at them. When I first looked at the reports, I thought this doesn't look quite right, but we've worked with colleagues at Panaftosa in, in South America, and we confirmed that these sequences are indeed authentic and represent viruses from the serotype O and serotype A lineages that are present in South America. And so this is a quite a new event that we haven't seen previously. Previously, we would have considered South America as a sort of closed pool that didn't pose so much of a threat to, uh, to the European neighborhood. But, but these new events need to be um, carefully monitored. And, and if they, uh, obviously, if these viruses circulate more widely, may pose new threats for uh, viruses in the region, which need to be considered for vaccination. So just to sort of very quickly summarize these events again in a simple slide, and again reminding you that all I'm doing here is highlighting the, the epidemiologically significant events, not these endemic events which are occurring all the time. So we've talked about India 2001. 
we've talked about this um, uh, uh, MESA -E -E um, 2018 lineage, which appears to be spreading from pool two into pool three. Um, the situation in the eastern Mediterranean is ongoing. Um, the new outbreaks due to East Africa 3 in, in North Africa. The situation regarding East Africa 2 topotype in Southern Africa. And the situation in South Africa itself, I've not had time in this presentation to discuss. Uh, but there, again, you can see from the reports, they're also seeing continued outbreaks both due to SAT2 and SAT3. <coughs> and then also, excuse me, in the last few months, we've seen reports of uh, serotype SAT2 outbreaks in FMD3 without vaccination zones in Botswana, which also, again, will raise further concerns about um, FMD control in the region. And then, as I said, we have this new event relating to viruses coming into Egypt relating to serotype O and A. So I'm not going to say anything at all in the presentation. I can see my time is slowly coming to an end, is, is about FMD vaccines. But in the slide, I've given you some updates regarding uh, the vaccine matching work that is done within the, the World Reference Laboratory, but also to remind you that there's an, a large amount of work that's ongoing regarding FMD vaccines from endemic settings, where vaccines may be provided from a wide range of different suppliers. And here the basic message is, and, and many of you will have heard my presentations on this subject previously, the main uh, message is, is a lot of focus now on heterologous testing of, of vaccines using reference antigens that represent the viruses that are circulating in these regions. And so this is work that we are doing in partnership with AU Panvac in Ethiopia, but also other network partners are also heavily engaged in. So last couple of slides, just to remind you perhaps where you can find further information, use this opportunity to, to advertise our e-learning training course, which we will offer in partnership with EUFMD, um, which will start very shortly. If people are very interested in, in uh, joining this course, please feel free to register. This is a course that will be offered both in English and in French for the first time and represents a good starting point for laboratory uh, technical people who are working in the laboratory to get them uh, the first insights into the particular methods that are used for FMD diagnostics. And then, of course, if you uh, want further information, you can find out further information about the work we do on our, um, you know, on our website for the individual reports, as well as the quarterly reports, which we publish in partnership with EU FMD, as well as the annual reports of the, of the network. So uh, thank you for your, for your time, and if you have any burning questions, happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Always uh, nice to hear you, and to, to, to thanks for the update on the FMD um, situation. Uh, now we have a little time for perhaps a couple of questions. We have the possibility also to receive questions for those attending uh, uh, online, and uh, those questions that will be provided and not answered for the for, 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 for lack of time will be answered by the all the, the presenters uh, online. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the at the audience if uh, there are any uh, question. We have one here from Stefan. Is there anyone? Okay. So Dan, thank you very much for your very clear and nice presentation. I've got one question about the origin of the virus in Egypt because South America is a wide area. Do you have more information or what can you say? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, um, a really important question, understanding the risk pathways by which this, these novel viruses have been introduced into Egypt, which of course is potentially a, a, a risk for, for, for Europe is, is a high priority at the moment. Um, in the discussions that we've been having with, with colleagues at Panaftosa, they remind us that the, the only place in South America that is not FMD free or doesn't have an FMD endorsed control program, of course, is the country of Venezuela. And I, at the moment, most of the attention is being placed on, on Venezuela as a likely source of the virus. I think that there was another question on the back. Michael. Thank you, Don. Great presentation as always. A uh, question about Indonesia. I mean, they've been under pretty much constant infection pressure, pressure from the mainland for 30 years. So why has it blown up now? 
Yeah, I'm not sure that I can di directly answer that question. Um, if you look at, again, looking at those risk pathways by which the virus has, has been introduced into Indonesia, um, a lot of submission, s suspicion about movement of small ruminants um, as a likely vector for, for moving the virus from, um, from a neighboring country into Indonesia. If you look at the sequence data by itself, the sequence data certainly supports uh, Southeast Asia and as, as an origin, um, as, uh, as an origin of the virus that's come into Indonesia. It's not easily interpretable whether the virus has come from either Malaysia or Thailand. Those, of course, are the closest countries that would represent the highest risk. Um, and, and I think further work will need to be done, and we're working closely with colleagues at, at Pak Chong in, in Thailand to try to tidy up that phylogenetic tree to understand the likely origin of viruses and the way that viruses are moving. But it's an interesting question, why has this happened now? And, and why hasn't this happened over the last you know, 30 years that they've been FMD free? And I think it just represents again, you know, the, the risk and likelihood and, and, and you know, uh, it's a basically a rolling the dice game. You know, every year goes by, these low risk events are, are, are occurring and at some point uh, the disease will, um, yeah, we'll, we'll spread. Thank you. One last question here by Case. I don't. Uh, a question about the dominance of viruses. Eh? We, we know that similar stories for, let's say, COVID, eh? Omicron. Do we have any, like, could you think about indicators that, that could help us predict which lineages become dominant eh, in terms of replication efficiency, excretion, whatever? Yeah, I think it's a, I mean, it's a really important question and it has a, a, a lot of relevance, I think, to, to FMD. I think if you think about COVID, if I understand correctly, a lot of that um, uh, dominance has been ascribed to you know, receptor binding and, and, um, um, and escape from immunity. Um, so, and as particularly again with flu, that, those are often described as the things that drive one lineage dying out and a new lineage having an evolutionary advantage and a fitness which makes it much more easily spreadable, if that's a word. Um, but I know I'm not, it's not absolutely clear to me that that's at this, the same processes are occurring for FMD. You know, say for example, you look at India 2001 in Southeast Asia, those are viruses from within the same serotype. If you look at the, the heterologous teters and the vaccine matching data, we don't get any evidence that that viral lineage has a, an immune advantage over the circulating strains. And, and it perhaps leads, the only unanswered question is, is what you're asking is, are there any replication advantages? Are there any other advantages in the way the virus circulates in the host? And we're, we're just about to start a PhD project at Purbright to, to look at that question. And I'm not promising that we'll be able to necessarily answer that question in the next few years, but I, I think it's a question that we, we and others probably should start to look at with a little bit more detail. Don, thank you. Don, thank you very much for your presentation and for answering the, the questions. Thanks. And we will uh, start now the first session of the uh, open session, which is focused on uh, emergency preparedness and response. Uh, the chair of this session will be Stan Mort Mortensen, a member of the Standing Technical Committee, and he's also the head of the Animal Disease Control at the Danish Veterinary and Food Administration in Denmark. And he does research in veterinary epi epidemiology, animal uh, health economics, and disease control. Stan uh, will be assisted in the, in the, well, has been assisted in the preparation of this session by Tsiatko Alexandrov, uh, the, the manager of the Pillar 1 of the UFMD uh, work plan. Katie Gibson, the, who is uh, the emergency preparedness officer within UFMD. And uh, uh, Buda Ahmadi, uh, risk assessor and uh, um, experts in, in, in animal health uh, economics, uh, and all of, 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 of them are part of the UFMD team. And um, also, uh, Mattia Begovoeva and Etienne Chevan will assist in uh, the liaison with the uh, colleagues and, and, and participants that are attending uh, online this, uh, this session. 
Um, so I will uh, invite Stan and the uh, two moderators uh, on the stage and uh, wish you a good luck. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. Yes, and uh, Kathy and Buddha, they're ready. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon um, for those. Good evening for those in the world that are listening in different time zones. Um, and we're starting off with this session, Digital Transformation and how, what it can, uh, how it, how it can um, uh, be used to support emergency procedures and response and describe how new t technologies can exist, can assist more efficient information exchange and decision making in response to FMD and other transportary animal diseases. This is the aim of this session and, and, and I would like to acknowledge the EU FMD team, which in, in, in my world is so advanced using digital platforms already. But uh, of course we can learn more and I'm sure the EU, the EU FMD team is there with listening carefully. And uh, now we're ready to start and we will start off by a presentation by Caroline Dumbeck. And are you there? Good, come on stage, Caroline. And um, you're from the Alberta Health Services and um, are going to explain about the experiences on using virtual emergency operation sensors during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic response in Canada. And uh, I hope you are okay. I understand you're on, it's, it's night time in Canada, but you are here fresh and bright and uh, we are so <laughs> eager to listen to what you have to say. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning and welcome to the EU FMD open session. It's a great honor to be able to join you all here today. My name is Carolyn Dumbeck. I'm a special project lead for emergency disaster management within Alberta Health Services. AHS is a provincial level health authority in Canada. However, I'm here today as a member of the International Association of Emergency Managers and the Canadian Professional Development Committee. And as one of the co-authors of the Journal of Emergency Management peer-reviewed article, More Than Technology, Experiences of Emergency Operations Centers During the COVID-19 Pandemic Response in Canada. During the COVID-19 response, I worked for Alberta Health Services in their Emergency Operations Center in various roles, including Planning Section Chief, Liaison Officer, and a Project Manager for our Operations Public Health Branch. I'm excited to share with you our learnings as they relate to virtual emergency operations centers and digitalization and innovation. I'm looking forward to attending the other sessions throughout the week. Although I don't have a veterinarian background like many of the speakers here today, I do have a keen interest in the topics being discussed because my husband and I on the side also have a ranch where we raise and breed warm blood horses and beef cows. I want to introduce you to my co-authors, Sarah Delee, Alison Post, and Amy Romanas. I met these amazing ladies and co-authors through the IAEM Canada Professional Development Committee. This committee aims to promote professionalism, development, and learning opportunities for Canadian emergency managers. We are four professional women with a combined experience of 53 years in emergency management field across provincial, healthcare, military, and higher education sectors. All of us have experience working in fully or hybrid virtual emergency operation centers, and three out of the four of us worked in an emergency operation center during the COVID-19 response. During the session today, I'll be covering the following items. 
I'm going to review our research questions. Define emergency operation and virtual emergency operation centers. Present our key findings as they relate to our themes, technology, process, and people. And then hopefully be able to answer some of your follow-up questions and provide some contact details for further discussion. During the pandemic, we met as a committee via video conferencing to check in with each other. It was during one of these check-ins that Sarah posed the question to the rest of us, what were our experiences with emergency operations centers and how have the changes been occurring to ourselves as individuals as well as organizations as we work through the pandemic. Canada has a number of distinct geographical regions and the authors are fortunate enough to be able to live across these distinct areas of the country. This led us to seek a pan-Canadian approach to our research questions. The main research questions we're focused on were, what are EM practitioners' experiences of working in a virtual EOC during COVID-19 pandemic response? What are the benefits and challenges associated with virtual emergency operation use? And what lessons for virtual emergency operation centers can be used towards planning, preparedness, and operations uh, available for the COVID-19 response? The survey responses were categorized into three broad areas which we'll be discussing in further detail later, technology, process, and people. Before we move into our actual findings from our research, it is important to make sure that all of us here today have a common understanding of the terms Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, and Virtual Emergency Operations Center, or VOC. EOCs are a central location where intra and interagency organizations meet together in person to coordinate emergency response efforts. Sharing the same physical space assists with communication and situational awareness. Most EOCs in North America operate using an organizational structure called the Incident Command System. Virtual EOCs allow emergency response activities and efforts to exist outside of a physical space and in an online environment. Historically, virtual EOCs have occurred that have allowed for a hybrid type model where subject matter experts or individuals restricted by travel may be able to participate in an EOC coordination and response roles via teleconference. COVID-19, however, was one of the first ones that created a global response where organizations and businesses had to reconsider how they operate as a whole, many moving to a fully virtual model. Governments had to implement unprecedented measures to slow the spread of the virus and mitigate its impacts on society. This meant that non-essential businesses were closed and government organizations moved uh, where possible to work from home or hybrid working arrangements. Every EM professional was impacted by COVID-19, but their impacts were greatly dependent on their organization structure, pre-planning and family obligations. As an example, I went from working during normal business hours, five days a week on emergency management initiatives, to solely working in various coordination roles specific to COVID-19. At the beginning, I was working from home uh, many hours over normal working hours uh, and trying to balance having a husband as an emergency service worker running a ranch and raising two young boys who were unable to go to school during the peak of the pandemic. Luckily for me, my organization had been providing us training on a new incident management structure that was hosted on our SharePoint site prior to the pandemic. So we had recently rece received some training uh, and the kind of aim of, or reason behind this site was to allow for us to have a central repository 
and allow people who were unable to attend our EOC in person to be able to participate and gather information uh, even though there was that geographical challenge or inclement weather that prevented travel. Previously, these participants would join our EOC calls via teleconference, but one of the main challenges that we had is that they were unable to see uh, the full operational picture. And our SharePoint site uh, platform aimed to mitigate that challenge. Our transition to a fully virtual EOC was likely easier than some because of the recent training and developing processes in place. Working in a virtual EOC environment brought both organizational and personal benefit. Organizations were able to do their part in keeping their employees safe and reducing the spread of COVID-19. Organizations had the opportunity to champion and foster change and innovation. Although some struggled, many employees enjoyed the new work-life balance, increased productivity, flexibility, and no longer commuting, resulting in time and money savings. For me, I really enjoyed the flexibility to work in the comfort of my own home and the ability to care for my children where they were unable to go to school. There is a crossover between each of our main research themes that emerge. I have grouped them together, technology, process, and people, for the ease of the presentation. However, there are some items that may fit under more than one category. Originally, when we had sent out the surveys relating to virtual emergency operations centers, we were really thinking that we would get responses back that told us that somebody had found the solution, that they felt the answer was XYZ software. However, many respondents didn't support any particular product or software, but actually instead warned us that it should be something that is used daily and not just some fancy software that is deployed during incident response. The respondents also focused on the challenges that they had with lack of proper equipment and then inability to work remotely and access their programs and files. They also described issues with their connectivity and bandwidth at home, not being able to meet the business needs of their organization. Video conferencing and file sharing uses a significant amount of bandwidth. Another challenge presented was the lack of access to IT support when working from home. You're not able to walk down to your local IT uh, department or desk and ask for help. For me, after working from home 12 hours a day on a laptop for a number of weeks, I soon realized that I didn't have the proper equipment to work from home. I was missing that functional ergonomic workstation with a proper chair, computer monitors, keyboards, and a mouse. Virtual EOCs have never been deployed to the scale that we saw during the pandemic. Because of this, many organizations and businesses were not prepared to move into a virtual environment. Many respondents reported that they did not have access to the files or computer programs that they needed remotely. They had trouble collaborating and working with the team members outside of the office, as they had never been set up to work in a virtual environment. The lack of familiarity is likely related to the lack of supporting policies, procedures, and processes. The lack of familiarity and the need to learn on the fly created challenges relating to response and decision making. One of the biggest complaints relating to working in a virtual environment or participating in a virtual EOC setting was the lack of situational awareness. It was difficult to understand the full scope of the incident and actions and decisions being made. We found that individuals really missed the EOC environment that included maps, incident action plans, status boards, as well as the ability to have that informal conversation and awareness of what the other sections were working on. The SharePoint site that our organization used worked very well for situational awareness. We had what was called our ECC whiteboard and live situation feed. It was available on the online platform for all those assigned to the incident to be able to see and use.
Although some people thrived in a work from home setting, there are a number of respondents that struggled personally and emotionally with work life balance. We saw many respondents who were working way over their typical hours and days. Others mentioned that they found it really hard to concentrate on work when they were at home and sealing the long list of to do's piling up, like accumulating laundry and dishes. Many respondents also reported feelings of being alone and disconnected from their peers, missing out on the water cooler conversations and connections. The long, um, the long activation also added cumulative stress with the inability to use our normal coping mechanisms. Due to the COVID-19 restrictions, we were limited uh, for mechanisms like going to the gym, meeting up with your friends, Another challenge from working from home was many individuals did not have a dedicated workspace. They were doing computer work and calls off the side of their couch or dining room table. Personally, I was one of those. I did not have a dedicated workspace. I found myself working at my kitchen island. Once I learned that I'd been working from home for a long time, I decided to take the dive and purchase a real desk and find a dedicated space within my home. Near the end of the pandemic, our organization also made the switch to Microsoft Teams. It was during this switch that I started to turn on my camera when I was making phone calls, having my face and my coworkers face for that personal connection versus just staring at a blank screen during conversations. As we move forward out of the pandemic, we might must take into consideration that there is a large amount of learnings as they relate to technology, process, and people. While pre-planning for future virtual EOCs, there are some considerations I'd like you to think about. Technological needs and working from home in terms of equipment and software need to be determined in advance of your EOC activation. Look for software solutions that are familiar and used on a daily business basis. Be prepared for IT problems to occur and try your best to integrate IT supports into uh, your incident command structure. Even when the best equipment and software, there are going to be issues with staff using the technology if they're not given the proper processes, policy, training, and backup solution. A framework needs to be developed in advance of an activation so that staff become comfortable working in that virtual environment. Moving from a working in the office to a work from home setting can be a difficult adjustment. Not only do staff need the appropriate dedicated space, but they need creative solutions to help them uh, with a schedule and staying connected with their peers. Some ideas may include scheduling virtual coffee breaks, micro breaks throughout the day, and using video calls versus phone calls. Our research findings are lengthy and can be explored in further detail by reading our published article, but I wanna leave you with a couple key things to think about. Setting up a virtual EOC is definitely more than technology. Technology is only as useful as the process and people using it. Find out what your organizational business needs are don't just try to look for a cookie cutter product. You will be most successful if you use common tools that you're going to be utilizing daily. 24 seven IT help is preferably integrated into your ICS structure. VIOC functionality is not simply about moving existing tools online. Develop bandwidth, both technological and mental health. Look for tried and true solutions versus something that has all the bells and whistles. Staff training on technology, but also with processes and incident management system. Consider setting up more frequent operational meetings to ensure everybody has that situational awareness. And then support your staff. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. And uh, if you need some more details, I'd be happy to connect with you later. Uh, thank you so much uh, to EUFMD for inviting me to speak today at the conference. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks.
Thank you, Caroline. Um, time is running, so we need to move on. But thank you very much. And there will be plenty of opportunity for discussions during the break about this topic we all experienced. And you will also reply to the questions that we get in the digital forum, I know. Thank you. Thank you. And our next presentation is going to be, I understand, uh, online. And where it's a presentation by Dr. Dr. Uh, Stacy Hook from Queensland Government, uh, the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Biosecurity in Australia. And it's also uh, an, a presentation by Dr. Himura from Animal Health Australia. So, please. Let's see. Hi, everyone. My name is Yusuf. I'm from Animal Health Australia. And joining me today is Stacey from the Queensland Government Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. Together, we wanted to quickly speak to you about what Australia's biosecurity sector has been doing with respect to preparing for and responding to emergencies virtually. While our case studies don't specifically focus on FMD, we thought some of our experiences and themes to be transferable and relevant to this space. I'll be speaking to a national example before throwing over to Stacey for a state-based example. So let's get straight into it. So back in June 2021, we ran a national virtual exercise, Exercise Network, to a cohort of biosecurity emergency responders as part of our MBRT program. And that was to enhance their preparedness to respond in a virtual control centre, or VCC. While the exercise had a few objectives, a key one had been around identifying the needs, gaps and challenges in managing a response completely virtually. Coming out of the exercise were what I consider to be the two main themes. One, digital infrastructure, and two, people, including capability and support. So in terms of digital infrastructure, that's referring to the systems, processes and structures that provide us with access and the ability to work within the virtual environment. These need to be set up during peacetime in an intuitive, user-focused way and be streamlined as consistent as possible and complementary to the relevant system. This is because we can't afford to invest extensive time and effort setting this environment up and training users from scratch at the onset of a response. Sitting adjacent to the infrastructure is people. We're currently in a period with a spectrum of virtual capability from digital natives to digital adapters. And we need to account for this within preparedness and response. Similarly, we can't assume that each individual will have access to the same enablers and arrangements, and it's critical that we explore ways to foster an environment that supports physical, mental, and emotional well-being, as well as capability development. There was also this intersection that pointed to behavior change. Despite there being a lot of positives to conducting a response virtually, responding together in person for the most part is still the benchmark and preference. While the exercise was received positively by participants, many reflected on their doubt of how effective responding virtually would be prior to the exercise. I personally think that this need to shift people's thinking will be a key long-term priority. And while the exercise succeeded in meeting its objectives, we need to continue thinking deeply about how the operating environment has changed and is continuing to change, what we can be doing to achieve the best outcomes and how we can bring individuals along the journey. So with that, I will throw it over to Stacey for her case study. Thanks. So as we all know, traditionally we establish control centres to facilitate the coordination and management of a response, um, with the control centre being founded in a suitable location with access to necessary resources and technology um, to facilitate communication and the ability to maintain situational awareness between functions. However, thanks to the restrictions that we've faced during COVID, the use of a physical control centre has been challenged. Um, it's become obvious that there's a need to identify, develop and embed processes, governance and technology associated with operating in a virtual environment. So establishing a virtual control centre allows response agencies to draw on staff across the state um, and across the nation in emergency responses during pandemics. So this approach has also opened up the door to accessing staff who wouldn't normally be available to travel and assist um, due to family commitments and, and other personal reasons. Um, the avian influenza response in Victoria, exercise network that you just spoken about and a number of other recent responses and exercises 
have all identified learnings that have helped uh, inform the conceptualization of the virtual control center exercise series. The overall aim of the exercise series is to explore the opportunities and challenges um, of working in a virtual environment and also to develop and embed governance and processes to effectively manage a biosecurity response remotely. Um, the exercise objectives, uh, they were to build capability in the establishment and use of Microsoft Teams as a collaborative control centre tool, to define processes for maintaining the common operating picture and records management, to establish linkages with other internal response systems, but also to test critical dependencies, including access to systems by external parties, such as other states and territories across Australia. The exercise series consists of a six phase approach, which includes um, a double loop learning cycle, uh, whereby um, any identified lessons are actioned and tested to establish if the changes are working. So phase one was an MS Teams capability development program um, that was designed to you know, establish the base knowledge um, of, of our participants. Phase two is the development and delivery of exercise interlock and exercise connect. Phase three um, is the evaluation and implementation of the recommendations from those exercises. Then we move into phase four, which is the development and delivery of exercise unite part one and part two. And then phase five is the evaluation and implementation of the recommendations identified from those exercises. Phase six, uh, which basically is the marketing and socialization of the learnings and also to embed the protocols um, that have been developed. So we're halfway through the delivery of the series and our main learnings are that it's critical that responders have multiple screens in order to operate in a virtual control centre and to maintain that situational awareness. Don't assume um, that responders have a high level of ability in relation to using MS Teams, regardless of operating in that virtual environment since the beginning of COVID. And then the protocols, they're essential uh, in providing guidance and establishing a virtual control centre. So with these learnings in mind, we have um, had multiple opportunities to test the protocols in real time through responses and preparedness activities. And I'm happy to say that we've had great success with, uh, with the, the implementation of those protocols. Thank you. We'll take the chances. Are there any questions from the from the room for this presentation? And let's see if we have a connection to Australia for the reply. Yes, Kuhn, Mintins, you have a question. Thank you, Kuhn Mintins, UFMD. It's a very interesting new setting, of course, these virtual centers and the virtual approach. And we were forced into that because of the specific situation of COVID. But I would like to know whether these virtual, these, these, these presentations were most about how to organize these virtual centers and how to get the processes done. But I would like to know whether these virtual settings would be able to be as efficient as the true physical control centers. So is this going to be the new normal or should we just keep this as an exception? and try to get people together as much as possible again. Thank you. Well, very good question. Yes. And do we have a reply from Dr. Khimura or Dr. Hook in Australia? Yes, so we have. Yeah, we are testing our technicians now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that's good. Yep, you guys hear us now? Mm -hmm. Yep, perfect. Um, so in terms of, I guess, the question around whether this is the new normal, um, I suppose that sort of links back to that behaviour change. Um, I think there is a lot of appetite to um, explore this virtual space further, but through our experiences, or at least my own, uh, I think there's, 
a tendency or preference for people to still operate face to face. Um, it's for that interaction, it's for the common operating picture. Um, so I think moving forward, then it'll be a bit of a hybrid, I would imagine. I think there's an opportunity to utilize that virtual um, platform to pull in the expertise we might not have access to previously. Um, but you know, for the BAU responders, so to speak, uh, that do have a strong preference to work in that physical control center, uh, I think there's also opportunities to yeah, accommodate for that as well and try to find that middle ground. Uh, I might throw that to Stacey as well, given that she'd have a bit of a um, jurisdictional and response perspective. Thank you very much. And uh, now it's time to move on to the next presentation, which is a keynote by Dr. Nette Boglund, uh, who is going to uh, also, apart from talking about new technologies, introduce us to modeling. And welcome, Annette. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to, uh, to do this presentation. When I got this invitation, I was very honored and, and happy, of course, and accepted. And then somewhat later, I started thinking about what do they mean by this title? So what are new technologies? What does timely mean? And then, of course, the modeling and the support, support in contingency planning there, I felt more safe because this is an area that I have worked in for 20 years. So what I will do now is to sweep around the title and start with the modeling part, and then we will come back to the um, new technologies and timeliness. So some years ago, I attended a seminar, and I overheard someone saying that these results cannot really be trusted because they are from models. On the other hand, I think most of us on a daily basis or nearly would check the weather forecast, and we will to some degree trust the results. And in veterinary epidemiology, models are exactly like for weather forecast. So we build on experience and data from the past in an attempt to predict the future. I did a quick search on Scopus to, uh, to find out how the development in publications on foot disease and modeling have been over the years. And as you can see, uh, the increase started in the late 90s. At that time, we also had an outbreak of classical swine fever in the Netherlands. And then there was a steep increase, and we had outbreaks of foot and disease in UK since in 2001, and again in 2007. In the same period, in the late 90s, a typical computer would have 16 megabyte RAM, while on my laptop today, I have 8 gigabyte. So this is a 500 times increase in the computer capacity in the same period. And that really makes it much more efficient to use modeling and also to have quick results. So in the beginning, most of the publications were about uh, comparison of control strategies. But in the later uh, times, we have found out that results from models can be used in much more ways. In the beginning, also, the focus was very much on whether to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. In the next slides, uh, there will be some examples, especially from Denmark, because that's, that is where I work. I started working on uh, modeling of foot and mouth disease in 2009 in a four-year project. And even after, at that time, I spent most of my working hours on this single project. And even after, from time to time, we still do some model projects on foot and mouth. And this is just, it's not that it should be about me, it's just to say that modeling takes time. To build a model takes time. And during this process, you not only develop a model, but you also learn a, mod a lot about the system. So what are models? Well, models are simplification of the real world. So it's not the truth, but it's built in an attempt to try to understand the structures in your system. So this is a picture of Danish pig production sites, and the red lines indicate movements of pigs in 2020. When we use that in a model, we try to simplify, so we organize the data 
And what we used in the model is data organized like, for example, in a histogram as probabilities. So we put that in the model, and when we do that, the probability that we will have the red lines, as we saw them before, is close to zero. But we will have something that is as close to the real world as possible, or, or something that we can at least use for predicting the future or for answering questions uh, of the type, what if? So when we build models, I normally say we should, we should use a lot of data. And I categorize the data into four categories. So we have data on farms. We have data on contacts between farms. We have data on the disease, in this case, put a mouth. And then we have data related to the contingency. So the control methods that we want to use and the probability that people will behave as we want them to. Then we run the models for thousands of times and then we get outputs as distributions. So this is an example uh, where we compare data from, uh, oh, sorry, that was wrong. So we compare data from, oh, kind of a point. The gray bars are data from 2006 and the white bars are from 2018. And what you see on the x-axis is the different control strategies that we compared. What I would like you to notice is that there are very long whiskers in these plots, meaning that 25% of the epidemics that we simulate will be outside the, the box. So when we from time to time see an extreme epidemic, it doesn't mean that the model was wrong. We might just have an extreme epidemic as one of those in the whiskers. The result from this was that when we compared the data from 2006 and 2018, when the epidemic started in cattle herds, uh, in both situations, the depopulation strategy would be mo most efficient from an economic point, while if the epidemic started in pigs, sheep, or goats, the basic strategy would be as efficient as the depopulation strategy uh, in the 2018 data, while when we looked at the 2006 data, always the depopulation strategy would be economically more efficient. So the point is that from time to time we need to reassess the models because the structure and the data change over time. So it's not good enough that you have a model 20 years ago uh, and you still trust that. This is another example of how outputs uh, from models can be used. And this is an example from Marshik, and she will present later today. So for the detailed results, please uh, listen to her speak. But, but what I wanted to notice here is that we can also investigate what is driving the epidemic. So what you see here with the lines are different types of contacts uh, spreading the disease. And clearly you can see that animal movements are not driving this epidemic. Also, what we can investigate is the resources needed during an epidemic. So whether we will have bottlenecks in the system and where the bottlenecks are. We also looked into resources uh, in Denmark and there the outputs from the model was not really the core uh, of this project. It was just used to build on when we explored what was the resources needed and the equip equipment needed during an epidemic. And this was all, all done to be prepared for, for an epidemic in Denmark. Since then, we had other epidemics, uh, as some of you might know, that we have a large epidemic in mink uh, some years ago. And we might need to go back and, and redo these calculations again, as we have learned a lot from other epidemics, even though it's in other species. But what we concluded from here was that personal uh, resources would peak in the first week of the epidemic and also that the time needed to do surveillance visits was really crucial uh, in our system. Recently, we also used outputs from models uh, in another direction. So we, we have also a model of African swine fever and we used the results from there to, uh, to estimate lab capacity needed during an outbreak of African swine fever in Denmark. So what you see on the right-hand side is the results for full epidemic. 
And still, this is an epidemic with an estimated uh, median of three infected farms. Now, coming back to the new technologies. Uh, this is not my core area, but I will try. And, and one important thing, I think, is the horizon scanning. Uh, there are models built for that as well. I'm not an expert, but, but there are models out there that can be used for horizon scanning. And horizon scanning is a systematic way of looking out for what is out there, what is developing, and what to expect in the future. Also, I was involved in, in a consortium looking into generic risk assessment tools uh, because there are more and more of these tools around and we would like to compare them uh, even though these tools were very different. So we compared seven tools. Uh, they were quantitative, semi-quantitative and qualitative tools and they included different steps of the risk assessment uh, pathway for, for introduction of disease. Um, and even though the, the tools were very different, the conclusion was that the conclusions were similar on an example uh, on African swine fever introduction. In this uh, open session, there will also be a workshop on a generic risk assessment tool. And I'm looking forward to learn more about this tool because I know nothing about it. Other new technologies are things like artificial intelligence, big data, and machine learning. And these are uh, tools that are developed in, in other sciences, but can also be used in the veterinary epidemiology. And I think it's very important that we look out to other sciences to learn more about what is coming and what can be used in our area as well. When we do that, though, there is a risk also that some of these tools might not be efficient in our area, and therefore we will fail. But only by trying, we will find out which are good solutions. Also, I think it's extremely important that we learn to, to, uh, to get help from, from other sciences, such as mathematicians, uh, software engineers, data managers, because most of us were trained as vets, and then maybe we develop into uh, epidemiologists or decision makers, but we don't have the, the, the deep knowledge uh, that could be used uh, for including new technologies like, like these. Also, I would like to mention that automated data access and automated data management is very crucial. If we could uh, spend more efforts in these areas, we can build models that are much more up-to-date and can be used much quicker on a nearly real-time uh, scale. But it really takes efforts to, to have systems that can do automatically data access and management. So, the timeliness. Well, timeliness is definitely not building the bridges while we are crossing. Building a model's time, and as I mentioned, it took four years to build an FND model in Denmark. So, we need time to build models. It's not something that we can do overnight or during a crisis. Also, data quality is extremely important. If we don't have good data, if we don't manage our data correctly, if we don't understand our data, we will not have good models and good models outputs. So, conclusions. Models should be built in peacetime. We need automated data access and management that will be really helpful in our models. We need to collaborate with other sciences. Data quality is extremely important. I cannot uh, emphasize this enough. There will be failures and we must be um, confident to, to, to do these failures, and time, money, and manpower is needed. It's not something that you build in a day or a month. Thank you. We have time for one question for Annette Boblon. And uh, yeah. 
My name is Aldo Dek from the Netherlands. Uh, I have a question. In the Netherlands, we have uh, experienced an uh, avian influenza outbreak, and we killed six million chickens up to now, and one million chickens were killed because of preemptive culling. So one sixth of the, the total number, and that's based on models. And when I look at the people who are modeling and I ask them, how do you put hygiene in a model? Because when culling a farm and just dumping uh, infected carcasses just in open air into a container, I think then some of the, the, the control measures are probably uh, causing spread of the disease. How do you do that in, in Denmark? How do you, uh, the, the, the fact that you kill so many animals because of the model outputs, and there could be other inputs to reduce the, 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 the things. And how do you manage that, uh, the social economic impact in, in Denmark? Well, the social economic input, well, I, for the foot and mouth, the, the assumption was that, that uh, all carcasses would go to rendering capacity uh, and there would be enough rendering capacity to, to cope with, with the rendering. So that was not the bottleneck in the Danish system for foot and mouth outbreak. For avian influenza or other diseases, it might be different. It might be different for other countries. And, and the spread from, from, uh, from carcasses needs to be, of course, if you have them out open then, and you have airborne spread, then you need to include that in the model. Exactly how to do that, I'm not sure, but, but uh, I think that can be done. But, but it's, a, it's a fully different type of model. And, and we don't have an avian influenza model in the Denmark at the moment, but we are working on that. I hope that answers your question. I'm not, I know it's not specific, the answer you wanted, but we can discuss maybe later. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, we have time for another question. There's an, in the back, a hand. Okay, yes. Introduce yourself, hi, please. Hi, hi, hi Netta. Um, it's Mike Tildesley. We met about nearly 20 years ago, but um, <laughs> thanks for a really nice talk, and you've made some really great points about models that I absolutely agree with, um, and an element of caution as well, which I think is really important. Um, so, so my point, you, when you were showing your uncertainty in the model results, you made a really, really important point that obviously you can have an outbreak in reality that is very large, and actually it's the upper end of the predictions. Now, Obviously, it's something we struggle with when it comes to communicating model results to policy, that that can happen. Um, and we've experienced it quite recently, modelling during the COVID-19 pandemic, where we model extreme events as well as the average. Um, and sometimes policy and also the media almost deliberately misinterpret that and claim that the models are wrong. So I just wondered if you had any comment or thoughts on what we can do better as a scientific community to communicate that uncertainty in model outcomes because it really really is crucial that we make sure that this message gets across i fully agree i think risk communication is a full science of its own and it's really really difficult and really important and i think what happens when you have these extreme outbreaks or outbreaks that that are in the outer end of of your predictions the politicians will change the policy so that so often you hear well, it never turns out the way you predicted, but during, uh, we had the same situation in Denmark during the COVID-19 uh, modeling, that, that there would be predictions that would never uh, meet the real world because whenever uh, the epidemic would increase, then there would be new measurements to cope with that. So, so then you need to rerun your model all the time, and, and of course there was not always time for that. Yes, I thank you for that. That's an important discussion, and I, 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 I do agree that uh, COVID, uh, I don't know any other countries uh, during the epidemic that used uh, modeling uh, for, for uh, supporting government policy of what to do. Uh, that was done in Denmark. Do you know any other countries did the same? Yeah. Everyone, <laughs> everyone. So there was this community discussion about the validity of models in, in your countries, right? And uh, so, so I, I guess 
we got to see the effects of that. There is time for one last question. And we have a question here from Kuhn Mintins. Yeah, I mean, I'm a modeler myself, or I used to be one, I don't know. Uh, so, but I, I, and then it's the, the wildest dream of a modeler that the results of the model are used for predictions. Uh, and, and so, you mentioned weather forecast. They have models which, they have aggregate models, use five models at the same time, based on data from hundreds of years, and they still can't predict the weather for next week. <laughs> so, should we really have the, the guts to say, okay, we can use our model for predicting what's going to happen tomorrow in terms of disease control. So it's an open question, but I think we should be very careful with that. And, and I think what happened also now with COVID, and also, pre I mean, COVID was actually a bit of the first time where all modeling communities went on and started modeling the future of COVID and how it would be next week. But is it really the purpose of a model? This is my reflection on this. Thank you. That's a good question. One short comment yeah. to that. I think the, the best way of using model is to compare things, situations, control strategies to, to, to prepare for outbreaks rather than to use them during an outbreak. But I, I have no doubt that if we have an outbreak, we will be asked to run the models. You're right, Annette. Thank you very much. <laughs> and. Uh, now we will uh, move over to a panel discussion, which is going to be moderated by Kathy Gibson. Can I have? Okay, I've got sound. Okay, so in this session, we focused on response um, to emergencies in the virtual world, or preparing to respond, and introduced a discussion on using technology to assist with timely decision making. And we're going to expand on that topic in the next session after the panel discussion. But in the meantime, um, the topic for this panel discussion is how digital transformation can support emergency preparedness and response, and how new technologies can assist more efficient information exchange and timely decision making. So for the first panel, I'd like to introduce our panelists, Steen Mortensen, Annette, welcome back to the stage, Carolyn Dombeck, Graham Garner, and Graham hasn't spoken yet, but he'll speak in the next session. Graham is an Australian epidemiologist working with EUFMD, and he has been working with the Australian Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. Uh, we'll be speaking in the next session. And of course, online we have Yuta Himura. Um, I'll start the panel discussion with Yuta first, and then Carolyn. Um, Yuta, um, I can't see you, but I'll, I'll speak to you. Um, you mentioned that protocols and guidance are necessary to get responders set up and a virtual emergency control centre established. How do you make sure that your responders use the guidance that you provide? Yeah, um, can you guys, you guys have me there? I'm we can sure. hear you, yes, thank you. Yep, amazing. Um, so in terms, I guess, how to get the responders to use it. Um, I guess it's really about getting their skin in the game. Um, so as much as, you know, we can provide them with the necessary training and resources to uh, build that capability and get them to use the, and read those resources um, outside of a response, I think it's pretty critical to um, take the opportunity to exercise, so I guess practice using those um, resources and uh, protocols uh, in that functional context uh, and really allowing them to, I guess, experience the process and recognise the areas that actually work or don't work uh, and identify themselves, you know, this didn't work, was it because there was a gap in the protocols or was it because I didn't prioritise looking these resources that were provided previously and I suppose it comes back to um, nothing makes a, a situation more urgent than an emergency and um, apart, outside of an actual emergency um, using those exercise situations is a really great way to yeah, simulate that environment. 
Thank you. Um, and Carolyn, do you want to add anything to that one? Yeah, I think before we, you know, take a look at the actual policies and procedures is to really look at your business needs and requirements for that virtual emergency operations center and look at how it's going to impact your leadership, your staff, as well as your internal external stakeholders. And then as you're developing that policy, make sure that you're speaking to each of those audiences so that they really feel um, that they're connected with that policy. And I do definitely support that uh, uh, testing and exercising will be really key. And so what, in your opinion, what systems need to be developed or improved to enable effective information exchange during um, a response in a virtual environment? Particularly the shared situational awareness. How do you how do you get that information exchange happening when people are behind cameras or have their cameras off? And yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think first we need to look at our existing tools and and processes that we have within your organization, and see if there's something you can do to modify or update those systems so that you can meet that uh, requirement for that situational awareness. It's really easy to um, look online and look up all of these emergency operation tools and, and, and products that are available, but often um, they're very expensive and they may not actually meet your business needs. So look first at your internal resources and then see if you can develop something from there. Okay, um, the next question is for Annette and Graham, and Annette, you brought this up already. We hear a lot about epidemiological models being used to contribute to contingency planning, to evaluate control measures um, in, the in the preparedness phase and in between outbreaks. And real-time modelling is sometimes requested to assist decision-making during a response. Historically, it hasn't always been reliable, but it, there'll always be a demand what progress has been made um, in real-time modelling to assist decision-making? Do we have a microphone What's for Graham? Oh, yeah, we've got yeah. Do you want to go uh, first? No, no, please. I think um, those of us who have been involved in modelling over many years recognised the limitations of modelling, and you've heard about a number of those this morning, including the quality of data underlying assumptions. By definition, we build models based on what's happened in the past and therefore, by definition, we assume that things will continue the same in the future. So we're all aware of that and hence we tend to favour the use of models um, in a more supporting role in peacetime. However, the reality is and the expectation is that we have sophisticated modelling tools which should be used to support decision making. And I think certainly the experience in our country, Australia, during the COVID-19 outbreak when we had experts and modellers on the news every night saying what would happen, <coughs> there is an expectation now that models are available and will be used. And I think that comes from both government uh, decision makers, it comes from industry and it comes from the general community. So for us, it means how do we use models responsibly to support decision making? And I think we need to move away from the concept of predicting the future and focus on understanding how things might evolve and what are the strategies we are implementing working effectively um, and what point do we start to need to think about changing approaches um, and maybe moving to, to different, different strategies. So I think there's a real role there. There are certainly a lot of challenges as well. While we have the capacity um, to build very sophisticated disease models now. Um, the reality is they do take time and resources and that's something which will certainly time will be in so short supply in an outbreak. So I think the need is for a range of modelling tools from very simple tools which can be fired up very quickly to provide some very quick responses to support the political need um, while we adapt our models to the current disease situation. So we need adaptability and we need flexibility in our models so that they can um, pick up and incorporate real data in a real outbreak situation. And we need to be do that, to do that quickly if we're going to support decision making in real time. Well, and as with Anita, I think we need to define what we mean by real time. Is it 
day by day, is it the next couple of weeks, is it the next couple of months? So hopefully that provides some response. Annette? Uh, I fully agree. Uh, the only thing I can add is that we also need to realise that when we use real-time data, whenever we set up new restrictions, whenever we, we do movement restrictions or something else, the system that we know will break down. So we will need to predict uh, what will happen then. Thank you. Have we um, got any questions from the room and then we'll go online? Any questions for our panel from the room? Yes, we have one. Can't see with the lights. Yeah, uh, Aldo mentioned it already. Uh, uh, all the countries have modelled uh, the situation during the COVID uh, crisis, uh, also in the Netherlands. And there was always a lot of uh, discussion about the reliability of models. What, what did we actually learn uh, in terms of what sort of parameters uh, are, uh, let's say, the most important to make models as reliable as possible when you would like to use them real time? For who was the question? Annette? Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what we learned the most is that uh, data access is, uh, is limited and really something that, that was, at least in Denmark, struggle. they were struggling with, with the data access and how they could combine data, how they could use them. Uh, so, so and, and that could be approved a lot uh, in peacetime so that we will be ready for the next time. If there's no other, if there's no other questions from the room or online, um, another one for Carol and Anuta. How do you feel the engagement of stakeholders has been affected by the use of virtual technology in responses, in use of an um, emergency operations centre, so including those directly affected by the emergency as well as people contributing to the response. How's that engagement been affected? We have sound, please, for Carolyn. For our organisation, uh, we work with stakeholders on a regular basis. Uh, health is really one component of an emergency response. So we're quite uh, frequently connected with them. Uh, when it came to the virtual emergency operations centers and trying to work with our stakeholders in that environment, uh, to be honest, the biggest struggle is organizational firewalls and allowing those or, uh, stakeholders to join into your group. So when we had you know, a Microsoft Teams uh, meeting those people would be able to call in, but then they couldn't see the screen that you were sharing or the chats that were going on. So there is some uh, things that we had to do and we realized that Zoom for stakeholder meetings for us worked better. Uh, so it is definitely a challenge, but they are used to kind of being that uh, hybrid type uh, individual that call in versus being in person. Thank you. And Yuta, do you have anything to add to that one? No, I think, um, yeah, that's probably a similar experience to ourselves as well in terms of um, as we have more or increased frequency of um, these responses, we're having to pull in uh, staff from other agencies um, and in those instances, you know, bringing them into a response environment, um, so the virtual control centre, uh, yeah, that's definitely been a challenge and something to iron out. And it's one of the elements, I suppose, um, the exercise that Stacey has been leading in Queensland uh, has been really exploring, um, trying to see what, how we can bring them in and um, the barriers to that. Um, yeah, so I guess that, that's the sum of it in terms of bringing the collaborative agencies in. Um, but more broadly speaking, I think Carolyn had touched on it in her presentation, but um, yeah, the obvious benefit being we have better reach, whether that be um, in subject matter experts or through um, different means of social media um, and developing uh, fit for purpose communication collateral, for example. Uh, so there's been yeah, definitely those um, benefits as well.
Thank you. Well, if there's no more questions from the room, we might um, wrap up our panel. Um, so in this session, we saw that animal health incidents continued through the COVID-19 pandemic, forcing way, changes the ways that we respond to animal health incidents. Um, we learned a little bit about the challenges of managing virtual responses and what improvements have been made and are still to be made in managing responses in this way. And we learned how current technology can assist with response coordination and decision making while further improvements are probably needed. We also discovered that while we've all been working online for two years, we're still finding it challenging to engage with the technology. And we've heard that maybe we need to have a change in the approach that we use for modelling um, in order to respond to expectations, particularly from our politicians and, and stakeholders in the real world that expect real-time information, even as the situation is unfolding. And after the break, we are going to have some more sessioning, sessions on um, modelling, so don't feel that if you haven't answered, had your question answered yet, you don't have a chance. There's a number of speakers talking to us again about emergency preparedness and response and the use of models after the coffee break. So um, just before we go to the break, may I draw your attention to the posters at the back of the room? Um, I'm not quite sure where you... Um, where the coffee break is going to be, but the posters at the back of the room are part of the display of posters that we'll have for the whole week, and there'll be a continuous display of uh, a rotation of posters. Remember, you can vote um, for your favourite poster by using the app. Um, you've all probably downloaded the app when you registered, so feel free to vote for your favourite poster or posters. And now we have a 30-minute coffee break, and we need to be back at 20 past, is that correct? At 20 past 11, and the coffee break is, is it back on the balcony where we were last night? So back down the hallway there and there'll be people directing traffic. So please thank our panelists for, and speakers. And we'll see you back in 30 minutes. Hello, nice to meet you.
round and we are ready to uh, commence the second part of this session. And please uh, come inside. We've got a lot of uh, interesting studies to follow. And uh, yeah, I hope you've got some coffee and a little cake or something. And um, we're about ready to start. People can sneak in the, in the back, but uh, I think we will uh, move on already now. And uh, welcome, Tatiana Marsik from the University of Vienna, the University of Veterinary Medicine in Vienna from Austria. And uh, um, Tatiana did studies, modeling studies on uh, emergency vaccination for the Austrian situation, and that's what you're going to be talking about. Go ahead. Thank you, Tatiana. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to present my recent work today. In my talk, I'll be giving you an overview of emergency vaccination as a possible measure to control a potential FMD outbreak in Austria. To start with, I would like to introduce you to the structure of FMD susceptible population in Austria. We have about 100,000 livestock herds, more than 5 million susceptible animals, more than half of which are pigs. The livestock density is very heterogeneous throughout the country. Most of the high density livestock regions and large herds are situated in the north, whereas the west is characterized by low density livestock regions, smaller herds and numerous mountain pastures. In our work, we took advantage of these opposing characteristics to compare the dynamics and impact of FMD under these differing circumstances. The simulations were conducted using the special stochastic simulation model EU-FMDs, incorporating all relevant livestock herds in Austria. The dynamics of the disease spread were evaluated in both regions, whereas in each region, three different vaccination to retain strategies were applied in addition to the stamping out policy. These strategies were, firstly, emergency vaccination of all susceptible livestock herds within a radius of three kilometers. Secondly, vaccination of all cattle herds within the same radius. And thirdly, vaccination of all large commercial cattle herds. The disease was initiated in both regions in a randomly selected large commercial dairy cattle herd, and it was assumed that the disease was not detected until day 21. This led, prior to the detection, to 33 infected herds in the region north and 13 infected herds in the region west. To identify the circumstances in which emergency vaccination would be useful in Austria, we, uh, uh, we evaluated the impact and um, consequences of sufficient and limited human resource level in both regions. We identified surveillance as an activity which has a crucial impact on the outbreak size and cleaning and disinfection as an operational activity which um, can influence the length of the outbreak control. Here you can see the resourcing approach within the EU FMDs model, which takes into account that the number of operational teams available for operational activities uh, can influence or influence the efficiency of the outbreak control. The model also assumes that uh, the number of teams available for operational activities increases during the control phase of the outbreak. The displayed sufficient or high resource level refers to an ambitious but still realistic level of resources in Austria. Here is an overview of the simulation results for both regions and resource levels. The results for the region north, stamping out policy and low resource level showed uh, a clearly larger outbreak with approximately 100 infected farms, more than 7,000 cult animals, 
and a control duration of approximately 13 weeks. The outbreak would result in approximately 600 million euros of total losses. All alternative control strategies resulted in fewer infected farms, whereas uh, the vaccination of all susceptible livestock animals okay. um, whereas the vaccination of all susceptible livestock animals um, achieved the highest decrease, 13%. Targeted vaccination control strategies uh, were shown um, to, to contribute to the epidemiological impact as effectively as mass vaccination, which is of utmost importance because um, targeted vaccination strategies um, can reduce the number of animal scalp. In contrast to the beneficial epidemiological results, implementing uh, vaccination control strategies increases the export losses as a result of prolonged export bans. The stamping out policy was also run under the assumption of high resource level and we found that uh, the reduction of the scale of the outbreak both epidemiologically and economically was even higher than uh, when implementing additional control measures. The results for the region north uh, show um, that uh, the magnitude of the, outbreak, of the outbreak would most likely be relatively small and of short duration, and the measures under the stamping out policy would be sufficient to bring the outbreak under control. The stamping out policy scenario in this region resulted in an outbreak of approximately uh, 20 infected farms, more than 1,000 cult animals, and a um, um, control duration of about eight weeks. Additional control measures, as well as increasing the capacity of human resources, didn't have an impact on the efficiency of the outbreak control in this region. As already stated, the results showed that increasing the number of operational activity teams under the stamping out policy can have an epidem epidemiological impact comparable to that of emergency vaccination. In addition, stamping out policy doesn't trigger prolonged export bans as it is the case with emergency vaccination. Our analysis has shown that expanding the capacity of surveillance teams by approximately um, 70 teams, i.e. 140 people, would reduce, uh, would incur additional 6.5 million euro, but would enable um, an extra 1,500 surveillance visits and thus reduce the, the, size, the size of the outbreak considerably. In parallel, um, an additional 10 teams for cleaning and disinfection would reduce the length of the outbreak by approximately two weeks, thus saving unnecessary further costs resulting from the export mass. To sum up, Based on the simulation results, resources and efforts during an FMD outbreak in Austria should first and foremost be placed on the stamping out policy. Additional investment in resources under this policy uh, can achieve epidemiological impact comparable to that of emergency vaccination. However, emergency vaccination should be considered as a useful option if there are indicators that predict large epidemics, such as a high number of infected farms at the beginning of the control phase. In such cases, targeted vaccination control strategies, which reduces the number of animals vaccinated, were shown to control the outbreak as effectively as mass vaccination. However, due to the current export band regulations, um, emergency activation vaccination would most likely be not effective. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. I would like to thank the Austrian health authorities for cooperating on this project, EUFMD for their kind support and for conducting the vaccination workshop for which these results were collected. And also thank you to you for your attention. And if anyone has any questions, I would be delighted to try to answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and uh, thank you very much and let's see if there are any questions or maybe you can make an address to
to uh, the online audience, Buda Amadi. I think we don't have uh, any questions from uh, colleagues uh, or attending online. Uh, I was told we have more than 320 people uh, watching us uh, live. Mm -hmm. So this is really great. I would like to encourage all colleagues who are online, uh, please uh, don't hesitate and uh, post us your questions and we, we assure you, uh, you will be heard and your questions will be, will be read out here. Thank you so much. So I give you uh, back the floor to ask. Thank uh, you questions from the audience. Okay, one short question from the room. Again? Yes, hi. V thank you very much for the presentation. Quick question. Um, what is the assumption or the assumed time to immunity after vaccination that you put in the model? When do animals become immune? The assumption is, I think, about five to six days. We're within the first week and uh, we started the vaccination on the day 10 of the control phase. Okay, thank you very much. Short answer, short question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'll move on to the next speaker, who's also from Austria, but actually working at the University of Copenhagen. This is Beate Conradi, who is going to speak to us about the simulation of foot and mouse disease spread and mitigation measures in the Danish situation. Welcome, Beate. Yes, thank you, Steen, for the kind introduction. I assume some of you are national disease managers, and you are faced with several logistical, economic, and social challenges when responding to outbreaks of highly contagious viral diseases like FMD. This includes which mitigation measures have to be implemented in, in face of uh, special temporal heterogeneities of outbreaks or available resources to manage an outbreak. But you have also to consider in your decision regarding of implementation of specific mitigation measures different applied trade recovery periods for your country. But this is not at all. This complexity is compounded by environmental heterogeneity, such as different livestock densities per region or per species, different frequency of livestock movements, different farm practices, for example, regarding biosecurity, etc., etc. As we heard before in the presentation by Annette, disease spread models can unpack this complexity and set up a contingency plan for veterinary authorities. As Denmark has a large export-focused uh, industry with more than 21 million euro per day and had the last outbreak 14 years ago, we use special temporal simulation modeling in order to compare the epidemiological and economic effectiveness of a set of different mitigation measures in order to be prepared for a potential outbreak uh, in Denmark. In detail, we selected uh, randomly 1,000 herds per species across each production system in each of these four regions, North Denmark, Central Denmark, South Denmark, and Sealand and introduce the FMD virus and start the epidemic in these herds. I will call this scenario A. Additionally, we selected 1,000 herds per species in entire Denmark, but just for one specific production type per species in order to figure out whether and how the epidemiological and economic consequences might differ depending on the chosen index herd. I will call this scenario B. With different production types, I mean these 19 different herd types, which range from different cattle herds to pig herds to livestock herds without any outgoing movements to other farms. A characteristic for Denmark is, compared to other countries like UK, that we have mostly livestock movements between farms within the same 
species, shown here with the squares. In the model, we included an external biosecurity weighting based on recorded data in the pig industry, it calls SPF system, but we also performed a survey in the livestock Danish industry. Because we assume farmers with a high external biosecurity standard will have a lower risk to become affected through local spread and the indirect contacts. For these both scenarios, A and B, with where the epidemic was initiated, we simulated 14 different control strategies, ranged from uh, enlargement of zones, uh, or preemptive culling of dangerous contacts, or protective or suppressive vaccination in a specific radius of a specific species, on top of the basic mitigation measures. But we assume that the veterinary authorities would uh, only implement additional specific mitigation measures in specific situations, for example, we will start uh, vaccination when we have 15 um, number of infected herds per day, or 18 pending culling of herds, where we can see we can't manage anymore the outbreak. Yet uh, these spread models often stopped if all potential infected herds have been detected and the outbreak has been controlled. But from a disease manager perspective, additional work is required in order to demonstrate the absence of the virus circulation in the population. Therefore, we included uh, post-outbreak management activities in the model. This means clinical inspection and serological testing in previous infected or vaccinated areas. And we calculated also the associated costs. In order to determine the total economic losses, the total economic losses cover direct costs and indirect costs. Indirect costs are trade losses. We estimated the indirect costs um, based on two approaches, approach one and two, which differ regarding the definition of the trade recovery period. Approach one defines the trade recovery period with a waiting period of three months after culling of the last infected or vaccinated animal in case of non-vaccination or by applying suppressive vaccination, or by using protective vaccination a six-month period. Approach two, based on Seitzinger and colleagues, they analyze trade data from historical FMD outbreaks from different countries and figure out that the trade recovery period is on average four months plus 3.8 months for each epidemic control duration of 30 days. And we use, uh, use both approaches in order to calculate the total economic losses for Denmark. The main conclusion of our simulation study is that there is no significant epidemiological benefit in terms of reduced number of infected farms by implementation 14 uh, additional control measures compared to the basic mitigation measure, shown here with the quite similar box and whisker plots. And this is for scenario A. Again, scenario A, when the epidemic started in 1,000 cattle herds in each of these regions across all production systems. And you can see that the outbreak size ranged between 1 and 12 infected farms. We got the same results for scenario B, when we initiated the epidemic in specific production systems like large commercial dairy herds or wiener pigs. Also, no significant epidemiological benefit if we implement additional mitigation measures. But what we can see is that the number of infected farms is much higher. Therefore, we can conclude by comparing scenario A and B that the chosen index herd significantly influenced the course of the epidemic. Now I will come to my last slide, the most important slide, the total economic losses for Denmark. Stratified by different mitigation measures and regions where the epidemic was initiated. Uh, as an example, we used 1,000 cattle herds to initiate the epidemic. And for calculation of the indirect costs, uh, we use the approach two regarding the definition of the trade recovery period. 
And you can see there are some slightly differences, but what you can see is that every time the basic control measure was the cheapest control measure for Denmark. If we use approach one, then we can see that the total economic losses for Denmark would be much higher when we use the trade definition of approach one. In total, uh, the difference was around 30%. Therefore, we can conclude for the contingency planning in Denmark, basic mitigation measures are sufficient to control FMD on average, because we saw also in the box plot diagram a lot of outliers. The next conclusion is that the chosen index hurts significantly, significantly, significantly influence the course of the epidemic. And what I couldn't show today, but in specific production systems when FND occur, then we have uh, issues regarding the resources for surveillance and culling in order to efficiently manage the uh, FND outbreak. And with these words, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm very sorry that, uh, that the laser pointer doesn't work. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Beate. Save all your questions. There will be a panel discussion in the end uh, after all the talks. So this time we're going to move on quickly to the next presenter, which is going to be uh, Graham Garner from Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization uh, in Australia. And uh, Graham, you've also worked with the EU FMD. And uh, now you're going to explain about how to reduce producer losses in an FMD outbreak uh, by trading zones. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and good morning. Um, I'll begin by apologising if my voice starts to break up a bit. I'm sort of recovering from a recent bout of tonsillitis and my throat's still fairly raw. Um, today I want to talk to you about reducing producer losses in an FMD, FMD outbreak using trading zones. I'd like to acknowledge that this was a collaborative project with colleagues from CSIRO and the Australian Department of Agriculture and the Centre for Excellence in Biosecurity Risk Analysis at the University of Melbourne. We all know that loss of market access during an FMD outbreak causes serious economic losses for producers. And this is particularly important for countries which have export-based economies. In the case of Australia, which is a very large exporter of livestock, livestock products and genetic material, a number of studies have shown that um, loss of market access accounts for more than 90% of the economic impact of an FMD outbreak. So given this, application of trading zones have the potential to markedly reduce some of these losses. Under, and here I'm showing my age, I refer it to the OIE, of course we're talking about the World Organisation for Animal Health now. Under their guidelines there is the option of implementing a containment zone around an outbreak area in the case of an FMD outbreak. And this has the potential to be able to enable at least some trade to continue from, on, from an infected country. However, whether that um, can be applied or not obviously depends on the attitude of importers and whether they're likely to follow the guidelines. So the aim of the study today is to estimate the potential economic benefits of trading zones for limited duration FMD outbreaks in Australia. And I'll explain that uh, as we go along. So what do we actually mean by trading zones? Trading zones are areas within a country, i.e. outside of the containment zone containing the infected area, which are able to maintain their FMD free status and therefore um, may be able to continue trading. We have a couple of important questions to consider when we're thinking about trading zones. How do we define the boundaries? Do we just base these on control areas? Or would it be better to consider, say, administrative areas where there may be um, better data available and there may be, may be administrative, i.e. legislative reasons for using um, these um, political areas which might be a lot larger than the disease control areas. And the second important question is, what is the trade recovery timeline, 
i.e. how long is it going to take us to be able to implement the effects of having a trading zone. So the approach we took to look at this, these issues was to compare simulated outbreaks where we applied trading zones and where we didn't apply trading zones. We used epidemiological modelling to assess the potential geographic extent, number of infected animals and duration of the outbreaks. We used an analysis of trade data to estimate the share of exports that could be embargoed and the time out of markets. Partial equilibrium modelling using the Ag Emissions model, which is a uh, model of the Australian economy, was used to estimate the market impacts of export embargoes. So we looked at a, a range of 11 incursion scenarios around Australia, which varied in location, time of year and seed herd type. Um, these produced a range of outbreak sizes. For this presentation today, we're going to focus on the smaller um, outbreak scenarios. And the reason we do this is because we believe that it would be easier to defend a case for zoning in a small well-contained outbreak than in a situation where you've got a large uh, outbreak of FMD spreading widely in the country. Given that, the control programs were based on movement restrictions, stamping out surveillance and tracing, and to enable some consistency, we assumed a common 21-day delay from disease introduction to report. We ran 500 simulations per scenario, and to be conservative, we focused on the 75th percentile rather than the average or the median. We heard this morning that um, sometimes just thinking about an average size of an outbreak doesn't really give you a ind good indication of risk. So the first um, issue I raised was the trading zone boundary. For this study, we assumed that in phase one, there would be initially a national embargo on all exports, and this period would include the mandated national three-day livestock standstill that is included under our um, contingency plans. Phase two, uh, res restrictions would only apply to the whole of the affected state uh, or territory in which the outbreak occurred. Um, and that was based on the spatial extent of the 75th percentile of the runs. This is a conservative approach using large areas. And our rationale was that in Australia, states and territories have legislative responsibility for disease control. And therefore, we could mount a good case that they could uh, maintain border integrity. These would remain in place from day 15 to the last day of cull plus 90 days consistent with the World Organisation for Animal Health period to regain FMD free status. Shown graphically, in this case we assume the outbreak occurs in the state of Queensland which is in the, the northeast of the country. Initially we have 14 days of all the whole country being out of markets and from day 15 to last cold day plus 90, it's only Queensland which is affected. To put that in context, Australia, as you know, is very large, so a state like Queensland covers a very large area, which means we would have a very large buffer zone um, between the infected area and, and the rest of the country. Trade recovery timeline for small outbreaks, we assume the OIE disease freedom recognition criteria i.e. three months after the last case is cold. Um, a, as um, we heard the previous presentation, we, we'd also looked at historical export sales recovery data, but this is less relevant here because we're talking about smaller rather than larger outbreaks. So the results, the outbreaks tended to be small and readily contained with available resources. The day of last coal was less than seven weeks at the 75th percentile for all the outbreaks. And in all but one scenario, the outbreaks were uh, contained to a single state. Only in our Queensland 3 scenario, which started close to the border with the state of New South Wales, did we tend to get uh, spillover into the adjacent state. The national embargo, producer losses were of the order of 7 to 13 billion, depending on where the outbreak was and what industries were affected. Um, with effective implementation of trading zones, reducing producer revenue losses by the order of three to nine billion Australian dollars in present value terms over 10 years at a 7% discount rate. So in conclusion, FMD outbreaks in Australia would generate large costs to government and industry. 
substantial reduction in producer losses are potentially available from the adoption and acceptance of zoning um, of the order of three to nine billion Australian dollars. Of course, these benefits are going to be concentrated in the non-infected states. And we have to recognise that making a case for zoning will incur costs and require additional resources at a time when resources may already be stressed trying to manage the response. There is uncertainty over trading partner attitudes, but based on recent experience, I think we're starting to see increased international acceptance of the concept of zoning for disease control. Focus here is on smaller outbreaks, uh, as we believe it is easier to make the case for applying zoning in these smaller, more well circumscribed outbreak situations. Plus, we took a conservative approach in terms of defining the size of the um, infected or containment zones. Further work is required to look at larger outbreaks and particularly in situations where vaccination might be an important part of the component. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge funding for this project provided by Meat and Livestock Australia and other FMD Ready project with additional funding from the federal government and from the Charles Sturt University. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Again, we will need to save the questions for the panel uh, discussion later on uh, for the respect of time. So uh, we will move on, move on with the next speaker, uh, Dr. Giovanna Chiar Chiaravino. Sounds Italian, but working in the University of uh, Barcelona. Now okay. Barcelona. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. And you're going to talk to us about the economic effects of these diseases. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to stay here today and share with you the results of our work, which aim was to develop uh, a tool to support veterinary services and authorities for the, in the economic evaluation of costs associated to transponder diseases outbreak affecting ruminants and also the related control measure taken at local, regional or national level. The tool is called Outcost Room and has been developed by adapting the Outcost Peak, um, an already available tool um, developed um, as a FIO corporate tool for swine disease outbreak, which is available in this link here and which was described in a already published paper that you can see in the right corner. Um, what outcost room can, can do? Uh, two main applications. On one side, um, on the one hand, we have the outbreak uh, management support. The tool can be used uh, to support the allocation of resources, ensuring a rapid response to outbreak and emergency situation. But also, it can be used to estimate the budgetary needs in case the disease will spread to other area or other region or to next countries. Moreover, it can be used to raise awareness on the impact of transboundary animal diseases and infectious disease in general, uh, um, for use it applied for advocacy purposes to mobilize resources internally, but also internationally, and also promote the public trust toward government institution and the collaboration between public and private sector. The outcost room is an Excel-based tool. The computation are based on a deterministic model, and the tool is accompanied by a user guide to assist the reader, the reader on how to use the tool. However, guidelines alone are not uh, enough for self-learning. Um, yeah, you can have uh, some information there. In several several spreadsheets compose the tool. Um, we can see the one uh, input, the input spreadsheet is dedicated to the data introduction. Then we'll follow three different spreadsheets for the visualization of results. And the last spreadsheet provides a framework for a qualitative assessment on non-monetary cost associated to that outbreak. Moreover, 
as, we, as I mentioned before, the, the tool can be used to estimate quite precisely a real outbreak, actual outbreak in a retrospective way. Uh, but also it can be used to evaluate a possible outbreak uh, under a given scenario. Um, look, ever, having a look, a look at the input data sheet, this is how it looks. It's a series of uh, different tables, color-coded. And the uh, data collection focuses on five main thematic blocks that are uh, population census and production parameters, data on, on outbreak and control measure implemented in affected farm, control measure implemented in connected farm at risk farm or neighboring farm, surveillance and control activities in general population, including livestock, wildlife and vectors, or other centralized activity as border control, training, um, movement checkpoints, um, communication, awareness, and other coordination tasks. As some specificity, in the first part of the input spreadsheet, the user uh, can specify and classify the farms in up to eight different types, according to the definition used in the country on the area under the study, or according also to the availability of data. Moreover, um, there are two currencies available for the visualization of the results, and also it includes uh, the different um, profile, professional profile uh, and related salary type of people that can be involved in the outbreak management. As, as output, more than uh, about 100 uh, cost items are calculated. The results will be displayed to, to table and figure. And the first spreadsheet, the overall cost, where we provide a general summary of results. Then in the more cost spreadsheet, we can find specific results on affected farm and results on connected farm, which are at risk farm and neighboring farm. And at the end, the, the, last, the last one, the breakdown of cost is a huge table with detailed results on each calculate items. Um, some, something that I want to align, that costs are presented uh, always for the whole uh, area, but also by farm type. So you can also, the user can compare what are the different um, effects in this, in the, according to the farm type. And also uh, the tool allows differentiate between the cost assumed by the veterinary services, farmers or other stakeholders that, that can be involved. The tool has been validating two uh, case studies, uh, different case study validation are ongoing. We are, are working with, together in collaboration with uh, Greece, uh, estimating the impact of uh, sheep pox and goat pox in two different time period, two different outbreaks. Then we are analyzing an outbreak of PPR in Bulgaria in 2018, FMD always in Bulgaria in 2011. 11, and also we are evaluating two hypothetical scenario by estimating the cost of potential LSD outbreak in Central Asia. To finish my, to conclude my presentation, I would like to present, briefly present some preliminary results from two of these, uh, from two of these case studies. Uh, the first case study in Bulgaria, the outbreak, we had seven outbreak, uh, seven confirmed outbreak of PPR. Uh, that were stamping out and disinfection was applied. Also, intensive efforts were done in at risk uh, and neighboring farms uh, with uh, restriction of movement, some stamping out, and an increased surveillance in general livestock population was carried out. As results, uh, this, our tool estimated a total cost of about uh, two and a half million euros. Uh, main, most of costs were due uh, to the um, investigation and control of the disease in connected farm and the control of outbreaks um, co corresponded to about the 10% of the total cost. 
And in particular, he, here we can see the difference by farm type also. In the sheep farm, for example, the major impact was due to the stamping out, including the compensation to farmer and other, other related costs. In connected farm, a major um, amount of major cost was due to the inspection and analysis of those farms. In the second case study, we have a complete different situation. We are in, this, uh, in an island. We had uh, um, 36 outbreak of SPGP and that were stamping, stamped out, but uh, some neighboring farm was investigated and no other further measures were applied. In this case, the cost was about 1 million euro. Of, of course, I mean, the 60% uh, of the total amount was due to outbreaks and then to surveillance on farm. Within the outbreak, major costs were related to the compensation to farmers. And in fact, if we look at these results according to the sector that assumed the cost, we can see that the veterinary services spend the highest amount of money on the outbreak control, while for farmers, the major economic impact was due to the surveillance on farm. And that's, that's it on my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, again, we will save the questions for the panel discussion. And, and uh, please uh, help us with questions in the forum for the panel discussion. And our last speaker of the session is uh, uh, Edward Hill. Uh, you come from a country which uh, has a long and strong history of modeling in uh, modeling diseases, and you come from the University of Warwick. So we're, we're very excited to hear what is next from, from you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope we're coming through on the uh, podium mics, it sounds good to me, so brilliant. So, yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction. So my name is Ed Hill. I'm a Warwick Seaman lecturer in the Maths Institute at the University of Warwick and a member of the Systems Biology and Infectious Disease Epidemiology Research Group known as SPIDER and also a member of the Joint Universities Pandemic and Epidemiological Research Consortium known as Juniper. And today I'm going to give a brief overview of our study modeling livestock infectious disease control policy under differing social perspectives on vaccination behavior. And this is part or work conducted as part of a interdisciplinary project funded by the BBSRC uh, known as the FEED project, Pharma-led Epidemic and Endemic Disease Management. And our group contains mathematical modelers, behavioral scientists, and veterinarians from the universities of Nottingham and Warwick in the UK. So it's recognized that pharma behavior is critical to reduce the spread of infection amongst livestock to enhance animal welfare and uh, reduce economic losses. Furthermore, though disease transmission models are a useful aid for giving insights on potential impacts of control strategies, um, perhaps historically they would treat farmers as behaving uh, in a similar way towards disease management. So what the FEED project is looking to do is to add greater realism, seeking to understand the different factors that drive farmer behavior in the face of an emerging disease. And so in our, this particular study, we developed a mathematical model that included both epidemiological and behavioral elements and looking to study when population and individual perspectives towards an intervention may differ. And in our case, we focused on vaccination. And we were looking specifically at simulating outbreaks of an FMD-like pathogen on representative livestock systems in the English counties of Cumbria and Devon. So I'll now summarize the data, our model, and how we implemented the intervention in that model. So in our data, we focused on cattle and sheep specifically with the livestock demography informed by uh, data provided by the Animal and Plant Health Agency and this data related to estimates from 2020. For our epidemiological model, we are working on the basis of our epidemiological unit being a premises. So we were assuming when infection got onto a premises that within premises disease spread would be instantaneous and therefore all the livestock present would be infected. In then terms of how the progression of the disease in terms of status, this was based on dynamics of FND. 
So for a susceptible uh, livestock becoming infected, this had dependencies on the number of livestock, uh, livestock type specific parameters in terms of susceptibility and transmissibility, and there was a spatial component based on the distance between the infectious premises and the susceptible premises. Once a premises was infected, it then progressed through a series of states. So initially it would be uh, infected but not infectious, and then that lasted for five days before moving to an infectious state, but not yet notified. Another four days later, the premises would then be notified, so now nine days from being originally infected. And then removal or culling would then occur another four days later, so 13 days from the date of original infection. And in our model, we assumed there was kind of perfect reporting, so any premises which was infected would ultimately notify. For our vaccination assumptions, we would considered three different stances towards implementing vaccination. These included precautionary users who essentially had already their vac um, vaccinated their livestock before the uh, outbreak began. Those who would react when the infection was confirmed within a given distance of their own premises. And then uh, non-users who would essentially never apply a vaccination irrespective of the epidemiological circumstances. A couple of other key assumptions, we assumed the vaccine, there was a delay between it being administered and immunity being induced, but after that time, it would be 100% effective. Uh, one caveat to this would be vaccination of livestock who were currently uh, latent infected or infectious but not yet notified. In that case, the vaccine would be ineffective. So what we wanted to do was to take our model setup and through model simulation, to ascertain what would be the optimal threshold distance for the reactionary vaccinators, testing range of values between 0 and 10 kilometers um, at one kilometer increments. And our consideration was what the cost might be different based on the perspective you take. So we were looking to work out the best outcome to balance uh, economic and epidemiological factors from two different perspectives. One being taking a, a broader view, um, where you might have a stakeholder looking to protect the uh, wider livestock industry, or you might have an individual perspective, so those farmers who have their businesses and livestock to protect. And a consideration for both of these is what is the relative cost of vaccination uh, per animal compared to the cost of infection per animal. So taking this, we then wanted to assess how the role of behavior on, academic, um, on the epidemic outcomes by having a different split of our population across our three vaccination stance groups, our precautionary, reactionary, and non-vaccinators. And in total, we had 231 different combinations. And visually, we want to try and portray this using these ternary plots, where the position of the marker uh, within the plot, um, you can read off then what the proportion or percentage of the population uh, assigned to each group. And to give uh, one slide on example results, and so these are specific to Cumbria, and initially looking at a, a low relative cost of vaccination compared to infection, so 0.2. And here our ternary plot markers are showing what the optimal threshold distance for reactionary vaccination is min, um, in the top panel from the population perspective and in the lower panel from the individual perspective. And the gray crosses correspond to when basically um, reactionary vaccinators shouldn't vaccinate at all. And then the filled circles, the lighter the circle, uh, the broader the reactionary zone. And in this low relative cost of vaccination, um, if the majority of the population is precautionary, so in the lower left corner of this ternary plot, from the population perspective, um, essentially reactionary vaccinators shouldn't vaccinate. Whereas from the individual perspective, uh, reactionary individuals should um, react within a localized area. So if there is infection within a couple of kilometers of them. If you now go to a uh, cost of vaccination, which is closer to the cost of infection, uh, the standpoint now is a wider notification zone um, is needed if you take the population perspective versus the individual perspective. So to conclude, it's um, kind of key that we consider the actions of indi individual farmers when thinking about policy frameworks for the management of livestock disease outbreaks. And broadly speaking, our work provides a modeling framework that could indicate to those developing veterinary health policy, the nature of control measures that could be beneficial from both the industry perspective 
and individual pharma perspective. And with that, to give thanks to my collaborators on the fee project, uh, APHA for providing data and funding from the BBSRC. And this work has, um, is available within PLOS computational biology. And very final slide is our research group has been developing a couple of podcast series to promote our research and discuss with group members um, our like, progression to the roles we currently have. So feel free to give those a listen if interested. And thank you for listening and yeah, happy to take your questions. This time we have uh, the time for a comment or a question from the audience or from online, if there are any. Come on, yeah, there's a hand in the audience. Thank you. Hi, it's Simon Gubbins from the Purbright Institute. I was just a question, are you assuming that the pharma actions are independent of their neighbors because obviously Farmers talk to each other, so it's quite likely they might kind of be some sort of interaction with other farmers, and kind of rather than assigning kind of independent kind of decision making. I mean, is that something you've considered, or how would that likely affect kind of the conclusions you're make, you're drawing? Uh, thanks, Simon. It's a great question, and within that model setup, that's not currently built in, but that is a consideration as we move forward as to say the impact of your um, kind of your network, your community, who you. Um, like have trust in and how that might influence your own behavior and how that might be like contagion like within uh, your own network for how you um, apply disease management so future consideration thank you yeah. well thank you and uh, thank you ed and we will move on to the next session which is uh, a session a panel session which is going to be moderated by buddha armadi and Katja, uh, um, and you will uh, lead the discussion from the beginning, right? So we will need rearrangement. Okay. All right. Uh, so Excuse yes, me. we are going to have a discussion as a, a panel discussion here. Uh, my colleagues are uh, bringing the seat on. Um, so in this panel discussion, we will continue to explore how digital technology uh, can assist with the timely decision making in a response, uh, and also explore how technology can support uh, contingency planning while taking into account the uh, broader impacts of response decision uh, on trade, on animal health, and on uh, communities. So with that, I would like to uh, um, welcome and introduce the, the panelists. Of course, we have uh, Stan here uh, from the, from the uh, previous panel, and also Graham. I would like to invite you on the stage, please. And also our speakers this morning, um, Tatiana Marshik, Please uh, come on on the, on the stage, uh, Beata uh, Conradi uh, and Giovanna Giaravino. Uh, Apologies for my spelling, and also Edward Hill. Please. Okay. Uh, without any delay, I would like to uh, go ahead and ask the first question, just to start with, and then we go to to the to the. Uh, audience here and also online uh, colleagues. So as a first question, I would like to ask you, uh, how can disease spread models effectively combine assessments of responses uh, on, on costs uh, or social impacts to give a more holistic approach uh, to assisting decision making? And to continue with that, uh, do we need to use such models in sequence? And if so, uh, how do the uh, basically various models uh, could communicate with, with each other. So I'd like to uh, direct this question maybe to uh, Giovanna, to Edward and uh, Graham, and of course, uh, Beata, you, you would also welcome to, to, to answer. Please. Who wants, Who wants to, to start? start? Oh, okay. um, I'm happy to start. Um, I think uh, from a decision maker's point of view, the input from epidemiologists is just one component of the decision making process. 
And so I think it's increasingly important that our models um, expand to take into account some of these other dimensions of disease, the economic, the social, and um, some of the uh, socio-political aspects of things like environmental and animal welfare issues. Um, do we just build monolithic models? That's one approach. The alternative is to link our models with tools being used by people in other fields. And the classic, of course, is when we're looking at impacts of disease, where economists have their own toolbox of tools, and I think it makes sense to, to link into those. The important issue then is ensuring that the models can talk to each other and that the outputs, say, from an epidemiological model are of in the format and the type which can be used by economists to then go on and do more economy-wide studies and analyses. So what that involves, I think, is that we need more multidisciplinary approaches and I think we're increasingly seeing that in the sorts of studies um, which are being done these days where we're getting um, uh, joint economic epidemiological studies. Um, there's Ed's work taking, trying to bring on board some of the uh, social considerations of how decisions are made at the farm level. Um, and also I think we um, also need to factor in some other issues when we're looking at modelling disease about um, culling might be a limiting factor in the rate at which we control disease if there's environmental constraints on, on what you can do with the, the culled animals. That's probably enough for me. Maybe some of the other speakers would like to panel would like to add? Hello? It's not my turn. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I have to say the EFMD's model is one of the available models which combine both, right, which are available at the moment. Mm. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> but for me, for me, for example, can be very useful to combine the different models since uh, although um, some aspects can be common. The, the, the way, the point of view, the focus or address the problem can be different and give you different uh, output and in, information. And um, I don't know if uh, they need to be used sequ sequentially, really. Of course, in some case, for example, just using what you mentioned of your, mod the, your model, the AUFD, what we, uh, we, we made an attempt to use some of your output to feed, automatically feed uh, our model because the way the costs are calculated in our model is slightly different, so it can be a, like a double check validation, control yeah. validation um, steps, but also our model gives uh, some further details, um, items that are not included in the other model, so you in this, in this way, using the same source of data that can be um, an added value for me that you introduce data just once and then automatically you can mix the output together and uh, add, uh, having uh, further information the, on, that, on that topic. Th this can be, yeah, if, uh, it's quite complicated to have just one model that is able to approach all the different aspects including social factor at individual level and at societal level and on this point of view, I would like to conclude that also would be interesting maybe in the future to take into account not only the um, individual uh, so or social aspect at individual level considering the farmer of the productive sector, but also the reaction of the general public that more and more can affect the, the way, uh, I mean, that people follow your recommendation at the end. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, Beata, please. Maybe I, yes, my turn? No? Yes, yeah. It's okay, okay. Uh, but I think uh, the social uh, aspect is an uh, aspect for the politicians. So we can provide outcomes. We can say, okay, we have so many uh, colored animals with this mitigation strategy, or uh, when we use this approach, etc. But at the end, I think the politicians have to uh, weigh the, 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 the different results. What's, what's more important, the social aspect, the animal welfare uh, aspect, the sustainable aspect, or the economic part? Um, 
So I can provide some results, but the, the, the decision is up uh, to the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We agree that yeah. the decision is up to yeah. politicians, but then yeah. this moment of providing information can be I mean, more complete and deep. We, we, we can, are able to, to yeah. build that. I think it depends also on the cult uh, country culture. Ah, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Edward. Oh, so a couple of... <laughs> I think follow-on points to that. So yeah, um, yeah, I think strongly support um, comments by my colleagues. I think trying to create an environment where we encourage the inter interdisciplinary conversations um, to occur is crucial. And then also considering ultimately information being provided to the, kind of the stakeholder, the policymaker, that being something which is interpretable to them. And equally, the questions that they're posing, it's something that modeling can usefully explore. So then having um, individuals, so in the context of modeling response contributing to um, uh, the response to the pandemic in the UK. Um, kind of having it, there was a group of people, secretariats, who could help take uh, reports from researchers and basically turn that into information which could then be usefully used by the policy makers and equally the questions they were asking, they could make sure it was something as modelers that um, the models themselves could like, help address. It wasn't a question which the models would be incapable of informing. And so then having that network of like translating material from um, scientific community to something usable by the stakeholder is important to consider as well across the interdisciplinary mm. boundaries. Excellent I think it's a very point. challenging problem. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point though, communicating between the modelers and the decision makers is, is a really important gap sometimes. Do we have any questions from the room before we go to the online questions? Yes, there are two. We'll go to whoever gets the microphone first. Thank you. Uh, reflecting on this, on this possible complementarity of different models, I wonder whether a community of practice exists uh, that can facilitate or that facilitates the uh, exchange of, uh, of met methodologies that uh, are, 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 are being implemented, developed and implemented, the results, and, and perhaps also the, the way that the, the results are communi communicated to the, to the policy makers. So the question is, if that community of practices um, exist in, at the regional level or international level, and if they exist, how, how, how can be uh, improved? Or if you think they are beneficial or not? Uh, I can say, uh, as a scientist, we have uh, exchange of uh, model uh, outcomes and codes. We have, for example, GitHub with documentation. So everyone has access to the codes uh, and the documentation. Um, and we started also uh, now in the research to build modeling challenges, it calls modeling challenges. So we organized some uh, outbreaks between countries in order to figure out if we can manage it between countries. This is also included in the UFMD's model. Uh, the transboundary uh, module. Uh, so there is an exchange uh, of, of codes, but of course we have to make adaptions depending on the country uh, and also the wishes for the uh, politicians and so on. Um, yeah, this is from the research perspective. Yes, please, Graham. Um, I can comment a little bit from the perspective of countries working together um, to address contingency planning issues through modelling. Um, through the Quads countries, which is a uh, group of countries, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the US, um, they have set up an EPI modelling technical group, which does joint studies um, against common themes using their own models and using it both as a way of validating their models on common studies but also a way of informing decisions um, which are of concern to, in this case, the chief entry officers who, who saw the, formed the peak of the uh, quads group. That group from time to time has had other members on it, uh, including the Netherlands, the UK, and I think at one stage we even had Sweden participate in a, in a one-off study. So I think that's an example of the networking which can and probably should occur. Um, at an academic level, there are examples of modelling groups working together to address common issues. And Mike Tildesley is in this room. And a number of years ago, he organised um, 
the, I think it was called the RAPID project, to look at the potential value of ensemble modelling in the um, animal health space. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think it's a couple of practical examples of how modelling groups can work for a uh, constructive, more general good than just working within their own uh, narrow country environment. Thank you. We had one more question from the audience. Go ahead. Yes, a question from Don. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Don King from Purbright. Um, I mean, I suppose it's following up on from Fabrizio's comment, which we <coughs> this morning we've heard about the complexity of some of the models that have been generated. And I suppose it's, it's asking the question, how do you decide which model you're going to make? I mean, so we heard, you know, that models take a long time to develop and you need to develop them ahead of time. How do you decide um, which model you're going yeah. to you develop, which particular questions are going to be addressed by the model, and um, at what point do you, do you challenge or is the challenge and influence of the decision makers, the stakeholders, and the people who are actually going to have the outputs of the model? I mean, I can see, of course, the models sometimes are driven by academic curiosity, but it's, it's moving beyond that academic curiosity to make sure that, that all those resources are, are put in the right place. I suppose that's the question. Anyone else want to respond? Yeah, I can respond uh, for Denmark. So we have an intensive exchange and meetings, a lot of meetings with the veterinary authorities in order to uh, catch up their wishes and uh, urgent questions in order to build such models. So I think uh, the communication, which also Anita mentioned in peacetime is very important, that we yeah, can address with the models the urgent questions by the uh, veterinary authorities. As a general comment, what comes first, the model or the question? You know, it's uh, often tempting to say, I've got a model, what can I use it to do? Um, whereas from a decision-making perspective, we're talking about emergency uh, contingency planning here, I think we should be driven by what are the issues of concern. And different models will work better in different situations, depending on availability of data, the nature of the question you ask, and... Um, the time you've got to invest in developing it. So, you know, a, a good example in Australia during the COVID pandemic, the requirement was for very rapid um, modelling work to be initially done in an environment where we had very little understanding of the epidemiology of the disease. So it was um, the first approach was to just an adapt an existing relatively simple pandemic flu model um, to support those initial needs in the first few weeks while more detailed models were developed, if you like, on the fly, um, using a range of different techniques and methodologies, which could take into account the emerging knowledge about the, um, both the biology of the virus and the, the spread of disease. So I'm a strong advocate. There's no one model that will do everything. You, you need a range of modelling tools, and different tools are suited to different purposes and different tasks in a greater or lesser way. Some simple mathematical models can be extremely useful for answering questions about within herd dynamics. If you want models to answer questions about the economics and behaviour and the impact of different strategies, then you obviously need more sophisticated models which take um, those considerations into account. Thank you. Aldo, you've been very patient. Please go ahead. Going back a little bit to the, the, the question uh, uh, that models drive our decisions, and models are great. The, we, we, do, the, the, we don't have better ways of, of looking at it, but sometimes they drive also uh, how we decide things, and uh, economics is one thing. But now, now, with killing one million healthy chickens because of... Uh, flu outbreaks on other farms in, uh, in a total of six million chickens killed just for preventive killing one sixth of that population then you th think what, what, what can we do differently and, and these ethical questions these fundamental as a fed you, 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 you study to make animals healthier and then you decide to, to kill healthy animals to, to avoid spread and can't we do it differently that is essential and how do you do, do that because you can say yeah that that's uh, uh, the, the decision maker has to do that we just uh, uh, supply the data but you're a person in this society and how do you f 
how do you work your, your, your own opinion in that? And how do you m make sure that th these our ministry, uh, minister is now asking for other solutions than, than killing all these animals. And that's one of the things that I think we are, have to do. And uh, ethics has, has to be a, a larger part in our, our decision making, I think. And that's the model has started at that point. Tatiana, yes. thank you. Um, yes, uh, we have the same discussion in Austria. Uh, we are lucky uh, we don't have avian influenza, but uh, on FMD, uh, the model shows that preemptive culling would be uh, the most um, effective uh, strategy, both economically and epidemiologi epidemiologically. But uh, we know that um, in reality, it won't be an option. Australia is a country with, where um, animal protection plays an important role and um, the authorities uh, cannot imagine to cull um, such a large number of um, healthy animals. And also this is something that I think happened during the uh, FMD outbreak in 2001 in Great Britain. Uh, it was for the first time where the models were used um, during, the out during the outbreak and uh, of course the models predicted that the preempting caliph would be effective and that was also the reason why the, the, um, the managers and authorities decided to cull such a huge number of animals. So, um, yeah, um, maybe it's important to answer the question um, prior to the outbreak if um, social factors as an um, animal protection um, plays an important role. Uh, perhaps an additional question on preemptive culling because that, that's, that's one of the things that I think. If you go to a farm and you vaccinate, three people are going to that farm. And I, I don't know if you ever visited a, a culling of a farm, a killing of a farm, is it? Culling is a ridiculous word, like peacetime. We should not use those words, that's different. Uh, we should just call it killing of animals and uh, a period without uh, uh, Outbreaks is uh, is different from a period where uh, you have war. Sorry, Aldo, we'll uh, need to move. Yeah, to yeah, but the, the, this this question is that the the number of people on the farm uh, that's so essential that if you would assign a risk to every person visiting a farm, then you would see that the the risk of transmission during preemptive culling is much higher than if you do, would use vaccination. And those things are, I wonder, do they, are they part of your model? Th this risk of preemptive culling. So I think I'll add a, I'll add a general point thinking about like, scientific communication and um, trying to like, build trust within like, public in terms of the use of modeling, what it's capable of doing, and also its limitations. And I think like, within like, the medical, medical discipline, the fact there's more usage with like public involvement, um, so research being done kind of with um, public groups and not just for them, and whether that's something, and that could be translated into say like the modelling disciplines, and this might then also help aid like, these ethical discussions where we've got so, like, interventions being applied which like, have a very severe consequence for the individual, their livelihood, um, and animal welfare, welfare as well, translated into um, like th yeah this environment. Okay, thanks very much, Ed. Uh, I think uh, we have a number of uh, questions from our online audience. I'd like to ask colleagues to project the questions now. Okay, don't worry. Uh, well, I think, uh, Aldo, you have already asked your question, isn't it? Um, but okay, you have another question here. Um, can one modelers comment on the expected outcome in their model? and? I think you, you can read uh, the question in the Netherlands after CSF outbreak, uh, the effect of uh, preemptive killing or calling um, was evaluated using a model. The researchers also looked at the effect of uh, hygiene by reducing the probability of infection. The effect was 50% reduction in the infection probability was most effective. The result was not reported as it was not asked, but so relevant. This can still be done again. Okay, I go also to the next question, and then uh, we ask the panelists to, 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 re to, to react. Uh, and this question is uh, from Valentina uh, from, uh, from EUFMD. Uh, um, 
for uh, Giovanna. A very interesting tool. You mentioned the user guide, but that would not be enough to become uh, proficient in using the tool. Do you provide, are you uh, planning to provide any training on that? Can I, can I answer the oh, no, Yes, please. Um, thank you, Valentina. Regarding the training opportunity, uh, we are going to, um, uh, to, to, to organize a webinar for sure that will be announced soon. And the um, material will be then available, hopefully online some, somehow. And uh, now we are also, in the meantime, if people would want to start using it, then they can contact us and we are providing, uh, beside the tool and the user guide, also uh, a, so, a sort of uh, assessor during the, 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 the process of uh, using it or practicing with it. But yes, we are, we are planning some uh, training activity also. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. maybe one comment for um, our Netherlands uh, colleagues. Um, for the Danish uh, EFMD, EU FMDs model, we included hygiene aspects. We have the biosecurity waiting inside. We have a pig industry. We recorded a uh, specific pathogen-free status of pigs herd. So we ha have included such information as well. I hope this answers your question. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have received another question from our online uh, colleagues, uh, and the question is, when virus is in circulation in wild anim animals and in developing countries uh, that have uh, no data on it, what is strategy uh, to adopt? I suppose they are referring to modeling. So I don't know who wants to, to answer that question. I think um, when we talk about potential role of wildlife, we're obviously constrained by the availability of data into the sorts of uh, methodologies and techniques we can use. Um, I think the first step is obviously, if we don't already have it, is some information on the uh, spread of disease within the wildlife, and particularly at the wildlife and domestic interface, which is of interest to us in terms of controlling diseases. Um, we are working on a project uh, we being EU FMD with colleagues in Spain and Germany, look at um, adding a wild boar component into the EU FMD model, and we're using CSF as the disease, and we're building on experience in places like Germany and France and elsewhere who had um, a number of years ago with outbreaks to try and inform um, this uh, complex uh, domestic wild ecosystem from a disease, percentage, disease point of view. I think one of the issues we need to think about in wildlife is while we may not be able to fire, provide definitive answers, we can do a lot of what-if questions. If the level of interaction is at this level, this is the um, potential spillover of infection that we might see, etc. So, Yes, it is important and it's becoming increasingly important as we're looking at diseases which have a wildlife component. So. Thank you. I think we had one more question from Sylvia in the audience. Uh, thank you so much. My question goes to uh, Edward, Edward Hill. I do appreciate the project focusing on the, the farmers who are key stakeholders. I'm a veterinarian, but having worked with farmers for many years, I do appreciate that they are key stakeholders. And if we ignore them, uh, then we will uh, actually take much longer to control or, or move towards eradicating foot and mouth disease. Now, my question is, in the environment where I come from, um, the categorizations could have been different, and the underlying the categorization could be mainly socioeconomic uh, variables. Uh, for instance, uh, if a farmer has uh, one at uh, five heads of cattle, when he is mobilized to come for mass vaccination, he may stay away because he fears that if he takes his only source of livelihood, maybe the vaccine could have adverse effects, so he will keep away. Then for the farmers that have medium herds to large herds, they will divide, they, they tend to divide their herds. They don't tell that to us as veterinarians, but we have come to discover that they will divide their herds. They will bring some animals just in case there is a risk 
uh, from the vaccine, and then they will tend to keep some, some uh, part of the herd, imagining that if the vaccine would have adverse effects, then at least if these animals died, some will remain. That's something they have done for years, and it took long to discover that they can do that. And then there are other variables, for instance, gender. The women farmers tend to have even smaller <laughs> numbers of animals. A widow, a, a woman headed a household could have just one cow, and that's the source of their livelihood. So if you tell them come and vaccinate, they may never come because they're not sure. They fear that they could lose uh, their source of livelihood. Well, in summary, my question was, uh, is the project considering uh, bringing in maybe other variables, other variables so that we uh, we, we can understand some of those behaviors underlying the, the non-response or the precautionary behaviors uh, from the farmers. Because without their cooperation, it is very difficult for us as veterinarians or scientists to actually achieve our goals of controlling uh, foot and mouth disease and eventually eradicating it. That's why my question is, thank you so much. Thank you. Th thank, you for the, thank you for the observations and remarks. and. I think that highlights the crucial point that um, the model framework as it currently is, is designed within the UK context and therefore just merely um, straight um, direct usage of that in other contexts uh, is likely not appropriate and therefore getting the regional expertise to inform what are the most relevant um, variables to consider are there other aspects of behaviour which aren't currently in the model which um, is known to, are known to be very um, likely high drivers within the disease transmission. Um, therefore, so I think main takeaway is um, can the linkages with local expertise to ensure the model is reasonably set up and reasonably parameterized and not, yeah, not just taking a model off the shelf and directly applying it to a different, different context without having discussions. Okay, before we draw the session to a close, I just have another question that's coming for you, Steen. Um, in your capacity as a decision maker in government, um, how do you use and interpret models or the outputs of models? Well, um, when I see the results of uh, the study Beata uh, showed today, it makes me confident because I know the contingency plan, my whole organisation, is uh, um, geared towards this strategy, which was the basic strategy, right? Um, so it makes me confident to see that that strategy, on average, will be uh, a good one, right? So, so, so for me as a decision maker, it is really good to see. Um, to get some evidence that what you are doing is actually the right thing. Or if you see something which is uh, not the right thing, then, that can, then, then there's, you need to explore it, right? You need to look at things from different angles, really to, to, to end up, hopefully, with the best plan in the end, right? That's how I see it. Well, let's um, thank our panel members before we sum up. Um, <laughs> and so in conclusion, I guess we, um, we've seen that technology such as outbreak modelling and the modelling of um, specific um, control factors can provide part of the picture for um, control of emergency diseases, but of course broader decision making needs to take into fact account other factors such as social factors, political factors and economic factors um, to assist with decision making. So, um, and we observed that multidisciplinary approaches are needed to develop models that can start to incorporate some more of those social, political and e economic factors and not just the technical factors that lead to decision making. Um, once again, um, I'd like to thank our panel. Um, and I'd like to encourage you before we go to lunch at one to again look at the posters um, and feel free to vote. And 
I think our panel members will remain available if you want to come and talk to them individually um, before lunch is available at one o'clock. So, again, thanks very much to our speakers and panellists. <laughs> and you've got 12 minutes before lunch to mingle, ask questions, look at the posters. Yeah, we can.
So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to our uh, second sessions. Uh, we wait a few seconds so that the people enter into, into, into the room. Perhaps uh, just uh, an, uh, um, an announcement that uh, during the uh, coffee break, we will make uh, two group pictures. And being uh, the, the theme of the session, uh, digitalization, the first picture will be uh, done uh, before the coffee break, uh, outside on the terrace where you have the coffee break. And it will be an, an analogical picture using Polaroid. And then the second one here in the room after your coffee break. And, and we will make a picture here with a digital camera. So we can uh, open uh, our second session, which is focused on digital learning. And I'm pleased to introduce the, the chair of the session, also member of the Standing Technical Committee of the UFMD. Uh, Katerina Stark, who is uh, attending online. Katerina is the head of animal health department at the Federal Food State uh, and Veterinary Office in Switzerland. And uh, uh, she, she has been assisted in the preparation of the session by Marcello Nardi, who is the pro program learning lead uh, at, the, at the UFMD. Um, and Silvia Baluca who is a co-lead of uh, a project that we have for um, capacity development of uh, veterinary paraprofessional. Um, Silvia, together with Buddha, will also assist in co-moderating the uh, panel discussions. So, Katharina, the floor is yours. Hello to Marseille. I hope uh, you can hear me well. And uh, it's also an honor to welcome you also from my side to this session two of the EU FMD general session. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, I welcome you here from my office uh, here in Bern, beautiful Switzerland. And this is of course possible thanks to digital tools. And we all became very familiar uh, with the use of digital tools um, during the pandemic. And they have now become essential for many professionals, including veterinarians. And this is why I think um, the aim of this session is very topical. Uh, so that is, we aim to discuss the opportunities of digital learning and the use of digital tools and how these tools provide new ways of capacity building in the animal health sector in general and for the control of fast diseases uh, specifically. Also in Switzerland, during the COVID years, the training of official veterinarians uh, was largely moved online. Uh, we were not really uh, prepared for this and we learned a lot and, and some of it the hard way. And this is why I am really looking forward to this session. We have a lineup of two keynote speakers and six short presentations as well as two panel discussions. And the topics covered in innovative teaching and learning opportunities and also demonstrate that effective learning online can be so much more than just delivering a lecture via Zoom or Teams or WebEx. So I'm really looking forward uh, to, to this and I hope to be able to uh, contribute and interact as, as much as possible from, from here. With this um, introduction, I hand over back to Marseille. And thanks a lot, Katarina, for uh, the kind introduction. Today we are uh, uh, going to have uh, uh, three presentations in the first half for the panel discussion. Let me introduce the first uh, keynote speaker. He is uh, Professor Christine Turanina McKeever from the Royal Veterinary College. Professor uh, Christine Turanina McKeever will provide us, uh, uh, the, will set the scene for uh, exploring the frontiers of digital possibilities, showing us uh, how digitalization in the veterinary education 
can bring improvements and new opportunities. Thanks, Christina. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks very much, Marcello. I hope everybody can hear me all right. I sound very echoey to myself, but fantastic. I'll just wait for the, um, for the presentation to appear. Right. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you all for, for the attention, for being here, and thank you for inviting me to, to talk today. So what I'm going to do today is give a fairly broad um, introduction to digital innovation as it has happened around Britain education in the last few years and, and hopefully set the scene for us to think about this in the context of fast disease control as well. Some of the things that I'm going to do that I'm hoping we'll be able to do in this, um, in this discussion are looking at um, or exploring the digital innovation and transformation in veterinary education in the last few years. Also thinking about this or juxtaposing this with similar transformations in veterinary services. Thinking about a few of the challenges that are posed by digital technologies. And I guess perhaps more so for the panel discussion, thinking about how some of these innovations can relate to capacity building around fast disease control. Now, if you just allow me to go back to what we might imagine was a better time pre-pandemic, it probably wasn't really, but if we go back to that time and what was happening around the digital world digital, in digital education at the time, I happen to be involved, interestingly enough, in, in a project looking at the digital educator, as we called it at the time. This was in, in early 2019. And this work that we were doing was really essentially around trying to see what opportunities there were for um, education when it came to digital technology, what the gaps were, where education, higher education was, and, and it, from my perspective, what education was. And the sorts of questions we were asking ourselves at the time, we were thinking about what new technologies there were, we were thinking about the teaching tools that we're using and how these related to, um, to technology, thinking about industry trends, because of course that drives how we educate um, our students, thinking about how students learn, the pedagogy of teaching and education, and then how this related to digital technologies and looking at sector trends as well in different, um, in different areas, in different subject areas. Now, what we found, mostly in looking at the literature around the time, this is pre-pandemic, was that there was a huge growth in consumer technology. You know, we were all using Alexa, we're all using Siri, we're all doing all of these things, which are, of course, driven by artificial intelligence, driven by AI, um, driven by machine learning, I mean, and, and so on. But this technology was not translating in any way to education. You know, this is the consumer technology that, that we were all using at the time without really thinking about it. And the rate of adoption and adaption of this technology to education, to the education sector, it was very variable, and it was definitely lagging behind when it came to the consumer technology, and more so in disciplines such as veterinary medicine, of course. You can imagine in computing and so on, there was perhaps more of an, an adoption of, of um, the newer technologies. It was clear that this growth of consumer technology did create a potential for education to extend to new horizons, but the gap hadn't been made. We hadn't quite bridged that gap of, 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 as to how to, to make this happen for education. And it, it all seemed a very complex proposition at the time, and, and education was very much um, lagging behind. Some of the questions that we were asking ourselves, we're looking at new technologies, thinking about them you know, in terms of the impact on higher education and the higher education sector, thinking about teaching tools, and, and how well were these new technologies evolving into teaching interventions? You know, how were people learning? Because, of course, pedagogy changes, it's dynamic, people learn differently, and, and the new generation learns differently. They are, as we call them, digital natives, and, and yet, we were not at the time really utilizing technology or adapting technology to the different ways of learning. Thinking about sector trends, how were different sectors changing and, and how was the, the educating of people or students around those sectors changing to keep up with the changing trends in the, these sectors 
and also, of course, the different industries and, and the trends going on there. So these are some of the questions that we were asking ourselves at the time. So fast forward eight months later, we did note at the time, but the world was to change very rapidly for all of us. And a pandemic, of course, as we know it, suddenly the focus on digital education and online education just became a requirement. We had to do something, we had to get online, we had to get digital very quickly and, and work out how we were going to do the things that we do in higher education, but also in other industries, in other areas, how we're going to do all of these things um, online, using the different technologies available to us. What this picture shows is something that we didn't have. This is from the Royal Veterinary College. Um, this is the virtual learning environment as it is now. And I can promise you that this was not the way it was a couple of years ago. Because as you can see, this is what students now see. They need to think about digital skills, which we really didn't do before. You know, the very basic question, what are digital skills? What do you need to know as a student, as a vet student? How do you get started? What tools do you need? What, what, what about issues of accessibility? You know, if you can't, if you have difficulties with reading screens or if you have um, learning differences such as dyslexia and so on, those sorts of things. How do you get organized? How do you conduct research online? So these are some of the things that we now have, which previous to the pandemic, we really didn't have. Or if we did, we had them perhaps in what you might call a light touch way and, and more so for the distance learners. So, very quickly, industry, education, found ourselves having to come up with strategies um, to harness, to embed digital um, technologies in everything that we did. So the pivot to online, these are all things that I think are very familiar to us now, which perhaps they weren't at the time or previous to the pandemic. Panopto for video capture, MS Teams, Zoom, PowerPoint, um, recorded PowerPoint slides and so on turning point for that interactivity in sessions. All of these various things suddenly became commonplace. We had to do them. We had to learn how to use them to best effect. So thinking about some of the things, the main technologies that, that were appearing around or that appeared around veterinary education and have, are now pretty much embedded, really, we're thinking about the virtual learning environments. Now, these are your, you know, your Moodles, your Blackboards and so on, which I think it's right to say were very one-dimensional at one stage. They were just very flat, and you just, well, they're almost used as repositories, which they're not anymore. They have become alive. They, are, they have become online teaching classrooms. They've become online lecture theatres and, and, and so on. And what have institutions used to, to make these things come alive, to make these platforms come alive, are the conferencing tools that were originally used in business. You know, things like Zoom. Zoom was hardly ever used in education. Now, we were using it for distance learning webinars and so on, but essentially, this is a tool that was used in, in, for commercial business meetings and so on. Teams, Google Meet, all of these things that really were not considered part of the digital or education landscape. Video casting. How do you teach a vet student what they need to know in anatomy when they're remote? How do we do that? So suddenly, we had to very quickly learn how to live stream anatomy lessons, how to do clinical skills online and so on. And therefore, there's a lot of live streaming, there's a lot of recorded content. And beyond that, again, trying to get that interactivity so that students are not just passive recipients of, of, of these videos or any of, of any of this content. So trying to upload images such that, for example, in an anatomy class, which is what this was, um, students are able to, through their screens, through their devices, wherever they might be, they could follow whatever is going on because they have whatever um, diagrams they need for the, that anatomy lesson and they can follow what was going on. And I just thought this was quite interesting um, because suddenly in our anatomy teaching, this is, these are all the anatomy lecturers. You can see all of them um, sitting a meter apart. It was all very carefully measured. And this was the live streaming of that anatomy lesson. And the students were all watching from whatever devices they had and following along interactively. So this is the kind of thing that we very quickly had to, to pivot to in a veterinary 
education setting in order to, to, to make the teaching still happen and, and to make it interactive and to get through all the clinical work that needed to be done. Other things that were happening, or another big area of work, was the mobile technologies. And again, this comes back to a certain extent to the pedagogy of, of trying to, to get a blended type of learning experience for the students, such that they're not only watching videos, or they're not only sitting in a Zoom lecture, or they're not, you know, that they're doing different things, mixing it up a bit. And therefore, there was a lot of suddenly creating apps with bite-sized bits of different types of learning, where there was case studies um, for the vet students or little exercises that they could almost play as a game, a, a bit of gaming going on between the different, between different um, groups of students in order to just um, give them that different learning experience. So, um, essentially, when we think about digital education then, um, digital technology and vet education, I think it all boils down to what was behind the technologies or what's behind the technologies that have been used, really. I would say artificial intelligence, and that's things like chatbots, natural language pro processing, machine learning, and so on. There's the virtual reality, and I think there's, there's somebody who will be talking about virtual reality um, later on this afternoon, and the learner analytics, and I'll come back to that um, in a little while. The other really important thing to think about when it comes to veterinary education is learner practices. How are people learning, or what changed in the way in which people were learning when it comes to digital, um, digital technology, using digital technology as part of learning? Students have had to become more independent, self-driven learners because that's what you need in digital education. That peer-to-peer -peer learning became a real reality when students, particularly when they were you know, remote in, in different, wherever they were in their homes, they had to rely on each other and to learn how to learn together um, remotely using technology. Micro-credentials. Now, this is a very interesting thing about a different way of learning. And the veterinary sector, veterinary education, hasn't really yet quite worked out how to do this. But the emphasis on small chunks of learning as building blocks, rather than focusing on one huge curriculum, which is what we do in veterinary education, other sectors or other areas of education are really thinking about people learning in small chunks and building up to different types of qualifications. Now, it might obviously not work for a an undergraduate vet student, but you can imagine somebody who is progressing in, in different, different areas of, of veterinary medicine, perhaps in disease control, they might, all they want to do is have little bits of learning that, that they scaffold and, and build, build upon, depending on what they need to do. And then the learner analytics, one thing that we really got, um, got to grips with quite a lot, or that people have got to grips with, is that ability to capture, analyze student learning habits, because it's all digital. You can work out which students are online, you can work out what they're doing, you can measure the extent to which they're actually actively doing anything, or if they're just sitting um, passively watching. You know, there is the capacity to do that with digital learning in a way that there isn't. Um, when, when students are sitting in a lecture theatre. So this has become a huge, huge area of work that's been enabled by digital technology. Now, I'll very quickly think about digital technologies in veterinary services. And I think there are people in this room that know a lot more about this than I do. But nonetheless, I thought it was very interesting to think about the sorts of advances that are happening in veterinary services and, and try to contrast those with what's happening in veterinary education. So obviously, the disruptive technologies, they're all around us. They've transformed human health, they're transforming the agricultural sector, and, you know, veterinary services, as part of the veterinary of agriculture sector, really, we, the veterinary services need, need to keep up with this. Um, so a very simple way that I've come across in many um, different... different um, types of literature. In terms of thinking about the technologies in veterinary services, really, I think a simple way to break it down is into these primary areas, the diagnostics, the monitoring, the predictive technologies that there are. And you can see diagnostics have obviously, over the years, these have been improving, they've been growing, they've been changing. But what's behind all of that, again, is the artificial intelligence, which we've talked about when it comes to the veterinary education. Things like the microfluidics, the molecular diagnostics at the point of care, 
what's driving all of these are things such as artificial intelligence um, and big data. If you think about the monitoring, and I think there was a talk earlier on on monitoring, which is um, really very, I suppose, very important, very relevant to this conversation that we're having here around fast diseases. You know, that real-time monitoring of health in animals, using different tracking signs and so on, the sensors, the remote monitoring surveillance, the building design around animal accommodation and so on, what is driving that? It's all machine learning, it's all artificial intelligence, and that's what is, is um, behind all of this. And of course, the predictive, it's using the data from the monitoring and the diagnostics in order to, um, to identify behavior changes and risk factors and so on. So, I would say these are the key things that are, and when it comes to digital technology, that are driving changes in veterinary services artificial intelligence, big data, and the mobile technologies. And I think it's quite useful to then think about this in the context of the digital learning in veterinary education and what, what we think or what we find are, again, the key drivers around that, the changes in digital education. Again, it's artificial intelligence, the virtual learning, augmented reality, haptics are used a lot in, most, in a lot of vet schools now. Those learn analytics, the focusing on how people are learning, what drives them, what, you know, how much time is spent on different activities, which activities work better, and so on, and the mobile technologies, those small, bite-sized chunks of learning. So I think it's useful at this point to just pause a bit and think about fast disease control and think about the technologies that I've outlined when it comes to vet services or those that are used in veterinary education, and for us to think about, well, which of these technologies would best suit fast disease control, thinking about the sorts of diseases that we're talking about, thinking about um, the distances that need to be covered sometimes, thinking about the connectivity issues around the sorts of work that, that need to be done. What of these technologies can actually be applied, best applied? And I guess this is something we'll talk about a little bit um, at the panel session. And I think it's also interesting to think about other diseases that are using a lot of technology. And these are some of the ones that I came across that have different types of technology, quite, quite a strong um, application of different technologies, and perhaps we could learn from, um, from these diseases and the application of technology to them. Quite important to think about the tools that we need in order to be able to use these technologies. Now, this might seem a very small thing, but actually it isn't at all. It's, it is the thing that you need to be able to access in order to be able to use these technologies. And I think it's a very important thing for us to think about. The hardware, the portable electronic devices, the laptops, the tablets, the smartphones. And during the pandemic, you know, we really realized how important these things are because students at the RVC, this is the premier vet school in the world, or so we're told, a lot of students did not have access to a lot of this hardware. So a fund had to be made available to make these things available so that students were able to learn. Now, if we think beyond that, if you think about people working in the field, vets working in the field, how does hardware, accessibility to hardware, impact that? Reliable connectivity. Again, this is something that we take very much for granted, but there are actually big issues around connectivity. And not only thinking about the global divide in different parts of the world, but also just in, in different parts of, of the global north, for example. And, and very often, you do need to cover huge expanses of area, for example, in the transboundary disease. Can we actually circumvent that issue around connectivity in different countries and so on? The other thing to think about on digital tools is the technical skills, the ability to use these technologies, the ability to manipulate the hardware to make you do the things you need to do in order to learn, in order to develop the competencies you need to develop. Now, a lot of our students are Gen Z, I think that's what they're called. They know how to do these things, but not everybody's in that generation. And you know, we now have a workforce, I think, for the first time, we've got this three, four generations in our workforces. And the generation at the end here, that the students we now have, are totally okay with this stuff, but not, not everybody who is out there in the field doing the things we need to be doing is going to be quite so competent. So those skills are very important. 
Right, and I'm getting a warning sign, so I'll be coming to I'll come in, be coming to an end in a minute. Now, accessibility barriers to technology. This is again really crucial, I think. Digital exclusion, digital inequalities, whether it's globally, whether it's regionally, whether it's different socioeconomic status, whether it's between diseases and so on, we need to be very aware of that. Techno stress. Technology does lead to huge amounts of stress. Um, and I can talk about that a little bit more, perhaps, in the, during the panel. Technocentricity, I can't even say it. Technology is great, but it should not be the driver of anything that's done. It, it, it has to have a context, and it needs to be very carefully managed. Otherwise, you end up that you have the wrong type of product that's driven by the technology, rather than the end result that's required. So that's really important. And then the digital literacy. Again, so these are some of the barriers and the issues of accessibility that I think we really need to bear in mind. So to sum up, I would say, thinking about digital technologies, veterinary education, veterinary services, you know, we can see these rapidly evolving innovations. There's a greater awareness, much greater awareness of the digital landscape and tools that are accessible to us. There's a growing awareness and growing ability in technical skills, but still not where it should be. On the other side of the coin, we've got issues around connectivity. These still remain really big issues. The cost of the infrastructure, you know, do we have that global divide like we're doing in, in, in many areas? And then, of course, there's also the issues of regulation and, and difficulties across borders in particular, if you're thinking about, you know, transboundary diseases and so on. You know, the regulations in different countries and different regions about using technologies, those can become a, a real difficulty. And I think I will leave it here, and perhaps we can talk a little bit more about it when it comes to the panel. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Turenio McIver. Uh, we uh, introduced a lot of many of the teams that uh, we'll be discussing later today. Um, in their role as a distance uh, um, learning. Uh, um, director at the Royal Veterinary College. Uh, she spoke about uh, the challenges of the digital education. Uh, but she introduced also one of the key teams that we will speak later in the second part of today's session. Uh, in uh, additional role of Vice Principal for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at RVC. We'll speak about um, how diversity in digital education is playing a role, but we have already explained many of the themes that we will be speaking about. Uh, for example, peer-to-peer -peer learning, we speak in the second part. Uh, we spoke about virtual reality, shortly we will have a presentation about that. And we spoke about also micro-credentials, how they can play a role uh, within better education. And that is something that uh, the next speaker, the Spina Yetrido, who is a senior policy officer at the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe will also mention during her presentation. Uh, the SPINA is connected remotely, so I will uh, uh, leave the virtual floor to her. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning and good evening for the ones that they are joining uh, from other uh, parts of the world. Thank you very much for this introduction. It is really a pleasure to join you from Brussels for this discussion on digital learning for veterinary professionals. So let me first introduce to you um, the uh, organization I'm working for, the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe. FE represents about 300,000 veterinarians in Europe. Oops, and here. Um, and uh, uh, through a network of 46 national veterinary associations or chambers in 39 countries. FE embraces also four sections, each one of which represents a vital part of the profession, namely the practitioners, the hygienists, the veterinary state officers, and the veterinarians working in education, research, and industry. FE mission is to enhance animal health, animal welfare, public health, and protect the environment by supporting veterinarians in delivering 
their professional responsibilities. In that respect, education and training of veterinarians and the digital transformation of both training and practice is part of our core interests. In 2020, our planet faced a big crisis, a pandemic. This forced everyone, eventually the veterinary profession as well, to find ways to cope with the new circumstances and ensure that all veterinary services will continue to run. Animal health and food supply are, after all, essential services to the human society. Quick sharing of information and all kinds of communication became remote, use of digital means exploded, webinars have become the reality, and veterinary consultations went online and the use of telemedicine increased. This led also some countries in Europe to even legally endorse this. The use of digital tools is not new in veterinary medicine. Monitoring and surveillance, precision medicine or robotics use have been extensively explored in the last decade, but has not been widely implemented in practice yet. The use of such technologies require that veterinarians acquire additional skills and knowledge, that is to say, digital skills. It is, however, nowadays that became imperative that every veterinarian gets familiar with the use of digital tools. Does it go continue well? Okay. I hope you hear me well. Some troubles with the technical. Apologies. Yeah, yes, we can, can continue. This means you can hear us and you can continue. Yeah, yeah, we can see the presentation. And apparently something happened with my... Uh, I have to get on the slide. Voila. Yes, we can control remotely if needed. Okay, so um, I'm uh, going on. Uh, we saw also during the pandemic that uh, digital training has exploded and veterinary schools were forced to go remote. The previous speaker also uh, gave more information. Academics and students had to continue online and realized how important uh, is that digital competencies become part of the core curriculum. At the same time, veterinarians have seen an opportunity in acquiring new knowledge and skills via online training for their professional development. Such training is often easier to follow. For example, one can take it from any place, in flexible hours and at their own pace. And often it is also affordable, more affordable, by saving travel costs for physical presence or by being available even for free. As a result, veterinarians find clearly interesting the use of new technologies and see prospects in increasing preparedness and resilience in both peace or crisis times. However, the use uh, of new technologies, both in practice and for training purposes, needs a more careful consideration as it requires special infrastructure, which is not yet accessible to everyone, especially out of the developed world. It requires some minimum skills, which is not the case for all. Uh, it is not only inequalities among populations worldwide, but also generation gaps that impact the development of such skills. Young generations are almost natives to the use of new technologies, while older ones struggle often to get used to these new practices. Further to this, there are still open issues regarding the use of uh, those tools, both in veterinary practice and for training purposes, which need to be addressed and regulated as well. These are, for example, the validation of these novel tools, 
the data ownership and data management, the ontology and the ethics around them. The situation is not always clear, that is to say, it is not just black or white. I recall the example of the FE position on telemedicine, which led to some controversial discussions among our members until it was finalized. Very valid comments uh, on opportunities and threats were raised uh, during those discussions among our profession. These are all issues that have been acknowledged as well by the stakeholders in the report that uh, was presented by the Special Working Group of the European uh, Coordinating Committee on Veterinary Training. This is a committee formed by representatives of the profession, uh, of academia, veterinary specialists and students. If we briefly summarize our experience from the use of digital training in the last two years, we see that uh, it certainly creates opportunities, but at the same time, uh, it encompasses some important challenges. While it can increase access to CPD for more veterinarians, even those who are uh, residing in remote areas, at the same time, it requires special equipment, namely a computer or a smartphone and a good internet connection, which is not affordable or accessible for everyone. While it helps developing digital skills, a minimum competence in using these tools is a prerequisite to be able to join such a training. In addition, while a plethora of on online CPDs are available worldwide, it is often difficult for veterinarians to know about the quality of training and select the right one for them, the right program for them. It is often difficult to get recognition also of the acquired skills or qualifications achieved online. That are important elements for the profession that show clearly that uh, there is a need for quality assurance of veterinary digital training and also uh, for accreditation. The European Union has developed a digital education action plan and recently proposed uh, a system of micro-credentials for lifelong learning and employability. This is a framework based on a set of 10 principles encompassing, among others, the need for quality, transparency and recognition uh, of this training to be applicable to any kind of CPD. While this is not specifically intended for veterinary CPD, or even not precisely for veterinary digital CPD training, it can be relevant for this as well, and therefore it is a good example framework to be considered. In conclusion, digital training for continuous professional development does offer opportunities for digital transformation of veterinary practice. Digital transformation of veterinary practice is ongoing and can be of value both in peace and crisis periods, but needs to be promoted and supported. Policy makers and all stakeholders have an important role there. Quality assurance and accreditation of online CPD, as well as recognition of the acquired qualifications, are of major importance for veterinarians and all professionals. And with this, thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to uh, the further discussion. Thanks a lot, um, Dr. Yadridu. And I'm just quickly checking if there is any question from the audience. We can discuss it during the panel discussion, and we can move on uh, to the next presentation. So again, uh, we are uh, following uh, in uh, digital, in a virtual format, and this time uh, I'm handing over to another topic that we just uh, anticipated, that uh, um, was anticipated during the, our initial uh, presentation, and it's about virtual reality. This is the first of um, 
other presentations about virtual reality and a poster that we all also have about a, a virtual reality project de developed by um, the University of Surrey and Royal Veterinary College. It's one of the key topics at the moment. Other universities, for example, Edinburgh, are doing uh, many interesting projects uh, in virtual reality, but now we are moving to Australia and specifically to Dr. Cory Crotton, who's working in the epidemiology and one health section in the biosecurity animal division of the Australian government, Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. And uh, his presentation is about the application of virtual reality to food and mouth disease education. Handing over to you. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, very much thanks to all the speakers before me, who's really set the stage for this presentation. I very, very much appreciate that. Um, just before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors up there, and also just the traditional owners of the land which I'm speaking from, which is the Ngunnawal people. Um, so as previously mentioned, um, I'm just doing a presentation here on the application of virtuality to uh, FMD education. Sweet. Okay, so what's the intent of this uh, of this uh, training project? Well, the intent was really to be a pilot example of virtual reality training for one species, uh, cattle, and one disease. No prizes for that one, uh, FMD. And the aim was really to have some, some high quality sample experiences uh, rather than full training modules. And based on these elements of the existing EU FMD, it's a real time and virtual training. So what we're really trying to do is, is ascertain how virtual reality can support these traditional forms of animal biosecurity training. I mean, it seems obvious there are limitations to real life training, things like resourcing and, and travel and that sort of thing. There's obvious limitations to a traditional web-based virtual training. So we kind of see you know, how we can sort of fit within those and, and bridge those limitations. So there's two phases to this particular uh, project. A phase one was really that early pilot report um, to ascertain how VR could support existing FMD training with that te technology at the time. Um, and a, the, so phase two uh, improved on that phase one experience um, just to upgrade, upgrade the suit, the sort of much improved uh, MetaQuest 2 technology, which it's a vastly improved headset. Um, and also we added some refinement based on feedback on phase one and also added the ability for multiplayer. So two people to be in the, in the same virtual space at the same time, although physically uh, in a different location. All right then, so the phase two uh, pilot virtuality experience trials. Um, so it's, as I said before, it's the experience on the MetaQuest 2 uh, with four upgraded scenes and a multiplayer experience. So these were uh, setting up a biosecurity control point, uh, interviewing a property manager, examination of livestock suspected of having FMD and of taking of laboratory samples of livestock again suspected of having FMD. So trials are being conducted right now within EU FMD and Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. They're still ongoing. And we expect about maybe 20, probably up to 30 people are expected to trial the experience initially. And a variety of people with, uh, with different backgrounds and experience uh, in ex assessing uh, FMD suspect animals. And during the, so the, the, the participant uh, undergoes a trial, uh, usually a 10 to 20 minute trial, uh, using experience and then they fill out a fairly detailed questionnaire. Uh, basically covering such things as the uh, the best use case for virtual reality training for, uh, for animal biosecurity training, things like comfort, things like suggested improvements and that sort of thing. Really just trying to get some feedback from you know, actual users as to where we go from here with virtual reality training. Okay, so the, uh, the early findings. Um, so the pilot, the pilot successfully demonstrated some many core aspects of virtual reality for animal biosecurity training. So uh, including getting familiar with sort of hands-on biosecurity tasks and interacting with this 2D and 3D content in a VR environment. And it identified some opportunities and barriers for virtual reality training. And some of them are fairly obvious, uh, sort of alluded to before by some of the previous speakers. This is varying level of familiarity, familiarity with virtual reality and the varying levels of tolerance to discomfort associated with wearing headset, especially as you increase these sessions in length as well. Um, so there's sort of a trade-off between this increased immersion using virtual reality technology and this unfamiliarity and discomfort using the, 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 the technology as well. Um, some of the sort of notable uses, use cases we can see towards the future are these sort of um, 
repeatable mechanical biosecurity tasks, such as sort of donning the biosecurity kit um, and you know, setting up that sort of control point. And in addition to that, you know, the, the other sort of good use cases seem to be exploring existing content that is three-dimensional and also in this sort of multiplayer uh, virtual reality sort of interactions. Um, so the trials and the feedback and the questionnaires will feed into a report that we're aiming to publish in early 2023. So this report is expected to be published on the departmental website uh, and it's a follow-up to an existing report. Um, we have this existing uh, virtual reality support FMD training document. Um, and this report really, we're aiming this to be a, a guide for animal biosecurity training organisations and really those who are considering how they can use uh, virtual reality to support their current training and some examples of items that will be addressed in the report um, is specific cases where VR virtual reality is most useful to supplement uh, online and real training. Um, how virtual reality can be used to interact with existing 2D and 3D training content. Um, and also the expected virtual reality and augmented reality technology improvements in that five to 10 year mark of the medium term. And Given that the fact that we expect these technologies to improve over time, um, just judging by the sort of trajectory and how much, how many, how sort of companies like Meta have taken this stuff forward, it really comes down to this question of what can be done to prepare and make you best use of these uh, technological improvements. Now, this this report will also feed into decision making as the next steps following from the pilot experience. And animal biosecurity is quite a specific case of virtual reality training with its own specific opportunities and challenges. It does tend to require a considered approach and uh, this approach will likely change in the long term. Um, however, the technology to us appears to be stable with sort of more incremental improvements uh, in the medium term. I'm not sure what's going on there, but anyway, thanks very much for uh, listening to my presentation. I'm very much hoping the slides actually covered, came along with me for the ride, but, but thanks very much regardless. And thanks a lot, Dr. Cory Croton. Uh, there was a, a very nice presentation. And um, Buddha Silvia, I guess uh, we can uh, just uh, Mm, ask for the questions from Katarina. Do you have for the comments? Uh, can we go ahead? Katarina, can you hear us? Uh, do you have any comments on the presentation so far? Thank you very much. I'm just trying to turn everything on again. Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, these presentations, and and I'm looking forward also to the discussion on on the, on the panel. Uh, I I learned already a lot online, so I think uh, our digital learning format works uh, really well as as far as I'm concerned. This this afternoon, and and I think uh, uh, many uh, relevant topics were already raised. Um, uh, particularly, I'm interested in the aspect of um, quality assurance and uh, how online learning can also contribute to, to formal qualifications and degrees. And this obviously is also relates to Christine's um, presentation on use of digital learning in, in veterinary um, degrees where there is also um, online assessment involved. That's a good question, uh, Katarina. We can uh, try to hand it over this question to Dr. Yatridu. Dr. Yatridu, can you hear us? Uh, meanwhile, uh, we can alert the audience to just kindly prepare the questions. I see some uh, hands raised. So, Dr. Yatridu, can you hear us? Uh, what about this, uh, this comment from Katarina? Indeed, uh, I think that uh, accreditation is a, a very useful uh, tool for uh, uh, education because it, it can help ensure the quality of provided training. Uh, that means that uh, it ensures that the training can guarantee 
uh, the minimum learning uh, outcomes, the uh, standard uh, to, to these learning outcomes. And uh, eventually that can bring transparency on the market of training, let's say, and <coughs> can also facilitate uh, as a result, recognition of competence, uh, competences achieved through that uh, training and uh, further to that recognition of qualifications. And that is very important because when uh, a student or a, a practitioner, when we refer for CPD, uh, takes such a training, uh, their main interest is to be able to to use this qualification afterwards to present uh, the, uh, proof of the, uh, the skills they learn and to be recognized by their statutory bodies and to be able to market as well uh, as much as possible himself about these new uh, skills and competencies that uh, they have achieved. So eventually digital education follow the same principles. Uh, they should uh, encompass quality assurance and uh, encompass uh, accreditation. Uh, and in that respect, um, the accreditation frameworks should consider specific requirements and standards of digital uh, education as well. That's some first reflections. Thanks a lot, Dr. Yatridou. And uh, I see one hand raised from the audience. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, James Wood from the STC and from Cambridge University is my day job. Uh, I think that the last answer has very clearly articulated the uh, inescapable connection between accreditation and quality assurance. But I think, which is really important, um, I think one of the things, though, um, that we don't really uh, have a full understanding of um, or at least I don't have a full understanding of, and I don't know if, if the panel could help elaborate on this, is how we actually assess. So, you know, you can jump straight to quality assurance and accreditation, but actually it's the assessment of both online training, and in particular where the online training is directed towards practical skills. And I think that that's an, that's an area that we... That we I think importantly need to focus on in this sort of discussion because my own personal belief is while online training um, and actually distinctly online education are invaluable and should be uh, embedded in all of our educational systems, I think the issue of assessment um, actually is much more, and, and those cannot, cannot and should not be separated from, um, from quality assurance of, this, of that um, and from accreditation. I think it's the actual assessment itself and how we do that best that we have um, still some way to go. Yeah. And I, but I, uh, please, um, please educate me and tell me that, about many, the many things I don't know in this regard because I, because I think this is a challenging area that needs much more work. I think we know how to, to accredit and quality assure systems. I'm not sure that we quite, we quite understand how to assess adequately all of these systems in a reproducible way. Yeah, thank you very much, um, our presenters and the panelists, and all of us, the audience, who have been part of this afternoon. I would like to say that what we are discussing uh, is a very pertinent topic that is uh, promising to change the way we do things, uh, the way veterinary education has been done for many centuries. Um, I would like to recall that there was a time uh, when it was possible for experts to travel to some of our countries, for instance, in my university in Uganda, and spend years building capacity. Then there was a time when uh, a number of young um, researchers, scientists, would be supported to travel with their families and stay 10 years in Europe, 8, 10 in Europe, uh, United States of America, building capacity, and then they will come back to Africa. But given where we are coming from after the pandemic, 
we were reminded that it will not always be possible to always transport physical people, physical expertise from one area of the world to another. So as we discuss digital learning, I'm looking at it as a, a paradigm shift, as a tool that is going to help us to continue with capacity development at all times, in all situations, in different zones, regardless of the different limitations and barriers that we have. No doubt we need to build capacity in the animal health sector if we are, if we are to address uh, foot and mouth disease and the other similar transmound animal diseases. So as we interact with the presentations that we've just had, let us bear some of those uh, observations in mind. And I would like to encourage us to uh, have some more questions from the audience, uh, the physical audience. And after that, uh, my colleague will uh, bring us the questions from the online audience. Uh, so here, uh, Kristen is here with us. And the, um, our other presenters, our other panelists are online waiting to answer all our questions. So you are most welcome. Let's have more questions from uh, the physical audience. I'm sure Filippo is around to move the mic. Uh, there is a hand from Fabrizio from that corner. Uh, the rest of us can be preparing our questions as well. You, you can go ahead. I'm, I don't know if it is the same or similar question that James just, just, just uh, uh, asked, but I want, uh, my question is, um, is there an assessment of the effectiveness of uh, digital learning versus you know face to face learning uh, in uh, in the in uh, in um, with regards to the impact so with regards to the capacity to different methodologies uh, mm -hmm. to to develop skills and and capacities i think that very much depends also on the audience on the willing willingness to learn from the audience and the experience that we have is that for example delivering a virtual training that can reach a, a wider uh, audience in an emergency situation, there is a, a lot of uptake, there is a lot of completion rate versus other, other uh, scenarios. So my question is, is there any study or comparison between uh, the two methodology for deliver, for example, uh, same training? Can I speak to that? Um, thanks for the question. And, and equally, thanks, James, for your question, because I think the two are, are linked. And it is true, assessment remains, a, remains difficult when it comes to, to online education. But I think some of the difficulty relates to the fact that we're still imagining assessment to be what we've always thought it to be. Um, uh, and, and what has happened is that, essentially, we think that we can teach online the things that we taught face to face before and assess them in the same way that, you know, that we did when, when we were teaching um, them face to face. But what needs to happen is that we need to assess them differently to, you know, to make up for or to account for the different way of learning and the different transmission of the learning. And we haven't made enough progress with that. You know, and, and that remains a difficulty, particularly where we've come to the practical skills I think we don't quite know how to assess practical skills very well digitally, and, and that's in a, in a subject area like veterinary medicine or any of the other um, you know, very practical areas of, of education. Those are still difficulties. But you know, I think increasingly pedagogy is changing and we're understanding more about what we need to assess and, and in order to really be able to to, to be sure that somebody has the competency that you want them to have. So that is a work in progress, but I think we need to change our mindset around what we're assessing and how we're assessing it. And in answer to your question, Fabrizio, I think as far as I'm aware, there isn't, nobody has done a, a, a sort of a comparator to see if, you know, which works better uh, uh, online or face-to-face -face or how those two different types of assessment work. As far as I'm aware, nobody has really tried to, 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 com to compare them. And I think they're just two quite different things in some ways. Perhaps the panel has other reflections on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I think that has been uh, well addressed. So we can have the next question. Probably we can start from right here. And then after that, we'll move to. OK, it's fine. 
After that, you'll move to the close to the aisle here. Hello. Hello, Go ahead. Hello, Noelia Justa from University of Glasgow. Um, so my question is a follow-up on that. We have worked on the development of the digital avatar, mm -hmm. and this is something that we're looking at whether the students um, do better by working on a virtual environment yeah. and then going to the avatar or going to the avatar and then doing the digital avatar or not doing it at all. So watch the space. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. Yeah. Uh, and then I have a question because I think uh, I would like to know your opinion and whether there is a difference between building confidence using virtual reality and developing assess competence. Because to me, virtual reality is all about building confidence and feeling that when you are facing the real situation, you know how to react yeah. at least. It's about that experience mm -hmm. of yeah. no taking you aback if talking about avatars, if you've ever been there those first 20 minutes exactly. where you don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, is it different or both of them are, both, both of them things are complementing each other? Right. Well, Maybe I can try to uh, elaborate. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm addressing a question, an answer to this question, uh, but I'm going to try to elaborate linking with the previous question from uh, James Woods. So, from uh, my point of view, uh, one key team is trying to disconnect uh, the um, methodology from the competency. And um, why I'm doing that? Uh, is it just intentional? Uh, I mean, uh, if we are thinking about uh, assessing competencies, uh, then the uh, methodological uh, um, the, mm, technology that we use uh, might eventually be secondary. Uh, of course, I have a, a specific um, perspective and second part uh, will introduce uh, one of our tools, uh, the training management system called TOM, uh, which is based on a competency-based approach. But if we, if we are aiming to do that, basically if we are aiming to assess competencies, also we can uh, find a way to focus on the evaluation of practical skills, the evaluation of the performance, of veterinarians, and then followingly, in a, following a sort of backward approach, uh, focus on which is the best methodology. Um, that's a, just a suggestion. Uh, maybe that's uh, not sure the, how much is, is an answer to your question. Thank you. I hope that has addressed your question. We have um, the next question from here. Sorry, I can't see the names. Yes, hello. <coughs> Kees van Manen. Um, I would like to go on with that uh, discussion about assessment and so on, especially the virtual reality. And maybe Dr. Croton can uh, comment on that also. Uh, I tried it once. I was not very good in it, I must <laughs> <laughs> confess. Uh, but my main question would be, to what extent can it replace the real experience or can it only be used as a sort of induction? because uh, uh, many vet schools in the Netherlands, for example, they are struggling with enough patient contacts for the students. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm a bit old-fashioned. I think it's very important that there are enough contacts uh, uh, with real animals and not only mm -hmm. with virtual animals. So I would like to know, how do you see this, this, this virtual training as, as part of the vet, the practical veterinary experience that students need? Sure, I'd be happy to answer. I would like to invite, uh, is somebody already answering? I wanted to invite uh, Croton, who is uh, one of our panelists, who is online. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Oscar. I assume you guys can hear me. Aida oh, can see me as well. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, great question. Um, there's actually two parts. I did want to also talk about the capacity to um, understand whether someone's become competent or just confident as well, because there's certain unique things about virtual reality that um, lend itself in principle to be good at, not say good, but there's some certain things you can do with virtual reality um, for assessing competence as well as confidence. And I, I guess I'll just answer that one first and I'll answer Oscar's one about where I think it fits in. So in principle, and every time we're talking about in principle right now, with virtual reality, you could, could potentially track someone's physical actions in the virtual world. So in principle, 
um, you can, again, in principle, track someone's competency at some virtual interaction or some virtual um, virtual tasks that would be very difficult to track in you know, a normal web-based training. So in principle, that's possible. It's not something we've explored in depth, but a little bit too far for sort of the current technology and where we're at. Um, the, the other thing, I guess, is as far as there being sort of comparisons of, um, of the use of VR versus something else, I'm not aware of that happening in the veterinary world. But there's a fairly well-known case now in, with, medic, with surgery, with human surgery. Um, the company is claiming that they're making quite significant advances by training surgeons. These are surgeons, I believe, who've done their residency uh, in as specialist surgeons in human medicine, and they do a certain very high quality, very expensive virtual reality training. And they're claiming that they're having quite significant improvements in terms of quality, quantitative things, uh, such as you know time in surgery and, and, and that sort of thing. So not in veterinary, but in, in medicinal practice, there does seem to be some comparison. They seem promising, but this is a much higher standard than what we have now, besides virtual reality training. Um, as far as asking this question about whether it replaces, um, virtual can replace real, I guess these days, I don't think about it quite in that fashion anymore. Um, because to be frank, the technology is not at that level at this point. Five to 10 years from now, might very well be like that. But what I really see virtual reality is doing is saying, okay, You've got existing web-based training um, that you're, you're doing. So you might be doing a series of questionnaires, but might, might be doing pathology practice. You might have a classroom, a web-based kind of classroom, right? Um, then, so I should be looking here, but you might have, you might have like a sort of a web-based classroom where you're teaching people about say anatomy and you would have that, that normal sort of virtual experience. Now the problem of course is, is that the gap between doing a virtual experience and doing a real one is really big because it's much, much harder to do a, virtual, a real experience. So there's really a big gap between what you can teach in a two-dimensional kind of flat world and what you can do in, uh, you know, in the real world, just because of the resource and cost of doing the real world stuff. So what virtual reality is for me at this point in time is a case of going, okay, let's look at what teaching, what stuff we're teaching um, in the sort of, in the normal web-based training. How do we supplement that with some sort of virtual practice? So we're not, at this point, I don't think we're talking about replacing anything physical. Yeah. We're just saying, hey, we can teach this stuff online. Can we add some practical uh, sort of practical thing that's a bit better than saying watch a video, uh, but it's certainly not at this point where we might be talking about replacing actual physical things. So that's a rather long monologue. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure how you feel about that, whether that, that answers your questions or not. Thank you so much. Can we have the last question from the physical audience and then I'll hand over to Buddha to share with us the online question. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, Rita Papola Pereira from the University of Liverpool. Um, I'm not sure, sure it's a question, but rather a comment on several questions which are being asked because I'm one, I'm academic lead for one of the years and COVID posed a lot of challenges, especially in relation to assessment because we have the accreditors and how do we prove, one of the challenges is proving that the students were producing their own work, so, and they weren't using information behind them. And so full work, their own work, and not having any aids in their doing that work. So I think a lot of it comes to down to redesigning that yeah. uh, assessment. Exactly. So that is, for instance, is not asking about factual uh, material yeah. but rather the application and that comes into also the questions you were asking about before in terms of how do you assess the, um, the student can apply the knowledge by d redesigning the questions you're kind of doing that and also depending on the aims of your uh, of your training you can assess other things like for instance if your training targets um, how to record certain things in a um, and the management uh, data, you can assess how that recording has changed following the training. Um, so it's kind of just those things, sorry, I made notes so I didn't forget what I was going on about. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, the things that you can change in terms of how you assess is do producing viable-like assessment, so more of a yeah. discussion rather than just one size fits all. Thank you so much. Let me thank you for the comment. Let me request the uh, Buddha to uh, take over and share with us the questions that are coming from the online audience. OK, 
Okay. okay. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia. Thanks very much uh, for uh, for this uh, interesting discussion. Um, I, my colleagues uh, telling me that we have more than 600 people watching us online, which is a good example of uh, digitalization that we are talking about here. So I would like to ask. Uh, uh, my colleagues to to uh, to demonstrate the questions. We have received a number of questions uh, from our audience online. Um, so the first one, I, I I read it out, and then I'll ask uh, the, our panelists uh, to 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 please to elaborate on those. The first question is uh, to uh, to uh, Christine. How can micro credentials enhance the future of veterinary education? Maybe you want to to start elaborating on that. Well, I think micro-credentials are, at the moment, a difficult prospect for veterinary education, um, as we know it, in, when, when we think about, for instance, training an undergraduate for an undergraduate veterinary degree. Um, but perhaps when we, if we look beyond that, you can imagine how we might allow practitioners to, to access little bits of training and, and to build onto those in order to, to achieve different levels, higher levels of, of, um, of, of competence, if you like, or different awards, for instance, using micro-credentials. Micro so um, you can imagine a qualified vet who is a practitioner might be able to do small bits of learning in different areas which are accredited, which are you know, recognized, and building on those to, to achieve a postgraduate diploma, for example, and, and, and so on. So, at the moment, that seems to me to be the most practical, obvious way that micro-credentials would work for veterinary education. I do think if veterinary education, right from the start, was willing to be a bit more adventurous and, and to really just flip things over and change, change the way in which the curriculum is looked at, and of course this rests with the accreditors and so on, and it's not an easy proposition, I think there is potential as well, looking at that undergraduate veterinary training for vet students, perhaps after the first two preclinical years or whatever number of preclinical years or whatever, to learn different types of things and, and again, to have those little bits of micro-credentials to build upon to form their veterinary degree. But uh, I think it's right to say we're not there yet. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you so much uh, for, for your uh, answers on, on that. Uh, our second question is uh, to Dr. Uh, Yatri Dirudu. Our continuous professional development provides ac providers across Europe in intensifies enough, incentivize enough, sorry, uh, enough digital education from your perspective. Dr. Uh, Yatri Dirudu, if, if you heard the question, please elaborate on that. Uh, thank you very much. Before going on with this question, I would like to make a short comment on the previous one about the micro-credentials. And uh, I would like to bring another dimension as well. We speak very much uh, lately about interdisciplinary education and about one health education, and the veterinary profession is quite a leader in uh, implementation of One Health, we would say, but still we need a lot about um, uh, achieving an interdisciplinary uh, and intersectoral education. micro could be also relevant for different professions and could help each one of the professionals to achieve um, knowledge in different areas that each of their interest and somehow uh, build also their profile. So it may uh, be relevant and uh, provide opportunities also for different kind of development, if we can say so. Um, with regard to the other question, I'm not sure that I got the point uh, completely well. Uh, is my, my understanding is what uh, our profession, by, what our federation does to promote digital training. Um, so if that is the case, um, as a fee, we, we have it as one of our priorities to promote uh, dig digitalization of the profession, uh, as uh, said also before. So in that respect, we, we very much promote uh, the, the need for digital education as well. Of course, that doesn't mean that digital education will replace 
uh, practicals, but it's an additional tool to help veterinarians build their competencies and to help them achieving the, uh, the right uh, uh, skills that it's necessary for uh, providing better services. Uh, so, in that respect, we are uh, very much in favor of digital education. We, we all of us profit from digital opportunities. We see benefits, but as um, said, uh, we are still somehow at the beginning. We were forced uh, through the pandemic to learn by experience but we're not there. We have uh, really to have a closer look to, to see how to do it better. It was mentioned before by the audience how to assess online. So these are all aspects that we have to, to look at, in, uh, investigate, find uh, a methodology, validate our methodologies, validate our tools. So there is a lot of work that we can do ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Yatrido, for your complete answer. Uh, we, we are uh, getting closer to, to the end of this uh, session, but I would like uh, to ask Dr. Croton maybe uh, provide us a brief answer to the last question. Will this virtual reality tool be publicly available for training in the future? And how do you in, envisage or, or envision it uh, to be used in the future? Uh, Dr. Croton, please. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so the short answer is, um, if everything goes well internally and with the trials, I, I'm hoping to put it up on a, a MetaQuest um, early access store so people can have a look at it. Um, as far as where it goes in the future, really what we're doing is doing the trials and hopefully putting it up for, um, for that public use and then getting everybody's feedback and really um, taking a moment to pause after, doing, after writing the report on what we've got from the feedback and really deciding what elements would be used towards the future. So we're sort of just looking to that first checkpoint of get the um, get it up on an early access store, write this report about how it works. And really the aim of what we're doing is not so much creating experience for the world. We're really just trying to show people what's possible so that existing training organisations can then look at this and go, okay, what content do we have and how would that work with virtual reality so other people kind of can take their own training organize their own sort of training material and, um, and work out how to use virtual reality best with it uh, rather than just using the cookie, cookie cutter thing of saying, hey, this is the experience, you know, use this kind of thing. Hopefully that answers the question. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Croton. So with that, uh, we finish the, the questions from, from our audience online. We get back to uh, Silvia for some, some concluding remarks and then possibly to uh, Dr. Stark. Okay, I would like to say this has been uh, very resourceful for me um, because of the, the work that I'm doing for the EFMD currently is focusing on continuing professional uh, development. And we could not train physically all those that applied uh, to participate in the training is organized by the project. But we will have a bigger number that will be trained using the online uh, platform but also as someone who has been um, working in the academia at Macquarie University for, uh, for about 15 years, I have seen uh, increasingly the need for us to be able to, uh, to train or to learn uh, digitally because sometimes it's not always possible. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, it was already becoming increasingly difficult to always get uh, expertise or experts uh, coming in whenever we needed them. Because it's becoming costly, but also uh, sometimes also those opportunities may not exist. And also moving, uh, for instance, young uh, researchers or scientists from our developing countries to the developed world is also becoming uh, challenging and costly and sometimes unrealistic especially in the face of the growing uh, bioterrorism threats and others. I have been to many universities across the world. Sometimes it's not uh, possible to get access to a lab in every country where you go. There are certain labs that are really controlled and not everybody can come in. However, when it comes to the digital learning, people are very generous. Many people are willing to share all the best that they have. So personally, I, we are discussing something that 
I already have a utility for, and I already have a lot of hope that uh, going forward, it will be a major uh, tool that is going to help us in what we'd like to do in research, in academia, but also international development like the UFMD is involved in. So I'm sure we are discussing something that is realistic, that's applicable. We're not just discussing something for the sake of discussing. That's how I feel, and I hope you feel, uh, you feel the same as we end this session. So I'd like to invite you before, maybe I hand over to uh, Marcella to send us for break. I would like, uh, on behalf of my colleagues here, I would like to request us to put our hands together and applaud and appreciate our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Also, uh, before we close, I want to remind everyone that we are going to have a group picture uh, just before coffee. So please uh, uh, follow our, my colleagues uh, to take that picture. I suppose it's not a digital photo, as you said. <laughs> but, uh, well, and then we resume uh, to the next uh, session at uh, 20 past four. Thank you. Great.
Dear colleagues, dear attendants, we are ready to start the second part. Thanks a lot. So for the second part, uh, we're going to have uh, a higher number of presentations, uh, and uh, we are going to alternate, uh, as usual, with, uh, between uh, virtual and in presence. But before we start, uh, I would like to check with, uh, uh, with Katarina Stark if there is any question, uh, if there is any comment uh, to introduce uh, the second part uh, of the session. Katarina. A bit late, uh, I think I will hold my questions uh, for later. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Digitalization, but we're still late and uh, still coping with the same uh, <laughs> bad habits. Before we get started, uh, let me all remind all people in the uh, physical room that we have uh, a dinner kindly offered by Beringer Ingelheim. Uh, you can register for uh, this dinner on uh, tonight, uh, and the registration is in the same room of the coffee uh, room on the opposite side, just, okay? So please do not forget about this one. Buddha, Silvia, uh, any comments uh, before we progress with the presentations? No, no comment for now. No, not for me. Let's, let's go to the presentations. For the second part, uh, uh, we are going uh, to start with uh, uh, one of the topics that uh, we're introducing during our very first presentation, uh, and uh, it's linked with peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. More specifically, uh, Professor Kevin Bardosh will introduce uh, uh, about uh, the social learning. Professor Kevin Bardosh uh, is a professor from uh, the university, the School of Public Health uh, in uh, Washington, the state of Washington, Seattle, so connecting at a very early time, and uh, Edinburgh Medical School. His presentation, the title of his presentation is Trust and Social Learning in the Veterinary Sectors Perspectives from the Social Sciences. And this is breaking the ice for the second part where we are going to focus on more strategic matters on how digitalization and innovation in veterinary education are heading for the, the next years. So I'm leaving the floor to Professor Kevin Bardosh for his keynote presentation. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, great. And uh, on my slides, I don't see my slides uh, there. There we go, wonderful. So hello everyone. Sorry I'm not with you in person. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, or rather instead of talking about digitalization and instead of talking specifically about social learning as a, as a sort of school of techniques and theories, I'm going to um, talk about the social sciences in, in the veterinary sector and hopefully leave you with a greater appreciation of the importance of social science and, and sort of push you to think more critically about social science in your own programs, in your own uh, interventions that you're designing and in the policies that you're constructing. Uh, next slide, please. So, I work a lot in human health programs, in epidemic response, uh, endemic diseases, and I also work in, in the animal health sector. And in general, it's, it helps us to think about tensions when we do policy or, or, or intervention designs. There's always all these many, many different tensions in life, right? In the veterinary sector, when we think about policy, I like to just outline or keep in mind these five tensions that I see. One is the tension between vertical and horizontal policy. So vertical meaning you're, you're targeting one specific disease, horizontal meaning health system strengthening, you're thinking broadly about the social determinants of animal health. Number two is a tension between biomedicine and um, communities or participatory approaches. Number three is a tension between local production um, for farmers, let's say in the global south or the global north and their priorities of production versus the goals of biosecurity and export markets, et cetera. Number four is the tension between using uh, high technology or low technology 
And lastly, a tension between focusing on individuals as a node of behavior change versus thinking about systems change, which is very different. Next. Now, the social sciences is, you know, it's a very incredibly eclectic and busy uh, atmosphere of what we mean when we talk about social science. Often at conferences like this, people say, oh, you're a social scientist. And I say, oh, you're a natural scientist, right? Because that, that's a comparable terminology here. There's a lot of different disciplines, different schools of thought here. This is a scoping exercise that I was involved in a couple of years ago, right before the COVID pandemic. And we were asked by some of the major global health funders to better define how social science could be strengthened in epidemic and pandemic response. And so what we did is we, we interviewed a huge number of actors at, a, at the global and also national level. Um, and I'd like to just briefly outline that because we're planning to do a similar uh, exercise for the animal health sector at a global level. Next slide. And of course, there's so many different areas where you could apply social, social science research to promote social learning at an organizational level, um, which is really what a lot of my work is focused on. Next slide. And this is the, the basic um, schematic that we came up with for these funders. We said, if you want to improve social science capacity for epidemic response, you can do broadly, well, I think it was a, a list of like 15 or 20 things, but we divided them into three categories. First is the core response capabilities. So improving your capacity and the institutionalization of social science. So if we want to do social learning, and we recognize that social scientists have a really critical role to play there, we need to institutionalize them. You can't have an organization with uh, 100 epidemiologists and you have a part-time social scientist on your staff. That's not institutionalizing social science. Um, number two is thinking about applied and basic sciences. So where, you know, what kind of methodologies can social scientists use? How can we also integrate and find ways of doing interdisciplinary research, et cetera, et cetera. And the last one was the support of ecosystem. So having conferences, for example, was, was part of that recommendation. Next slide. And of course, there's different forms of social science engagement, right? Um, there's exploratory research where you're just trying to, you know, pass a large fishing net into the ocean of, of social life and see what comes in. There's intervention research. How can we improve interventions? How can we make them uh, more effective, um, improve participation? Um, there's systems research, looking at the governance systems themselves. Uh, there's critical research, which is more theoretical, looking at power, um, issues of inequality in decision-making politics. Um, there's also philosophical research, um, which is probably the most important area and the least important area, right? It sort of oscillates between that. Philosophical research questions our assumptions and our ways of thinking about the world. A participatory research and, and of course sort of this activism research where you're actively trying to change something according to a value-based assumption. Next slide. And as we all know, and I'm not going to read this slide, um, doing interdisciplinary research, having a social scientist and a natural scientist, or to be more specific, uh, an anthropologist and a veterinary epidemiologist work together, it's challenging. There's different incentive structures ways of talking about the same issue, um, huge number of barriers and facilitators to thinking about interdisciplinary work that needs to be considered. Next slide. So I've been involved in a lot of um, intervention research programs in the veterinary sector, um, including rabies programs in Tanzania. Next slide. Um, the control of um, <clears throat> tinea solium in Southeast Asia. Next slide. Um, high data disease in Morocco and other places. Next slide. And out of a lot of this, this intervention research, I came up with this basic framework that I published a couple of years ago. And it's, it's looking at neglected tropical diseases, but a lot of those were actually zoonotic diseases that I based this framework on. And I defined five areas where interventions are, they either become effective or less effective, right? And we see here in this domain, there's one of those, number four is this, what I call the socio-materiality of technology. So thinking about digitalization, that would be the digital tool that you're actually using in the field, whether it's a smartphone app or it's an it's online platform, et cetera. 
but you can see in the in the in the real world when we implement that, there's all these other domains that inter, uh, that influence effectiveness from the terrain of intervention, which is the actual geography that you're implementing something, um, to the, the incentive of field staff, um, governance issues, etc. So there's this complicated ecosystem of what determines effectiveness. Next slide. And part of the reason I'm presenting this today is, as I mentioned earlier, I'm involved now in leading a program that's going to be doing a similar um, activity to what we did in the human uh, health space, but also, but now for emergency response in the animal health sector. And it's called the Global Animal Health Governance Network. And I uh, encourage people in the audience that are interested in this area of integrating social science and their programs to reach out to me, because the basic um, premise that we're working from in this program is actually to improve social learning in global institutions that are doing animal health um, outbreak response. Um, so please reach out to me. Next next slide. And just briefly in the couple moments that I have left, I want to introduce two, um, two areas of research that we're focusing on uh, in this network, just to kind of give, give people a sense of what we're up to. So one is policy process analysis. And this is a great framework developed by the Institute of Development Studies in Brighton in the UK. And it's actually been used for foot and mouth disease in the past. They had a number of papers that came out looking at uh, FMD control in, in uh, Eastern Africa and also in the UK, just getting to terms with what do, we, what do we mean by the word policy, right? And how do you study policy? So they have sort of distilled this basic framework, which is quite simple to, to, to get your head around, saying policy is determined on the one hand by knowledge and discourse. So if you want to understand policy, you've got to ask the question, well, what is the policy narrative? What's included in that narrative? What's excluded? Number two are actors and networks. So each policy has a, has a range of, of actors that are, that are involved in it. And some have more power and more influence than others. And finally, uh, policy is determined by politics and interests, influence. So um, if you want to understand a policy, you've got to understand those dynamics as well. Next slide. And I'll kind of end here uh, on a, a reflection on something that's become very in vogue recently, um, which is futures thinking, foresight and futures. So I think as humans, we always uh, have this urge to try to predict the future, to understand what's coming and to make our, our, our organizations uh, more resilient for that. I mean, in, in many regards, futures thinking is the ultimate social learning tool, right? If you can anticipate the future, then you can you can equip yourself to deal with the risks and the uncertainties that are just around the corner. And I would say that we're living in a time where the notion of uncertainty and risk and un instability and chaos is sort of uh, permeating our discourse, uh, our social discourse. Next slide. And so when we think about futures, um, there's a couple of important components to keep in mind. One is that the future is inherently uncertain. Nobody can tell the future. When you're engaging in futures thinking, you're engaging in imagination, you're imagining possibilities. And typically these techniques um, are done in a participatory way where you get different people together. So the range of folks that you have in a room are gonna determine the, the ability to imagine those possibilities. And this is an important point is you're not predicting anything. Prediction is a different art of mathematical models. People are trying to predict things. This is anticipatory. So we talk about futures with an S and not the future. Next slide. Um, and so really the, the aim of futures thinking or a scenario planning, which is one component, is to get to terms with, with an integrated view of the different drivers that are influencing the present and how, how they're going to unravel into the future. Next slide. And there's a number of techniques. Scenario planning is one of them, where you create these four quadrants um, and you explore different dynamics of change over time. Next slide. And one, one of the core points here of another word for futures thinking is foresight, um, is to improve the policy cycle. So you can see here on the slide, the red is the improvement of what a foresight um, a approach to a policy intervention and policy evaluation would add to the to the situation. Next slide. And there's a huge range of different methodologies that you can use here, and including quantitative techniques. Um, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but here's just sort of a, an overview of the range of methods that are available for for futures research. Next, next slide. And 
the animal health sector and the veterinary sector has have been interested in this. So there's been a program at FAO um, focused specifically on Africa and the livestock se sector. And also in uh, AMR, um, there's been an interest in, in expanding or thinking somewhat about future scenario uh, methodologies which in, within uh, ongoing uh, situational analysis tools. Next, next slide. Um, this is a, a, a manual that we developed to to integrate um, futures thinking in the AMR sector in or the in AMR in the livestock sector. And the reason I'm presenting this at the end is just to our review of um, futures thinking uh, really identified a pretty big shortcoming, which is a lot of these techniques, because they're imaginative, you end up with these sort of highly speculative futures. And when you leave these workshops, you're not really sure, um, from the position that you're sitting, how you can improve your policies in the present. So there's this big focus on possibilities into the future, rather than thinking about the constraints, the policy constraints and the intervention constraints in the present. Next slide. So our approach to futures thinking, um, next slide, this is just focused on AMR, um, is to integrate futures thinking within the normal um, range of methods that are used to evaluate and design policy. Um, so to, to, to include that as one component of this broader policy analysis. Next slide. So again, this is something that we're developing as part of this new network, and I encourage you all to get in touch with me, and I, I hope that you learned something. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Kevin Bardosh. Uh, I believe that this speech was very inspiring and uh, set the stage for uh, the second part with a, very, uh, a lot of strategic questions. I can ask in the audience to think about your, the questions you want to raise. We can uh, have a, a, a question and answer later during the panel where Professor Kevin Bardos can address them and the invite is of course extended to those online. Before we get to the next presentation, uh, I also want to acknowledge two colleagues. Uh, we are getting now to a presentation by a colleague from the European Commission for the Control of the Food and Mouth Disease. But there are two colleagues more who participated in the development of this session, Charlotte Rendina and Rodrigo Nova. I want to acknowledge them for their contribution, specifically for uh, the preparation of this uh, last session, uh, last presentation delivered by Professor Kevin Bardas. So before we get uh, to the next presentation, let me just introduce uh, our uh, next speaker. Uh, his name is uh, Sheu Samsuden, and uh, Sheu uh, is a veterinary officer uh, at the UFMD. And uh, in this presentation, uh, we'll introduce uh, the, a very important perspective linked with uh, uh, inclusivity, uh, with uh, a topic that we anticipated uh, during our very first presentation today. And uh, the title of this presentation is Animal Health Service Needs Assessment Study in Nigeria. That said, I'm uh, handing over to Sheu Samsuden, who's joining us virtually. Sheu. Hey. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or uh, good evening. I am glad to, to be joining you from Nigeria. And I bring you good tidings from the people of Nigeria. Uh, so. Can I have my slide on? Okay, so uh, so uh, as rightly introduced, I am a veterinarian uh, by training and I'm currently the country coordinator for an EU funded project in Nigeria uh, called uh, Sustainable Business in Animal Health through training of veterinary paraprofessionals. And uh, next slide. And this uh, project is uh, a collaboration between the EU FMB uh, the World Veterinary Association and Health for Animals. And basically, so, so I'll be sharing learnings from a needs assessment study that we conducted in order to, to get insight on how to properly develop, uh, you know, an intervention targeted at veterinary paraprofessionals uh, in two pilot states uh, in Nigeria. Next slide. Yeah, so, so just like I said earlier, the, the project is sponsored by UFMB World Veterinary Association and Health for Animals. And the idea is to 
support uh, the capacity of veterinary paraprofessionals to be able to, you know, uh, to to improve uh, access to animal health services, especially by smallholder farmers uh, in pilot states in Nigeria. And to, to begin that in the intervention, we have to carry out uh, a needs assessment. Uh, the needs assessment, it's, it's kind of broader needs assessment, uh, not only focusing on the digital learning part, which I'm going to present on, but also touches area around the business environment for veterinary paraprofessionals in Nigeria, uh, as well as also uh, the competencies that needed to be built uh, for this uh, group of uh, veterinary paraprofessionals. But uh, my presentations will focus mostly on the training modalities. So, and that's where the digital or online uh, training modalities, uh, you know, uh, actually comes up. Uh, so, so the, 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 our, our study was conducted in pilot state, or your state and Kaduna states uh, in Nigeria, and largely using a gender lens to view, you know, some of uh, the drivers uh, that will determine training or learning modalities by, by these VPPs that were building uh, the project for next slide. Yeah, so, so in this design, uh, just like I mentioned earlier, pilot state of Oyo and Kaduna state. Oyo state is in southern part of Nigeria. Uh, Kaduna state is in the northern part of Nigeria. Both states have good population of livestock uh, farmers, especially smallholder farmers. And they are also very good, uh, you know, offer good business environments for veterinary paraprofessionals to be able to practice. And of course, that is why we have a high density or high number of veterinary paraprofessionals in those two states, uh, mostly practicing, uh, you know, uh, from the private sector. Uh, so the, the study design used uh, both uh, a survey, a telephone survey uh, to get quantitative data from uh, selected veterinary paraprofessionals, as well as also a focus group discussion using participatory rural appraisal approach to to have these in-depth discussions uh, with uh, 78 veterinary paraprofessionals for us to be able to basically understand which learning modalities would they prefer vis-a-vis face-to-face learning or online and even online or digital learning, what specific uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, approach would they prefer when uh, they have to, when they want to have such kind of, uh, I mean, training uh, being, uh, I mean, involving them. So um, uh, we, we surveyed 150 by telephone and 40% of them are female. So females, VPPs are well represented in this study. Also of the 78 uh, that we also had a focus group discussions with, uh, more than 40% are also female uh, VPPs practicing in those two states. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what, what did we find? Um, a lot of interesting findings uh, from these studies, but I, I'll just summarize the key ones that are relevant to, uh, you know, uh, building, you know, a digital learning platform, especially when you consider veterinary paraprofessionals. Uh, and for context, veterinary paraprofessionals are kind of lower kind of last mile, uh, you know, service providers within the animal health sector, uh, lower than the professional veterinarians themselves but they are also in high, large, large number in Nigeria because they are much, even much more closer to small older farmers uh, than veterinarians uh, due to limited number of veterinarians uh, in Nigeria. So what are the outcomes? What did we find? So we, we asked them, wanted to find out uh, their pre preference for face-to-face -face study vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, online training modality. And we found a variable, you know, uh, kind of responses, but largely what we what we discover is that a uh, majority of the respondents still, uh, you know, tend to align more with face-to-face -face learning uh, uh, training modalities due to reasons uh, they, 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 they were preferred, uh, such as, for example, the, the, the level of interactiveness uh, in face-to-face -face learning, uh, uh, access to internet, uh, cost of internet and all, all of those factors that I'm going to mention uh, uh, later. But interestingly also, so 65% of them all uttered that they would always, I mean, if, I mean, most likely choose face-to-face -face learning. But also we got a good uh, percentage saying, yeah, they like online training, 
uh, and only about 16% of them. And interestingly, majority of those who preferred online trainings are female, female VPPs. Uh, and that thing about female VPPs in Nigeria is the fact that because they combine, they are mostly married and they combine, uh, you know, home uh, activities, childcare, and so on with their practice, they tend to prefer online or digital based training because that will afford them the flexibility to be able to participate. So this, we found that this uh, uh, to be very strong in terms of uh, looking at gender lens when we're designing our put. So now, so also, and that, and that thing that, that, that stood out in the train is, so because majority of them, even though majority of them prefer face-to-face -face learning, we found out that they own the inter, I mean, digital device, uh, learning device ownership, it is relatively very good. Like 90% of VPPs uh, have access to smartphone and 26% only have access to laptop. And this also uh, informs our decision in terms of design, you know, of application for training that we will recommend that the training should be more of mobile first uh, approach uh, that's, that, that's going to be accessible by smartphone since majority of them already own smartphones. Uh, something also uh, uh, that, that stood out from, from the study is even though majority prefer face-to-face -face learning, we on further probing using uh, the participatory approach too, we discovered that their choice of face-to-face -face learning was largely influenced by the fact that only a few of them were exposed have ever had exposure to online or digital learning device. So we may say that there may be some biases in their responses because the majority are not exposed to online. So during the, the, the uh, further probing, we demonstrated during a participatory appraisal, demonstrated to them how digital uh, learning, I mean, platforms look like, they interacted with the platforms. And we found that uh, you know, a, a good number of them now, prefer, I mean, we're mentioning that they would also be interested in, you know, uh, in, in, in using uh, digital uh, learning approaches. So basically, I think that uh, lack of exposure or knowledge about learning, uh, digital learning might have influenced some of uh, their, you know, their responses. This means that uh, creating awareness and exposing, you know, potential learners to this platform can influence, uh, I mean, uh, participation. Uh, so also VPPs in urban area, there's also a, a disparity between urban, uh, you know, VPPs and, and rural ones. So majority of those who are already familiar with uh, digital learning devices are based in urban centers and not in villages. Um, okay, so something also uh, striking is differential access to internet. Uh, as you see in, in the chat that I had uh, at the bottom, uh, in terms of gender, we found a very uh, significant gender disparity in terms of access to internet. Uh, so you have lower internet access uh, by female VPPs compared to their male counterparts, 63% for male and 47.6% for, for female. Uh, a further probing actually revealed that uh, in terms of income, um, female VPPs uh, earn less than male VPPs, and so that actually also uh, influences their, you know, their decision to, to be able to, to pay for internet and so on. So there's more internet access for male than females. Uh, this is largely driven by the in disparity in income level uh, for. So again, we're saying that, so when designing, uh, you know, training online or digital training, uh, internet-based training for VPPs, this should be considered. And if there can be incentives, for data, internet data for female VPPs to encourage participation, I think that that will be highly recommended. Um, also, in terms of rural and urban, I've mentioned before, uh, internet access generally is more, I mean, uh, you know, more accessible in urban centers in Nigeria than rural. So looking at the pool, it's good to study the demographics of those you intend to train and then look at uh, the internet accessibility before finally deciding on which platform to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, which modality to use. Uh, okay, so in, in terms of the kind of digital, I mean, you know, approaches, specifically, for example, whether it is video based or animations or cartoons, we found, we found that majority of them prefer real, real life case studies based on videos and many of them do not like animations and cartoons. They feel that animations and cartoons are not interactive enough 
but they can relate better with videos, uh, you know, than, than uh, some of, I mean, this other uh, the method. So uh, another thing is uh, live webinars. So when, when we combine all of their responses, what we, we came up with is the fact that uh, by and large, all of, almost all of the BPPs will prefer a combination of a live webinar, uh, downloadable videos, uh, text-based modules that can be downloaded even, uh, I mean, they can be downloaded and then viewed, we know, offline without uh, constant access to internet due to the, the challenge of internet cost uh, from in some areas. So they prefer a combination of live webinars because they feel that that uh, can allow for engagement in terms of questioning and answer and being, being able to actually have you know, real discussions with facilitators. That's also a driving uh, factor to, to towards their choice for, you know, uh, those who selected online, uh, you know, uh, study. And we finally, we, we found out the certification and recognition, whether face-to-face -face or online, uh, VPPs actually are very keen about having a proper certification that will differentiate them from those who did not take, their counterparts who did not, you know, take part in the study. So certification and recognitions are important motivation uh, for completing uh, either face-to-face -face training or online, I mean, digital training by uh, VPPs in Nigeria. So uh, I'll stop here and then uh, take questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Shehu, for uh, your presentation. And uh, it was very insightful and uh, I believe that we can further elaborate uh, during the panel discussion uh, and I invite once again uh, uh, all uh, the attendees virtually in presence to take note of questions about this presentation. For the next one, uh, I am uh, quite grateful uh, and very happy to introduce uh, a guest uh, from Canada. So another colleague from the, the UFMD, uh, Dr. Lia Seabrook, uh, played a pivotal role in the development of this uh, tool, the TOM train management system. And I want to take occasion also to remind you that uh, this, uh, in this room, for the participants in this room, you can vote and you can read the posters uh, placed on the, the other end of this uh, uh, plenary room. So, Dr. Lia Seabrook is a new FMD capacity specialist uh, working also at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And uh, the title of her presentation is Training Management System to Assist the Development of Skills. So, Lia, good morning. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Just waiting for my presentation to appear. There we go, there I am, and there it is, super. Um, and now my camera needs to focus a little bit, but. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, as Marcello introduced me, I am Leah Seabrook, and I have been a capacity development and learning specialist at UFMD. And today I'm going to, with this presentation, show you how Tom, uh, our training management system, can be used to help make data-based capacity development decisions. We talked earlier about how capacity matters, so and, and data matters. So Tom started with an identified problem. National veterinary authorities were looking for some help in building staff capacity, and then after having done that, how they would demonstrate that increased capacity that resulted. So to be able to do this, they need two parts. They need a competency framework to know what competencies are required. And they also need to be able to have that data displayed in a way that's helpful. So monitoring staff training and being able to display that. So the two male pillars that allow that to happen are a competency framework, which identifies the behaviors or activities that someone needs to be able to perform a certain task in their role, and also a web-based app that presents that data in an easy to access format. So how do these two pieces work together 
to solve the problem. So the competency framework is used to determine a competency level for an employee, both their current competency level and their required competency level. If they're different, a training gap is identified in the app and courses that are available for someone to take to close that gap are identified. As a learner works through those courses, they're able to track their own progress as well as the organization also has the ability to track their progress. And when a particular gap is closed, the app will display increased competency levels for the learner, which of course reflects to an increased competency level for the organization. So Tom basically provides that data that our first um, keynote speaker spoke about that allows veterinarians to be self, um, allows veterinarians to be self-directed in their learning, as we talked about earlier, and also increases the capacity um, for the organization to be able to strategically choose how they're going to uh, use their resources in a very purposeful, structured way. So let's see some examples of how that might look day to day. This is Sarah and she's our first user. Sarah works in her country's National Veterinary Service. She's been asked to provide some recommendations to senior leadership on to where they should target their capacity development this year. Sarah knows that data is really important, so she logs into Tom. The first thing she can see in her overview is that there are 10 senior field veterinarians on staff, but only one field veterinarian. So this leads to the recommendation that they should consider hiring some additional field veterinarians. The other thing she notices in the overview is that of those 10 senior field veterinarians, nine of them have completed the real-time training course. So she's comfortable recommending that that course is not a priority this year. There's not a large organizational gap on that. As she continues looking at this data, she can see looking at the veterinary paraprofessionals that they are completely current on their required competencies. They have, are, have all the training they need to be at that competency level. It's a little bit different though for the senior field veterinarians. There are some gaps, particularly in transboundary animal diseases. So how significant is this gap? Is it a gap that should be closed? So Sarah takes a look at the competency framework itself. And she can see that when someone's just at the beginner level, they have the ability to describe disease, but at the competent level, a slightly higher level, they're able to reliably diagnose disease. So that is a capacity uh, gap that they'd like to fill to build upon. So the recommendation is that they target the senior field veterinarians to move them from beginner level to a competent level. So at the same time that she's doing this, she can dig a little bit deeper down, see individual learners' competency levels, and having a look specifically here at Lucas's um, profile, she can see that he needs to take the Rift Valley Open Access course to close that gap in transboundary animal diseases. And it turns out, so does most of the other senior field veterinarians, leading to the recommendation that they target their capacity building efforts this year at providing the Rift Valley Fever course. At the same time Sarah's doing this, one of the actual senior field veterinarians, Daniel, is also taking a look at his personal profile on Tom. He sees that his level in epidemiology is below his required level, and so being a self-directed learner, he wants to know what it is he needs to do to improve his epidemiology skills. He takes a look and discovers that he hasn't taken this real-time training course yet. So the app has given him some direction, some suggestions on some activities he can do to close the gap. 
so he may reach out to Sarah to see if it's possible for him to get on that course. The other thing he can see is a list of the courses he's completed. So he's taken these three courses in the year and he'd be able to print those off and submit that possibly as part of his continuing professional development requirement for his veterinary association. So what we've seen today is looking at TOB, the web app iteration 2.0, which is available to be implemented with a limited number of learners with a plan to expand to more learners in the organization. So if you're interested in joining this phase, do let us know. We've also begun development on iteration 3.0, which includes some additional functionality for administration and for allowing non-EUFMD courses to be included in the learning paths. So I hope this has given you some ideas of how Tom can provide the information that can help both organizations and individuals be intentional and strategic in how they use their available resources to develop capacity. I'd like to thank my colleagues at EUFMD for volunteering to test the system um, for their support and a big thank you to our um, full stack developers, uh, Sylvia Eggman and Joy Williams, who have been a big part of putting this together. So I'd be happy to answer any questions later on or to learn any thoughts you have on how Tom might assist your organization or what functions you would like to see. Thank you. Questions will come at the end. We can move to the next, uh, the next presenter. We are get already getting some questions from the audience. Uh, we just uh, ask you to be patient and uh, just to note down any question that you might have. We are now moving to two presentations uh, in a row that are quite connected and are just raising uh, the discussion about digital le learning to a more strategic level. So the two key organizations uh, in animal health, the World Organization for Animal Health and the uh, FAO uh, Learning Academy are going to present in the next two presentations. The first one is going to be delivered by uh, Dr. Barbara Alessandrini the Head of Capacity Building Department at the World Organization for Animal Health. And in her presentation, she went to us the WOA innovation to the competency-based e-learning. Thanks a lot, Barbara. The floor is yours. You have really avoided to say WOA, and you did not want to... Pro exactly, so let's make the exercise. It's WOA all together. WOA. <laughs> Great, stop the timer because I don't want to steal my time. After this exercise that people from Zoom can be appeared as very stupid, I just wanted to say the right acronym of my organization. So now it's WOA, OMSA in French, it's more elegant, and OMSA in Spanish, not bad either, but the English requires some training. I was trained and it's a perfect example of cascade training because now you will get your badge that you know how to pronounce it. We can start. <laughs> okay, so I was trained to use the clicker, so I have just to do this. Okay, uh, I will spend these few minutes I have just to say two things. I want just to present what we're doing at WOA for, for uh, the training system that we are uh, developing. And I have selected two, two, main, two main aspects that for me can be useful for our conversation today. And the first one is about the competency-based training system. It's um, a system that has reorganized the WOA knowledge, meaning the standards, the guidelines, the frameworks, uh, manuals, and whatever is produced in terms of uh, literature that can and has to be implemented, uh, organized across 16 main, main themes. It will probably uh, grow in time, but for the moment we are quite satisfied also because we need to fill it in. It's just not empty boxes, but it has to become a set of uh, training offer for our uh, learning community. 
uh, you will see that we have tried to organize these competency packages across the different teams that, that characterized what we do and what we de develop. For each, for each of those boxes, we are trying to develop the terms of reference, it's a very unfashioned way of indicating things that sets the rules of what should be included inside. And I'm going to present um, an example of this competency package terms of reference developed using the partnership PPP. At lunchtime, I was asked, how do you prioritize? How do you uh, decide what to do first? Uh, I'm presenting PPP because it's very on fashion. It can go with meat, with fish, it can go with veggies. It's always successful because it's really very on fashion. But the truth is that it is the first uh, terms of reference that we have developed. And the terms of reference is a document, of course, that is particularly important for us because it will, is, it will be our guideline to develop the contents, meaning the e-learning modules and also the training courses. But it is a powerful tool for whoever wants to develop training on that specific uh, content because it shows scope, meaning uh, who, what, why, how. Um, the objectives of the competency package, uh, the target audience, and something very peculiar for us, but can be of help to do what um, Lia has just presented, meaning uh, measuring the gaps between individual competencies and organizational competencies is the relation with the PVS critical competencies. So uh, we link, uh, it's our characteristic, of course, we link the individual training to the competencies that countries have to have and have to measure with the PVS evaluation tool to be efficient and uh, effective. And then the topics, the e-modules, and um, something that I consider very important. So this is how it appears in terms of relationship with critical competencies. These are the contents, and you see, the learning outcomes in terms of knowledge, skills, and competencies, and the target audiences. I don't know if you can read something from far away here. It's absolutely uh, blind for me, but anyway, it will be published soon, so the ones of you who are interested can, can make a kind of in-depth if they want. And last but not least, there is a recommended pathway for the learner, because once all the competency packages will be developed. Uh, I mean, it's a continuous cycle. It will never finish because, thanks God, knowledge improves and, and changes uh, from time to time. Uh, but what we want is that learners are able to build their own learning pathway into the training system that we are developing. So for each competency package, we will be able to um, suggest a personal pathway that then people can decide to follow or even do differently, of course, because the courses are open source and are offered free of charge, of, of course, for our veterinary services and other target audience when relevant. In the case of PPP, we have recommended pathway for uh, policy strategic leaders, executive leaders, and implementing leaders. So this is how it works and we hope to be able to fill it in terms of, uh, in terms of reference in uh, hopefully a couple of years. But the most difficult thing and most expensive thing is of course to complement these competency packages with the e-learning modules that have to support knowledge building and capacity building for our members. I've decided to present you an example today because um, it's very much linked to um, uh, the reason why we are here. We are developing e-learning modules on leadership and I'm very happy to say that we're doing this with a consortium of collaborating centers of WOA for training and education. And, uh, we will have three different um, sets of courses that have a common content box on leadership. And then we have nine case scenarios with a serious game-like approach focused on situations that veterinary services have to um, experience in times of peace and in times of emergency. And um, 
at the end of the exercise, there will be a feedback because um, the case studies present stories. It's a narration, it's a movie, and, and you will see in a second that it's really a movie. Um, experts, pedagogical experts, and uh, will, will provide feedback on how the characters have behaved during the story that is told and why. Maybe we can launch the video. Thank you. I left it in French because that was the Bonsoir. original yeah. one, but it will be available contagieux. in English Spanish. Now, everything that we say, all the minutes, all the gestures will count. So, this is a maximum. suspicion of foot and mouth disease. And you see at the beginning the information shared, the infield activity, the collaboration with the other authorities, decision making, decision at high level, planning of activities. Comment pouvez-vous être sûr de l'origine de la maladie? L'enquête épidémiologique dans l'élevage d'origine à Zoolande permettra de confirmer ou non cette hypothèse. Communication to press and rewarding of the team for the good job. So these are the scenes in which the uh, story is organized and at the end of each scene there is a serious game so that the participant, the learner, can decide if it went well, if not, why, what kind of behavior, what style of leadership have been performed, etc. This is what we're trying to do, finding new approaches, different ways, and basing uh, the training on competencies more than theoretical knowledge. So you may have recognized one of the main uh, actors of this movie, that is our beloved Dr. Jean-Luc Angot, first row. Thank you very much for this excellent job that you have done. And yes, that's all. This is what we're doing, and we think that we will launch these uh, courses tentatively before the end of the year, uh, maximum next January. Happy if you go have a look and provide feedback. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Barbara. And uh, now we are transitioning back online and uh, we are uh, um, welcoming uh, the representative, the head of the, uh, the leader from the FAO Learning Academy. So, Dr. Cristina Petracchi will uh, introduce us uh, what, is, uh, what FAO is doing uh, in terms of best practices, uh, in terms of e-learning. There are many points of connection, uh, probably assessment, uh, micro-credentials will be some of the suggested points of connection, but I'll leave uh, to Cristina Petracchi to better explain uh, what uh, the FAO eLearning Academy is doing in terms of eLearning. So, Cristina, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, Marcello, and thank you to the organizers for this op excellent opportunity. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, to, uh, with you in a very short time allocated is to uh, talk to you a little bit about the FAO eLearning Academy. And maybe, I don't know if you see the slides, do you see the slides? Okay, excellent. Yeah, now loading. So uh, next one. Um, so uh, the idea is to uh, here is to talk to you a little bit about the innovative learning methodologies that we are using also for animal health. So next slide. First thing I'd like to do is to talk to you about the FAO Learning Academy. So what is it? So we uh, offer. Um, multilingual uh, e learning courses that are offered for free as a global public good. Um, and uh, these uh, courses have the objective to transfer competences and skills to anyone at any time, anywhere in the world. The idea is really the transfer of skills and competences to allow professionals worldwide to be more competent and competitive. Um, this is really the result. The FAO eLearning Academy is the result of a collaborative effort involving over 400 partners worldwide. So this is not only FAO, it is a huge collaborative effort. And um, we, have, uh, so we have over 500 multilingual courses and we have reached so far uh, almost 800,000 learners throughout the world. Next slide. 
So what what we are um, what we are really uh, striving for, and our main objective is. Uh, basically democratizing education. So next slide, please. Uh, it's really to democratize education, to um, universal education for everyone, anywhere, at any time, at, uh, giving the, uh, the access to education as a global public good, and to try also to um, basically reduce um, um, reduce all the inequalities, the gender inequalities, the social inequalities in the access uh, to education. So really trying to promote equal rights and also digital and social inclusion uh, to allow, for example, population ma marginalized individuals, but also um, uh, gender based communities or citizens in conflict or post conflict areas to have access to these resources in, of course, uh, a climate and environment and environment uh, friendly uh, system. Next. So what we are also trying to do uh, is to um, bridge the gap between formal and informal education. So what we are trying to do is to allow individuals and professionals by staying locally in their own country without having to travel somewhere else to allow them to to have access to education and to get certified. And I know that certification was mentioned uh, in, in, in many of the previous speakers. We are using a system for certification to allow people to be um, competent and competitive in their own country and to improve their insertion in the professional world. Um, we are trying also to transfer inter multi and transdisciplinary competences. And this was also uh, discussed by the previous speakers, the importance uh, in in order to have an effective response, the uh, the importance of um, of uh, uh, an integrated uh, uh, response. Next, please. So we are working with many, many uh, partners. As I mentioned, we're working with UN, with regional organizations. We have created a number of masters and postgraduate degrees with universities and academic institutions. But we also work a lot with NGOs, CSOs, ex extension services, uh, and veterinary, of course, uh, services throughout the world. Uh, and we are also starting to collaborate with, with private sector. Next. Next, please. We are also uh, contributing to uh, uh, many. Um, we're also uh, contributing to many UN initiatives, and we are uh, using different pedagogical models and different learning solutions based on the target audiences. So this was also mentioned: the importance of analyzing thoroughly who the target audience is. Where are they? Are they computer savvy? Uh, do they have connectivity? Well, and then based on that design, based on their, the professional profiles that we are targeting and the competences that we want to develop, what are, what are, what are the methodologies that we are going to use? Are we going to use a mobile learning program? Are we going to use a webinar? Are we going to do a MOOC? Are we going to use uh, scenario-based approaches or more videos for procedural type of, of content related, for example, to the safety measures or to the diagnosis, et cetera. Next slide. So what we always do, and this is something really we uh, invest a lot of effort in, is that we do a very thorough learning needs assessment beforehand, where we invite, uh, it's a multi-stakeholder and multidisciplinary, and this is also very important, the perspective of the different dif disciplines. So we invite people from uh, the government, uh, also field practitioners, veterinary services, extension services, and the target audience representatives uh, across generation with different technical backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds. And we do an analysis of the target audience, the competences they need to acquire. And from there, we design the content of, of our courses, which are always competency-based, as also was mentioned by the previous speaker. Next slide. So, uh, as you know, and especially for animal diseases, uh, we need to, to, we are talking about inter multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary uh, 
competences, and which is extremely important. We need to be able to anticipate, to prevent, to, de to detect, to diagnose, uh, to treat, but also to adopt the right safety measures. This requires a pool of competences, and this is exactly what we are trying to do uh, through our courses. I have listed here some of our animal health related courses, but we are we also have many, many more, and I invite you to have a look at the FAO eLearning Academy. And I'd like uh, next slide. I'd like to now uh, start concluding uh, with the certification. So we are using a new certification system, which is the digital badge certification system. It is a new uh, a, a driver, really a driver of educational reform. It is a very a uh, transparent system, and it is also um, a system that offers greater employment opportunities because people are able, uh, we are able to certify the competences acquired, and this helps to better match the request with the, with the offer. Next slide. So it is a very um, a transparent system, visible, shareable, and uh, once you earn your badge after the course, next slide. It can follow you in your LinkedIn, in your e-portfolio, in your CV. It becomes part of your pool of, prof uh, of, of competences, and you can build your own professional profile by accumulating different badges from different courses. So uh, I can see that the uh, next slide, I just wanted to show you next one, uh, a few examples of some of our badges. and. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity. I really hope to have the opportunity to interact in, in, the, in the panel discussion later on. Uh, but for the time being, thank you very much for this opportunity. And 360. And we've been using that technology in agriculture, food and fibre in Australia for almost 10 years. We won a bus, really, we won a bus, and we've, with the remit to really transform education across Australia. It's currently fitted out as a high-tech mobile classroom using VR and AR to train kids in where their food comes from. We now work with a lot of uh, RDCs, so research organisations who have that remit around innovation, people like Dairy Australia, Meat and Livestock Australia, and we use that technology to help uh, change perceptions around agricultural uh, production and to also uh, educate producers. Biosecurity is a really interesting place for us to work at the moment. Interestingly, uh, listening to one of the presentations earlier, we have created a VR training tool for the University of Adelaide for their vet science students, and that is all around teaching them about large animal handling and safe movement around large stock before they get into the yard. So it's a really complementary tool. As I mentioned, PERSA and Animal Health Australia have the remit to innovate training at producer level, particularly around biosecurity. 
We know that producers, uh, you know, the front line in Australia in particular to identify animal diseases, are really visual learners, so death by PowerPoint isn't going to suit them. We also uh, are dealing with vast landscape in Australia where it's not really practical for producers to come together to learn, so we need to innovate about how they can learn on country. And in fact, that photo down the bottom there is a, a VR tool that we have produced for the Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation to provide training for Indigenous cattle station on biosecurity on country. And uh, the other thing about producers in Australia is that most of them have never seen an emergency animal disease in real life. In fact, most of our vets as well. And so how can we use technology to demonstrate what it might look like when it presents or if it presents in our livestock? So with all of that in mind, how can we use this technology to meet the learning needs of our producers? Well, launched recently, is this tool that I, um, you might have even actually seen it being demonstrated in the area, the breakout area earlier, which will guide a producer through identifying diseases such as foot and mouth in their sheep. And Emily, the uh, sheep farmer behind me, you're seeing the point of view as what she sees. If she had the HoloLens on, it's also in an application. And I must say, growing up on a farm, I actually grew up on a, on a farm with sheep and cattle. I never imagined I'd be producing a 3D sheep to beam into a farmer to help train them about diseases. As I mentioned, it's an application. It's available free to download on iOS and Android, as well as on the Microsoft HoloLens. And it guides a producer through. So I'll just talk you through it very quickly. There are four different flocks with randomised uh, diseases within each flock. The producer uses the application to place the sheep in front of them. And then they are asked to identify which in the flock is presenting with a particular disease or that looks a little unusual. Once they've identified that animal, they're asked to nominate what those conditions are. In this case, there are three conditions, and Emily here is having a look at what they might be. We worked really closely with Animal Health Australia and PERSA vets to make sure that the way that the, excuse me, the diseases present on the animal is realistic. And actually, in the case of foot and mouth disease, we had to really tone it down in sheep. Here you can see that she's identified that the sheep has a lesion on its foot and is limping. And once the producer taps on those, they're shown a um, photo of how it does present in real life. And once you've identified all of the conditions, you're then asked to nominate what you think the disease might be. And I'll be very disappointed if there's anyone in this room that can't guess what this particular disease is. That's right, FMD. Now, importantly, up until this point, the application is available completely offline. So if connectivity is an issue for producers, which it is across Australia, they can use it up until this point. If they then wanted to find out further information, they can, oops, they could click on that. Let me just go back. Click on that button, and that will take them to a government website, website which has a bit more detail. They can also call the Animal Australia hotline to get support from a vet if they have actually identified a condition within their livestock that is presenting unusually. Now, why AR, and why are we moving into this sort of technology? Well, importantly, you can place it in situ. And it looks real. So this here was taken with the digital sheep in a lairage in a meat processor works in Western Australia. And here we can see the vet and the lairage worker going through the process of identifying a disease. So it's real training in situ at its best. So if I put it on, what you can see is that I can see you and I can see the real world. And we know that the power of this technology is actually going to be in the future. When people like John O'Motlop, he's one of the Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation cattle station owners, can have a device like this or probably glasses that are easier to wear, they can have real digital live information beamed into them in real time they can, uh, they can get remote support from people like you while they're on country to be able to respond to particular diseases. 
And I think that is an incredibly powerful opportunity that will be available in the very near future. So that's some of the ways that we're using XR to innovate training in agriculture. I'd love for you to download the application. So it's available, as I said, on the App Store, Google Play, and on the HoloLens. You're welcome to come and try the HoloLens afterwards if you'd like to. So we'll have this out in the breakout room if you'd like to give it a try. And if you'd like any further information or to talk about how immersive technology could help support some of your training activities, please feel free to get in touch or link in with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for this presentation, uh, Dr. Bill Strooper. I believe that uh, we had a really a broad range of the how digital technologies can enhance uh, veterinary education. Um, maybe while our colleagues are just placing the seats for uh, a placing for the panel discussion, uh, Buddha Silvia can ask your thoughts before handing over to Katarina. Um. My comment is that I just would like to appreciate the audience. I know I had already expressed my fears that I don't like, uh, for instance, moderating afternoon sessions very, very much for obvious reasons uh, because the energy that we usually have in the morning sessions is not the energy that we have in the afternoon, so I would like to commend you all for being very attentive, for doing your best to remain uh, involved and active during the afternoon session. And as we close uh, with the panel discussion, I still believe there is an opportunity for us to ask questions, but also learn uh, through the questions that others are asking. So let us not get tired and sign out, let us remain uh, present physically and, <laughs> and in a real sense up to the very end. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. So, Buddha, uh, are we heading over to Katarina for her comments uh, while uh, we welcome also the guests for the panel discussion? Sure, yes. Uh, th thanks, Marcello, to, to reminding us about that. Yes, I would like to give the floor to, to the chairperson of this session, uh, Katarina. Uh, please, if you have any comments before we start the panel discussion, um, please. Thank you very much. Uh, lots, of, lots of comments, really interesting and inspiring uh, uh, presentation. Actually, um, even the, sort of the glimpse of the future um, in, this, in this last one, uh, where we see this uh, technology really put into, into action. And, and in fact, if, if Kat hasn't gone too far off, I would, and I think she's not part of the panel, I would have a very quick question um, for her on the development of this um, augmented reality learning um, sessions. Uh, and my question would be, um, uh, in, in terms of the cost and effort to, to develop something like that. Uh, I have no idea, but I imagine that it is a huge effort. Um, well, sorry, thank you. It's, it, this tool took about six months to build. The real uh, effort came in actually collating enough images and information to enable our artists to create a realistic representation of some of the diseases. Foot and mouth, there's plenty of images of. Uh, scrapey in sheep, there's very, very few of. So in order to be able to actually build the tool, that, uh, that required quite a lot of effort. Um, but really, um, the technology already exists, so we're not having to create AR. We're just using it uh, a little more differently, I suppose. And maybe a follow-up question, if I may. Uh, sort of, I know that uh, for, for other similar um, uh, teaching elements, um, there is also the question of intellectual property and, and making it available to others after you have invested uh, maybe a lot to, to develop it. Um, what is your um, approach to this? 
Well, it depends on, on how the project has come about. In this case, it was funded by the state government um, of South Australia and Animal Health Australia, who are funded by the federal government. So the intellectual property lies with them. We were the uh, people that worked closely with them to build it because we've worked with them quite closely on a number of other projects. I suppose if, if a developer went down another path and produced something off their own bat, then there would be an IP perspective and they would probably have a model around it that would be a, you know, a cost to use, but that's why it's free. And I think it's important that this sort of technology and training is available free. Thanks, that, that's all from me for now. I will probably have some comments or sort of final closing comments at the end of the panel session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Katarina. And um, uh, we're starting the round of questions. I believe that we have uh, some questions uh, from, uh, the, um, from the virtual audience. Before doing so, uh, I would like maybe to have uh, one question on the uh, tallest corner or the farthest corner. I remember that there was one question that we postponed uh, earlier. So can we have the question now? And then uh, we're going to the questions from the virtual audience. Um, Beate Conradi from the University of Copenhagen. I have a question related to the talk um, FIO eLearning Ac Academia. And my question is how universities can become a member um, in order to support you to offer courses? Yes, um, so thank you very much for this, this question. Basically, you just have to contact me, it's quite easy. Uh, we, we can work together on understanding uh, what are your uh, what are your learning programs that are relevant, what are the courses that better match your learning programs, and we could then um, integrate the courses as part of the learning program. Of course, uh, making sure everything is coherent and comprehensive, and then it is the university that is responsible for attributing. Uh, a number of uh, university credits uh, to the materials. This becomes the responsibility of the university. What we do is to support the integration and the better matching between uh, the various courses available, the competences that these courses are aligned to, and your learning program. So this is a uh, this is what we do. And then it is the responsibility of the of the university to grant the, the university certificate, of course. But with the advantage that the students have two, two certificates. They have an official university degree, and in addition, they have a UN certificate of competences that is uh, granted by the, by the FAO uh, eLearning Academy. Okay, thank you so much uh, for, for, for your uh, answer. I'd like to, to ask uh, our, our audience here, is there any other question? Uh, otherwise, we can go to, to our online uh, audience. So I'd like to ask our colleagues to, to present the questions we have received uh, from, from online audience. Um, okay, we have here two questions. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, from uh, Mira Al. Calvani, uh, can we use the virtual reality in the simulation exercise of FMD outbreaks and other TADs, other transplantary animal diseases? Sure. I suppose this yep. is uh, to you. <laughs> I'll, I'll happily take that one. Um, well, virtual reality is very useful for biosecurity training because it allows you to fail safely. So absolutely you can use it. You can create a number of different scenarios that you can guide a user through uh, undertaking. And so we have used it for training in biosecurity around um, how to go onto an egg farm, for example, but there's definitely the opportunity to take it further and use it around simulation. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we go to the second question from uh, Wen Dang. How do you deal with the confidential issues imposed by virtual technology? Um, I wonder what they mean by the confidential issues. So uh, perhaps that's an IP data question. Protection. Yep, data protection. That's always a very hot topic. Uh, it depends on if you're pulling data in, I suppose. So if you're going to the 
to start to use some of the artificial intelligence, for example, where you might be doing some pushing and pulling of information, then uh, there are there are a number of different data protocols that need to be followed and uh, particularly in Australia where I'm most familiar with it is they're, they're rather stringent so I, I presume that's what they're getting at sure. making sure you're sure. following those and protecting the data. I think it's the same also in Europe but the issue is just to comply with them I mean if you mm. consider them at the since the very beginning and you evaluate at the beginning which are the constraints so in terms of confidentiality data protection and you declare it and you obtain all the authorizations from, from the audiences, I think everything can be done. The important thing is to comply with uh, regulations and have a data protection policy that can demonstrate that all efforts to protect data and information are put in place and then you can do it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, there is another question that coming through. Uh, it's uh, the web competency training. Is it the country um, who are delegates only? Is it for... for um no, it's not only for delegates. Okay, so it's open for all veterinarians. It's, it's for veterinary services in the widest sense of, of the meaning. And where appropriate, also other target audiences are considered. It can be political level, it can be wildlife authorities, aquatical animal health authorities, uh, One Health authorities, etc. So no, it's really open. Of course, the primary target is veterinary services, but including right. also field veterinarians and VPPs. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and the last question, what learning outcomes do you think are best suited to digital technologies? I don't know. I don't know who oh, wants <laughs> I, to I take that. Maybe you can, start you can compliment. <laughs> I think resources make the difference. I mean, if you have limited resources, of course, it must, it's important to remain consistent with the budget and define and design courses based on maybe knowledge objectives. Uh, if you have larger budget, you can be more ambitious and include technical capacities and sometimes also behavioral, like, like the courses I've pre I have presented on leadership, really aim at transferring behavioral uh, messages. Then yeah, the effectiveness, we will see it in the future. But uh, also, if you uh, have a good planning, coherent with the budget, you can, again, you can do whatever, it depends. So for me, there is not one rule, one situation. It depends on the situation and on the capacity of who designs the courses. And I suppose if I speak about immersive technology as a training tool more broadly, so uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, as well as some of the 360 experiences that we're seeing, uh, I'll go back to my earlier comment about anything where you would like people to fail safely. So uh, the vet science students getting kicked by a virtual cow in our training that we've developed for the University of Adelaide. No vet students have been injured, as far as I know, by being kicked from the virtual cow. But we know that if they behave unsafely in the yards, they most certainly will be. Anything that has an element of rote learning involved in it, so PPE, uh, we've developed some virtual reality training around the correct procedure to put on clothing and take it off when going in and out of a meat processor. Uh, taking people to places that they otherwise might not get to go. So I can see that there's a poster on the back about um, some VR training in meat processing. We're also developing something quite similar in Australia at the moment. Uh, we take people to places that they other might otherwise can't go, uh, that it's difficult to take large numbers of people into, that it might be expensive. Um, it's a case that you can build it once with virtual reality. There is that outlay to begin with, but then you can use it over and over again. Buda Silvia, I'm just intervening for one second, uh, for uh, maybe for allowing our colleagues to get uh, more questions uh, from the virtual and from the in-presence audience. Uh, just a reminder for those who are in the, the room that uh, uh, registered for to, tonight's dinner, uh, the appointment is uh, at 7.15, 7.15, so please do not be late. Uh, we'll just meet uh, outside the entrance of the hotel uh, and then there is a bus waiting for you to bring you to the dinner. So, just a, a quick announcement, I don't know if there are further questions, handing over to... Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have one question uh, to... Okay, uh, let's have the questions here, then I'll read one question from the online audience. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you, Nicolas de Normandie. I have a question for Barbara, for the WOA, for the PVS, if for a given uh, critical competency, for a, con a given country, if they want to go from one level to another one, let's say from two to three, does it mean that all the staff working under this department will have in addition to pass the competency package? No, 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 no. This is not the case. The evaluation of the veterinary services critical competencies is performed by independent experts that go in country with missions and um, evidence has to be provided according to the different critical competencies um, on, on stage. So they have to demonstrate that they have the system in place and that they have improved uh, according to the recommendations provided in the previous evaluation. Of course, there are critical competencies that relate to um, staff uh, workforce development and staff preparation. So again, uh, to improve uh, in the critical competencies that are related to workforce capacities, uh, having the demonstration of having a national training plan in place uh, is an asset, of course, but not necessarily through the WOR resources. We hope countries engage in that system and that they find it useful to improve the quality of the veterinary services and the capacities of the veterinary services, but uh, for sure it's not mandatory. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think let's take one question for, uh, from the from the online uh, audience, and also I would like to request um, I, I would like to request our first presenter for this afternoon session. That was uh, Kenneth uh, Badosh from University of Washington to uh, tell us something uh, more about the most innovative approaches that veterinary education uh, needs to include or integrate in order to enhance uh, social learning. I know, I believe uh, Kenneth is still online, please. I think he are. had to, he, I think he had to go. You don't see that, but he put in the chat that he unfortunately had to go. Okay, then uh, I would like to remind us that online we also had, we had Leia, uh, we had Leia from Canada, we had Shehu presenting from Nigeria. And uh, in case anybody has, any question directed what they presented, I would like to encourage the remaining questions from the audience to go towards the two presenters. Uh, but maybe as we wait for a question, I'd like to ask Shehu uh, if he's he still online. I know he didn't give us a conclusion uh, for his presentation. Shehu, in case uh, you're still there, please, I'd like to give you an opportunity to give us um, some concluding statement uh, for your presentation. I know it is a uh, project is targeting veterinary professionals and is mainly focusing on uh, continuing professional development. That is uh, as well very important for us um, in building a capacity uh, for the animal health workforce. So Shahu, if you're there, please uh, make that comment, our concluding remark. And then after that, we will welcome any question for Leah uh, from this audience. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Sylvia. Uh, so basically, I think um, my conclusion will sort of build on what even, I mean, the approach that Kevin has brought to this discussion is the, the whole idea of my presentation is to show that while uh, we are developing digital learning, uh, I mean, uh, tools or content, we need to strongly consider the social perspective. Uh, whether it is gender, uh, in terms of accessibility, uh, you know, to, to, to digital learning devices uh, based on gender disparities, like we have seen in Nigeria, there's higher level of uh, ownership of digital learning devices uh, by, by male compared to female. So we should also build in, in, you know, in our plan, how do we intend to to you know to close this digital uh, divide in terms of ownership uh, we're also looking at internet social uh, aspect like access to internet itself so most digital learning tools are internet i mean dependent 
So what are the drivers? What are the things that we can do about, I mean, helping, I mean, uh, our target audience to have better access to internet so they can, they can also, I mean, benefit more, I mean, from, uh, from the from 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 such trainings. For example, we had recommended uh, after this this uh, study, the female participants in the project, the beneficiaries, uh, should be supported with cost of internet data, so they can also you know be able to access these trainings. Uh, we also look at uh, rural versus urban. So generally, why I'm bringing this context to this kind of global uh, event is for us to not have a one cap, I mean, one size fits all when we're designing our learning tools. You can have a, a nice to have content or innovation, but it's one thing to also go deeper to see if uh, your target audience are able to access uh, such. So, uh, for example, uh, while I appreciate uh, the, the issue of the virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, from what I have seen from, uh, from Nigeria, especially by targeting VPPs, I think it's still a tall order as a far. We still have a long time to be able to catch up with such. So basically, I think my, my presentation is about saying we need to consider the social side, the economic side, and look at the deeper into the drivers. What are those drivers of participation uh, in, in digital uh, you know, learning uh, training? I think that's that's basically the message I wanted to pass. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks very much, Shao, for your uh, answer, complete answer. So we are approaching to the end of the panel uh, session. I would like uh, to thank you all our presenters and uh, panelists. And with that, I would like uh, to give them a round of applause. And now uh, we give the floor to our chairperson, uh, Professor Katerina Storks, for uh, concluding remarks. Please, Katerina. Thank you very much. Uh, I have um, really enjoyed uh, this afternoon, um, uh, albeit online. Um, so I missed some of the um, interactive part, but nevertheless, I have um, noted a few points that I really would like to take with me um, uh, from from this afternoon. Um, the first one is um, uh, technology seems not to be the limiting factor here, um, but there are other limiting factors such as um, uh, we have to change uh, our learning habits. Um, so, so perhaps the next generation will be much better equipped, but uh, it was also said that we have currently um, several generations that need to be trained on and need to be learning and need to be uh, using these tools. So, so, so that's a, a challenge um, in the learning habits rather than the technology. Um, we also touched on the issues of um, assessment and uh, both formal and informal. And I really like the idea of this uh, digital batch um, uh, that you can still take something and, and use it um, even from informal or, or, more, or less formal education. And then also the acc accreditation issue and, and these need to be um, evolving as well as, as the technology that is being used. Um, then there was a, a point made that since we are um, building on, on technological aspects and the aspects of inclusiveness as well. Um, I think there were some really important points made there, not just in re relation to, to coverage and, and that um, the use of the mobile phone, but also important point on um, inclusiveness in terms of um, availability of the people that we would like to, to train. So the gender aspect, I think is something that was really um, didn't occur to me before, but really makes a lot of sense. So the whole aspect of social learning as well, so learning from and with each other, I think that has a, a lot of potential. And uh, I was just wondering, and, and we don't uh, need to, to discuss it now, but um, uh, I, I have to look more into whether social learning is actually 
possible online or whether this is not just one element where we then really need more sort of blended learning elements, uh, taking the, the best of, of both worlds, really. And then just my final comment, um, I was very impressed by the uh, general degree of enthusiasm about, about learning and innovation. Um, also from an, uh, organizations like FAO and, and their academy, um, from WOA, uh, can I also uh, pronounce it? Yeah, very good <laughs> skill I learned as well. And, and then the collaboration uh, between these organizations and universities, because universities are um, there, their core role is education, and they're, they're really the education specialists. And I think this uh, collaboration is really essential, not trying to, to duplicate and and create redundancy here, but to, to work in partnership uh, to, to improve uh, learning in the future and to use all these wonderful tools uh, and to fail safely. Uh, I also like that a lot. So, so that's all I wanted to say and, and thank you very much and, and have a really nice um, meal and I hope to be with you uh, physically next time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for your attention. The appointment is for tomorrow morning for the third session. Thanks a lot. Oh. Okay.